good to go. Hope everybody's had a good morning so far and welcome to our budget meeting. It's nine o'clock right now and I'll call this uh, meeting to order. I just let, wanted to let everybody know that uh, Andy had to bring his daughter to emergency this morning, um, uh, potentially has a broken foot. Uh, she slipped on the ice and, and fell. So he's in the emergency room right now and he'll get here as soon as possible. But we'll tap Dan on the shoulder and, and he can pretend he's Andy uh, for the day and go through the strategic uh, plan uh, side of things. So thanks for that. And hopefully Andy's back with us soon and hopefully Emma's doing okay. Uh, firstly, uh, we'll do a, a roll call. Uh, starting with Councillor McCray. Here. Good. Councillor Dunsmore. Here. You're muted, Kelly. I didn't hear you, Councillor Kittris. Did you? Can you just? I didn't hear you. Um, I'm here. Oh. <laughs> <President. laughs> I'm, I'm talking to you. I'm mute. And that's a nice room you have in the background. I haven't seen that background before. That looks nice. That's all Christmassy. Christmas yeah, that's yeah. nice. Councillor McElwain. Present. Councillor Van Leeuwen. I'm, I'm here. Good. Councillor Foster. Present. Okay, good. Uh, we can all hear each other. That's great. Um, there's no addendums or corrections to the agenda that was sent out. Um, any disclosure of pecuniary interest with anything that we're going to be talking about today? Okay. And if anything comes up during the course of uh, during the course of our discussion, uh, just remember that at any time you can declare uh, a conflict. Approval and adoption of the minutes 4.1. Uh, we have a recommendation uh, that the minutes of the committee, the whole pre-budget meetings held September 7th and October 4th be adopted as presented. Can I get a mover for that, please? Councillor Dunsmore, seconded by Councillor McRae. All in favor of those minutes? And that's carried. Moving on to opening remarks. Um, yeah, I'm gonna be pretty short uh, um, to the point today. And obviously Andy isn't here, so he won't have any remarks. So mostly this is for the public watching. I know councillors have a real, real good understanding of the budget. Now we've gone through a number of these already, but I just wanted to remind uh, the public and those watching today that uh, the linkage between strategic planning uh, and the budget. Um, the strategic planning, identifies the priorities of, of this council. And we set some pretty ambitious uh, uh, targets back in 2019. Um, and that, that, that explains the what. So that's the things that we've identified um, as the priorities based on what we've heard from the citizens and based on some uh, engagement of our community. Uh, but then the budget uh, is how we get there. So it's allocating resources and allocating spending so that we can achieve the priorities that we established as members of council. Um, so that's the linkage there. And that's why um, Dan will be talking about the strategic plan initially, and then we'll get into budget um, because the strategic plan establishes the context. Uh, thanks very much to our staff for putting this budget together. Um, council provided uh, a very clear direction uh, this year. We wanted to make sure that we had a, a, a low budget increase, recognizing um, the challenges that we have in our community, um, uh, just get it just in the middle of COVID and hopefully coming out of COVID. Um, we wanted to make sure that that was a nice uh, low increase. So we get, provided direction for staff to come in at 2.4% uh, increase or less. And our staff have done that. Um, we also provided direction um, and we reviewed um, the staffing plan, the 2022 staffing plan. So council has seen that already. Um, and that's included in our, in our budget package as well. Um, the OLG allocation, uh, council has also reviewed that and has seen that as well. So that you'll, we'll go through that in our package, but hopefully we don't have to spend that much time on that piece of it. We also have reviewed the 10 year uh, bridge plan. So that is something that council has seen in the previous meetings. Um, so that's good. In addition to the 2.4% uh, or less direction that council provided, as far as a tax rate increase, we also provided direction that C 
fees and charges shouldn't go beyond 2.4 as well. So that should come at a 2.4 or less as well. So thanks um, to uh, Dan under Dan's leadership and, and Mark um, uh, plays a huge role here working with all the departments and the department heads and, and all their staff and pulling a budget together. It's a lot of work uh, to pull these budgets together. And we've made it even tougher on our staff and making sure that we do this in December because we really want to get out there um, with tenders as early as possible. So that's why we front ended um, the budget process and, and it just makes it a little bit more compact uh, to have to do in, this, in uh, December. So thanks very much to our team for pulling this budget together, a very good budget for council to start its deliberations. And I don't, I don't take for granted that we have staff that put us um, in a good spot right away. Um, you know, we, we've kind of gotten away from playing games coming in at a 16% increase or whatever, and then um, just going back and forth. Staff provider provide a lot of the upfront work and they have a lot of big discussions to make sure that they're um, putting, putting um, their priority projects forward and nothing beyond uh, what the needs are. So thanks to our team for that. At this time, I will turn it over uh, to uh, Dan. Um, he's been tapped on the shoulder to go through Andy's uh, strategic plan slide. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dan. And, and once you're completed the strategic plan, uh, Dan, uh, Dan, feel free to go right into uh, the introduction of the draft budget presentation. Over to you, Dan. Thank you, Mayor Linton. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so I will bring up Andy's slides here on uh, the strategic plan update, and then I'll just roll into uh, the budget presentation just to give council a high level look at, first of all, strategic planning and the linkages of strategic planning on the budget process. And then just a high level look at the budget itself before we get into some of the, some of the details. So uh, when we get into the budget part of the presentation, I will lead things off and then Mark will go through some of the operating and capital details. And then I will conclude the presentation before we actually get into the operating budget. So I'm going to share my screen here first. And hopefully that has come up for everybody to, to see. So in terms of strategic plan, I, I would argue that uh, the strategic plan is the number one resource and tool that council approves that really gives overall direction to staff over a period of time. And, and the budget itself is the important linkage to the strategic plan in that the budget needs to provide the tools and the resources for staff to implement the strategic plan. So that the, the linkages between strategic planning and the budget are, are critical and, and huge consideration has to be taken for the strategic plan when we set a budget every year. Um, and I know the CAO, CAO reports um, once, twice a year to, to council on, on accomplishments in the strategic plan. So um, I'm going to uh, go through some of Andy's slides now on, on our, some of our 2021 accomplishments. First of all, there were impacts due to COVID-19 on the strategic planning implementation process, um, similar to, to the 2020 year. Um, I'd like to say 2021 was a little bit um, easier on us from a COVID-19 perspective, and we're hoping 2022 would be, will be even better. Uh, but in terms of 2019 impacts, obviously our implementation of the employment plan servicing on the Dixon Drive extension is somewhat delayed at this point. Uh, we were hoping to have that serviced by now, but um, servicing remains one of our top priorities going into 2022. We're working with partners to attract and enhance the visitor experiences. Um, we have council approval to start the CIP review, and that is done um, in conjunction with the county to make sure the county CIP and the township CIP are closely aligned going forward. Uh, we did the 2021 downtown pilot uh, for parking enforcement, and we're going to continue the pilot program into 2022 uh, before any long-term uh, decisions are made on parking enforcement. Um, we're going to be exploring post-secondary school um, opportunities in Centre Wellington. That's been delayed somewhat, but that remains a, a critical goal going forward. The tourism accommodation tax was delayed uh, on purpose in this case, given the uh, economic environment due to COVID-19. Staff have delayed bringing that forward, um, given, given the potential impacts um, as a result of the, the 
COVID-19 impacts on the economy. So that's something that's still in the back of our minds that we'll look at at a later date. Uh, the planning for the indoor training facility um, has been delayed at this point. Um, obviously festivals and events through 2020 and 21 are delayed due to COVID-19. And we did have a lot of facility related closures as a result of COVID-19 that did result in some lost revenue. In terms of accomplishments uh, in 2021, <clears throat> the employment land strategy was approved for the, for the business park on Dixon Drive. And we look forward to the servicing of that and moving forward with, with um, sales strategies with council on that. Downtown patio policy was approved and uh, weekend street closures continued. Um, which, which was a critical piece in, in recovering from COVID-19 in our downtown course. The Laura Community Center grant was approved and we have a project of just under $5 million that is significantly funded through the province and, and the federal government that uh, we are currently in the design, design stage for. Uh, the Fergus truck bypass has been implemented. Uh, the county MCR is underway. Uh, we had a recent presentation to council on that, and we look forward to the uh, uh, future refinements and, and public meetings on that. Uh, council approved the reserve and reserve fund policy. Uh, the Four Far Park revitalization upgrades are underway and are expected to be wrapped up in the spring of 2022. Uh, the procedural bylaw was approved. And we um, started working on uh, next steps and customer service improvements in, in introducing the report it stage of, of our website, which is a, a way for the community to provide service requests um, to, to the township through, through the website. Continuing on on 2021 accomplishments, uh, we had a number of pre-budget meetings with council for, for the 2022 budget to give overall direction, which has been very useful in and setting the draft budget we're here to talk about today. Uh, we had the cultural heritage landscape study approved by council and uh, recently discussed last night actually, um, in terms of the prioritization of the actions funding from, from that capital, um, from that, that item and how that's reflected in the 10 year capital forecast. Uh, we had the, um, the rural road condition assessments completed and approved by council in fall of this year. Uh, the operations center financing has been approved uh, by council in June of 2021. The development charge study was approved in January of 2021 to ensure uh, the strategic direction of growth paying for growth. Um, and from a, a resourcing sharing perspective uh, through the 2021 budget, we now have a shared asset management coordinator with the township of Mapleton and a shared human resource um, services specialist with the township of Puslush. Continuing on with accomplishments, um, healthy growth and, and staff presented to council information on updating the C2 highway commercial zoning and implementing a community planning permit process and more of that to follow in 2022. Uh, there's a new neighborhood wellness grant program that is being implemented as part of the 2022 budget, which we'll discuss further uh, when we get into, into budget discussions. Uh, we're well underway with well F2 and F5 optimization to increase capacity uh, from a water perspective. And we are also well underway with future well exploration to look at new well opportunities within Center Wellington. Uh, we have the new provincial water taking regulation that was in place April 1st of this year. And we have the salt vulnerable areas, salt management and source protection policies approved by council in 2020 and also approved by the province in 2021. Um, in terms of 2022 priorities going forward, obviously attainable and affordable housing is, is something that's on the, the top of minds of everybody at this point. Uh, we have the um, proceedings uh, with the Alora Community Center construction project. Um, we're going to be reviewing the heritage uh, grant program and obviously the official plan amendment that was discussed last night um, from a heritage landscapes uh, perspective. Uh, we have the indoor training facility planning process that is expected to continue. Um, we'll continue on with well exploration, trying to find new, new uh, water capacity going forward. Uh, we have some bylaws coming forward in, in 2022, both from a purchasing and a public tree perspective. 
um, employment land servicing and, and the sales policies with respect to that, as I mentioned earlier, are expected in 2022. Um, I mentioned the C2 highway commercial zoning and the community planning permit process, more coming forward to council on that. Um, supporting events, hopefully to begin more in 2022 as COVID restrictions ease. And obviously we have the 2022 municipal election that um, um, is a significant event that's happening in 2022. So that really concludes the, um, the strategic planning slides and just moving directly into the actual budget presentation itself. Um, this is where Mark and I will, will tag team in, in the presentation and then move into the specific areas and, and allow for question and answer at that point in time. Uh, we're gonna start with an overview and, and summary of, of the budget process. Um, I'll put less emphasis on the strategic planning piece given that I was able to speak to Andy's slides. Um, we'll talk about asset management and how that relates to the budget process and some general budget information. And then after that, Mark will get into um, some of the tax supported operating budget facts and challenges, um, capital items, um, impacts on, on the levy going forward. Uh, we'll have a quick look at the three year operating forecast, but that'll be something we'll, we'll take a little bit more to look at um, later on in, in budget deliberations. We'll get into capital, some of the capital. Um, facts and, and significant projects that are moving forward in 2022, as well as, as the capital the capital levy and, and the bridge plan. And then I'll conclude the presentation with a, a look at the debt analysis, um, and then we'll get into the actual operating budget from there. So not too much on this slide, given that I just took a few minutes on, on strategic planning. I just, again, want to reiterate the importance of the strategic plan. And, and the overall connections to the budget process. Uh, we need to make sure the two are aligned every year and I'm, I'm fairly confident that we've done that in, in the 2022 budget. Now onto asset management planning and, and council hears me say this every year, but it, it's, it's an important piece to, to reiterate to everybody. Um, asset management planning is becoming more and more of a priority in, in municipalities in Ontario. Um, and it's not just a matter of being able to develop an asset management plan. It's, it's to change the day-to-day -day processes that staff go through so that asset management planning becomes a way of thinking. Um, we need to develop this overall asset management process that makes it easier to develop an asset management plan when we need to. Um, and, and yes, an asset management plan is, is a legislative requirement and we need it to apply for grants and we need it to um, continue to re receive grant funding, such as the, the OSIF, the Ontario Community Investment Fund. Um, but there's also huge internal benefits to asset management planning. And, and tying that to the overall corporate process and, and operations ensures that we're on top of asset management planning from a from a month to month and year to year process. So, so there's, there's huge ramifications around asset management planning, but the more we can integrate it into our corporate processes, the easier it'll become going forward. So that's, that's the ultimate goal of our asset management strategy going forward and meeting the ongoing legislation uh, requirements. This sort of slide out, outlines that overall process and the connection of asset management planning to pretty much everything that happens at the township. Um, we have the linkages to obviously the budget process and the strategic plan that I mentioned earlier and everything that goes on at a departmental perspective, but everything else we do, um, official plan, master plans, condition assessment, staff reports, most of them in some way tie to the asset management planning process. So that's something we need to be able to enhance and refine going forward. These are the legislative requirements for, for asset management planning. Um, the good news um, is you'll see that the, the Deadlines are delayed one year from when you saw this um, a year ago. And that is because the province recognized the, um, the, the, the hard work that municipalities have been doing as a result of COVID-19 and, and managing the pandemic, that they gave everybody an extra year to implement the asset management legislation. So right now we are focusing on the asset management plan for core infrastructure uh, that is due by July 1st of 2022. Uh, we had hoped to have this to council by now, but um, obviously with the with the extension in the, in the deadline and everything else going on, our, our new plan is to have this to council in early 2022. So we have lots of time to discuss it. Um, and 
Just as a side note, we plan on doing a lot more than an asset management plan for core infrastructure. Center Wellington has been known for having um, really good asset management practices and being very proactive in, in asset management planning. So we can we expect to continue to do that in, in implementing an asset management plan for all assets in January or February of 2022. We do have a significant investment in capital assets here in Center Wellington. Um, our estimates at this point, and this will be refined when we bring forward the 2022 asset management plan, but our estimates are that we have over a billion dollars in capital assets at, at the township. So that's, that's fairly significant when you look at tax supported, water supported and wastewater supported um, assets. If you look at that from a per resident perspective in Center Wellington, we're, we're approaching $34,000 per resident. So that's a fairly significant investment in assets that we need to be very mindful of when we're looking at asset management recommendations and looking at budget recommendations going forward. This is a slide that is in the budget book. You will see it as part of the asset management plan. And it's, it's really a snapshot of, it's, it's like a report card of how well we're doing in meeting our asset management um, recommendations. Uh, the, the blue line represents our actual asset investment per year. And you'll see we've included 2022 as, as the budget year and 2023 and 2024 as the forecast years in, in that analysis. The gray represents the optimal investment in our tax supported assets, given our asset management plan. And the orange represents the progress that our asset management plan suggests in terms of recommendations and increase in capital investment. So you can see up to 2019, we are right on line with, with, the, with the recommendations and even not too far off with 2020, where we were just about $300,000 off our target. That has a lot to do with the dedicated capital levy and, and capitals, sorry, council's proactive approach in putting that, that capital levy in place. It also has to do with uh, the center Wellington being fortunate enough to receive an additional grant funding during that time. That was a point in time where gas tax funding, OSIP funding were increasing over time. We're also fortunate that we have OLG funding to contribute to capital as well. Um, so that's, that's really, how we've been able to keep on track to roughly 2020. 2021 was a, a rough year from a, from a capital investment perspective. Obviously we're dealing with COVID-19. Uh, we had a significant reduction in OLG funding. Um, it, it, it overall resulted in a huge drop in our progress to asset management planning. But you can see in 2022 where we're making up quite a bit of that gap but we still have a long way to go. In, in 2022, we're forecasting that we're about $1.3 million short when it comes to um, what our asset management plan suggests in terms of um, investment into our, our capital assets annually. Um, you'll, we'll see new recommendations coming out of the 2022 asset management plan on, on, on ongoing capital investment. So that is something we need to be very mindful of when we look at the new asset management plan in a few months. Just a, um, a highlight of what's in the current asset management plan. And what it suggests is 4.9% um, increases in taxation that would cover both asset investment and inflationary increases in the operating budget um, from now until 2030, and then 2.89% increases thereafter. And, and that was looked at more of a worst case scenario. If you couldn't, if you didn't have additional grant funding coming in, if you didn't have other ways of generating revenue um, that you could dedicate to, to asset investment, that would be the worst case scenario looking at about 4.9% increase annually. Obviously going up to 2020, we did not have increases of 4.9%, um, but we were able to maintain the adequate amount of asset investment. So there are ways of doing it where you take some of the burden off the tax rate. That's just something we need to be more mindful of going forward so that we're not falling too far behind in that, in that recommendation. From a water wastewater perspective, um, basically following our rate study is the recommendation in the asset management plan. And we've been very proactive in, in, in water wastewater policies and, and maintaining our rates as, as outlined in our rate study. Now, moving on from asset management planning to the direction that council has provided to date on the 2022 budget, uh, Mayor Linton alluded to some of this already, but uh, 
Um, some of the direction involves maintaining a tax rate increase equal to or less than 2.4%, and we've been able to do that, which I'll, I'll touch on in a few minutes. Um, assessment growth equal to um, 2%. We're actually received a lot more than 2% um, at the last minute, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes as well. Um, increased fees and charges by 2.4%. And we have a specific report on fees and charges that, that we will talk about um, as part of the budget deliberations. Include 1.7 million in development charge funding in each year, the 10 year forecast for growth related projects. Um, you'll see in my um, budget report to council that is included in the agenda that we more or less followed that for the majority of the forecast period, but we do have some years where we're recommending um, DC usage higher than 1.7 million. And that is primarily due to um, some significant planning applications that have come in in 2021 that has resulted in a very significant DC balance that has resulted in us um, being able to accelerate some growth related capital projects in, in the capital forecast. So we can answer any of council's questions on that when we get to that point in, in the budget deliberations. From a capital funding perspective, we talked about um, the, the funding that is available to, to the township from a capital funding perspective. Um, we did have a slight change to this. And again, this is outlined in my staff report. Um, luckily, OLG funding has, has um, ended up being a lot higher than expectations for 2021. And council will recall that um, OLG proceeds received in 2021 are used to fund the 2022 capital program, um, in addition to obviously arts, culture, and heritage and economic development as outlined in our, in our funding policy. Um, we originally thought that OLG funding were going to total around 550,000 for, for township capital purposes. So that's 88% of, of the funding allocation. Uh, we ended up receiving a lot more than anticipated in the third quarter. Um, so the 550,000 for capital has been increased to a million seventy thousand dollars. So almost almost double the OLG proceeds that can go into capital. Um, we have outlined what projects are recommended to be used for that additional capital funding within um, the council report, and we'll go through that as part of the budget deliberations. I mentioned the OLG funding allocation policy. Um, Council agreed to keep it status quo for 2022, and we'll make sure that that is discussed again before the 2023 budget is, is approved. Um, I guess that'll be with, with after the election with, with the new council. Arts, culture, and heritage OLG funding is now being done through a grant application process, and you will see through social media and through ConnectCW that we have um, opened up that grant application process uh, in our accepting applications. Um, those applications will be forwarded to council early in the new year and uh, council can decide how the arts, culture and heritage OLG funding will be allocated at that time. We were given specific direction on the long-term capital forecast and the bridge and culvert 10 year plan. Um, so we spent um, the greater part of two pre-budget meetings on, on that particular subject. Um, Council approved the staffing strategy or the approval of the moving forward with the staffing strategy for 2022 within the, within the budget. Um, we will talk about um, further strategies for 23 and 24 and beyond 24 as part of budget deliberations as well. And, and council approved the budget timeline for 2022. Uh, just an update on, on inflation. Um, Inflation continues to increase, um, which does put added pressure on both our, our operating and our capital budgets. Um, as of printing the budget book, um, CPI, which is the operating relating index, is, is sitting at approximately 4.9% within Ontario. That is year over year as of October. Um, so you can see based on the, the blue line there, that's unprecedented for the last 20 years to, to have um, CPI that high. Um, we're hoping it'll go down, but early indications are that it, it, it'll take a little while for that to come back down to um, the, the target of, of around uh, 2%. On a capital side, the construction index, again, are at unprecedented levels. Um, quarter three year over year increase is 11.6%. Is so that is, that is significant from a capital inflation perspective and far beyond the 
the increases we've seen over the last 10 years. Um, so when you take those two into account, the weighted index that we've been doing annually as part of pre-budget meetings um, for the township comes in at 6.7%, which is, which is significantly higher than the 2.4% approved by council as, as an as a impact on taxation. So uh, we were mindful of that in, in trying to bring forward the budget you see uh, that we're going to discuss today. Um, obviously, we need to be very cautious in spending going forward, given, given these inflationary impacts, um, but we're happy to take on any questions on this as we move forward through, through budget deliberations. In terms of the um, comparison of the budget uh, for 22 compared to 2021, uh, we are up overall. Uh, we have an overall budget of just about $65 million when you take operating, um, full operating and, and capital into account. We did dip down in 2021. I believe we were in and around 60 million in, in 2020. Um, obviously with, with the impacts of COVID-19 on revenue um, and capital funding in 2021, we took a, a dip in, 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 in overall funding budget wise, uh, but we are back up to, to approximately 65 million for, for 2022. In terms of the overall increase on the townships component of, of the tax bill, um, when, when staff consolidated all of the departmental budgets, um, basically we, we, we had an, a number of discussions on, on the, the inflationary pressures that we have on, on our budget this year, on uncontrollable pressures that we have on, on, on this budget, such as increases in, in utilities, increases in insurance, um, impacts of, of benefits and other staffing costs. Um, basically, we, are give, we gave the direction to staff that we need to make sure that all other control book costs more or less stay at status quo uh, when comparing 21 to 22. Um, we're in a, a year where we're passing two budgets in the same calendar year. We passed the 2021 budget in January, and now we're passing the 2022 budget in December. So that puts a lot of a lot of work and, and effort in, in staff's hands and pulling together the budget. So we wanted to make sure that when, when we pulled together this initial budget, we were starting off at a really good place budget-wise. And, and as, you, as you can see, that budget, when we pulled together um, everything that the departments had provided in, we ended up at 2.5% increase in taxation. So I want to commend staff involved in the budget process for their uh, their leadership and, and sticking to status quo and, and controllable costs in setting the 2022 budget. Um, to be able to come in at an initial number of 2.56% is, is amazing and uh, really help the senior team in trying to come down to um, the, the council directed um, percentage of 2.4%. So we did find additional reductions to get us down to the 2.4% increase in the general levy. Um, those are show, shown in the staff report and in, in the agenda, um, roughly $24,000. Uh, you will notice that a lot of those items are revenue increases rather than cost decreases because we were very, very lean in setting the 2022 budget. The, the cost side of things, as I mentioned earlier, we're more or less trying to keep that status quo for 2021 versus 2022. Um, there are concerns around being able to meet current levels of service doing that, given, like I said, the, the uncontrollable pressures of inflation and, and insurance and, and utilities and so forth. Um, but we were able to come in at that council directed number of 2.4%. So the 2.4% is the increase in the general levy. The dedicated capital levy is coming in at a 0% increase, again, as directed um, through, through the pre-budget meetings. So the weighted increase in the townships piece of the budget um, or the townships increase of the tax bill is 2.18%. So that's combining the increase in the general levy of 2.4% and then the 0% increase in the general in the, in the capital levy. So that weighs in at a 2.18% increase in taxation from a, from a township perspective. One final slide from me, and then I'll turn things over to Mark. Um, we will be talking about fees and charges as part of this budget, as we do every budget. Um, we have stuck to council's direction of 2.4%, but there are cases where we're recommending more or less than 2.4%, and we can have that discussion with council when we get to that budget report. 
but there are clear linkages to both the operating budget and capital budget uh, when it comes to fees and charges. Therefore, it's, it's critical that we talk about fees and charges as part of the budget process and, and pass the fees and charges by law at the same time as passing the budget. Okay, um, pass things over to Mark to complete uh, the rest of the presentation. All right, thank you, Dan. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Um, I'll go through a number of uh, facts related to the operating budget and then taxation facts and then um, shift gears and do a high level look at uh, some capital budget facts as well before turning back over to Dan at the end of the presentation. So first slide here, the average residential tax bill breakdown. This is pretty much comparable to last year in that uh, of the taxes collected here at the township, um, the township maintains 30% of the residential tax bill. Education gets 14% and the county gets 56%. The dollar amounts that are there are assuming that the township is at 2.18% uh, tax increase on their portion of the levy. Education's at 0% and the county is at 2%. And that's based on um, basically where the county was going at the time the compilation of this information was that uh, they were looking at a 2% increase. Um, so the total tax levy uh, would be $4,279 on a residential property with average assessment of $381,000. And that average assessment will sound low, but uh, uh, MPAC has not uh, reassessed uh, properties since uh, 2016, I believe it is. Um, Senator Wellington facts. So some more, uh, the, the next one here is the av uh, average uh, residential tax bill breakdown. So. This is since uh, amalgamation. You can see the county had a sharp increase early on um, in the 2000s and then has pretty much um, plateaued. Uh, education has decreased and Senator Wellington's portion of the tax bill has gone from uh, the low 20% up to 30% and it's plateaued the past couple of years. Right. So this slide uh, just provides the uh, the amount that the township retains on the average commercial and industrial tax bill. So the township uh, maintains 22%, education gets 37%, and the county 41%. And these percentages are pretty consistent with uh, last year as well. All right, so this slide uh, everybody's probably familiar with. This uh, attempts to um, show the complexities of the municipal budget. There's a number of arrows that are actually missing here as well, but these are the main ones. Um, starting from left to right, the left-hand side uh, shows the um, sources of funding for the operating budget, uh, the main one being property tax, um, user fees and grants are significant uh, funders of the operating budget. Um, the operating budget, just so you're aware, takes into account the day-to-day -day, um, expenditures. So these would be salaries and benefits, utilities, fuel supplies, insurance, um, some minor equipment. Um, also, there's uh, built in the operating budget a $900,000 transfer to the general capital reserve that's used to fund capital. Um, funding such as slots money, OSIF, uh, the Canada Community Building Fund, which uh, is formerly gas tax, so they changed the name. Um, these sorts of revenue come into the operating budget and then we transfer them into reserves and those reserves are used to fund the capital budget. There's also uh, some res uh, reserve transfers such as the election reserve where uh, every year for four years, we, we tuck away um, or transfer funds into a reserve. And then in the uh, year of the election, we transfer the, the reserve money back into the operating budget to fund the cost of the, of the election. Uh, this helps to maintain um, a level of taxation that won't spike in um, uh, the year of, of an election. Um, so moving to the right-hand side, then we've got the capital budget. Um, the capital budget uh, is a rule of thumb at the township, is essentially items that are one time and greater than $5,000 in value. So we're talking our big ticket items, so road reconstructions, new buildings, uh, vehicle and equipment replacement and new vehicles and equipment. Um, sources of funding for the capital budget, you can see are 
those reserve monies that we've, we've put away, like slots money and general capital reserve and OSIF and the dedicated capital levy. Um, there's also other external sources like development charges, grants, developers uh, could fund uh, a significant portion in any uh, given year if there's a new subdivision. Um, and also occasionally debt is taken out to fund a major project that uh, is proposed in the capital budget. And when debt's taken out, you can see operating uh, budget then has to fund the uh, future um, debt payments, both principal and interest. Okay, next slide, Dan. So as you can see in the operating capital budgets, there's really kind of three um, sections in each of them. Um, operating capital have a tax supported portion. They have a waterworks supported portion, which is funded from water rates. And then there's a wastewater supported uh, uh, area as well, which is funded from uh, wastewater rates. Go ahead, another slide there, Dan. So now just specific to the operating budget, some high level facts. Uh, the operating budget for this year is uh, proposed to be $44.4 million and is split between tax supported of 31 million and user to pay, which is the water wastewater budgets of about 13.4 million. Next slide, Dan. So high level, I'm not gonna go over all of this, but because uh, it's kind of been touched on already, but uh, the 2022 budget process, we essentially started with the uh, capital budget back in May. Um, this is pretty much becoming uh, an all year process now with the budget. Um, and we began the operating budget uh, meetings with staff in about mid-August. Uh, both the capital operating budgets were finalized near the end of October. Um, and we also had three pre-budget meetings, uh, one in June, which was a direction, uh, receiving direction from council. September's meeting, uh, pre-budget meeting, with the focus was mainly on the 2022 capital budget. And we also went over the 10-year uh, uh, bridge plan. And then the meeting in October was looking at the 10-year capital forecast and um, looking at uh, the 2022 staffing strategy and getting approval from council to kind of layer that staffing strategy into the draft budget. Um, we are uh, hoping to... Uh, um, pass this budget at a regular council meeting on December 20th. Okay, so this slide, uh, next, next few slides are just a series of graphs which uh, try to depict the operating budget um, between kind of gross revenues, gross expenses, and then this one is net uh, expenditures. So just gives you a high level overview of where the majority of the funding or the expenditures are in the operating budget. So infrastructure services, about 30%, uh, community services, 34%, obviously the two largest uh, departments. Um, and uh, th this changes very little from year to year, maybe a percent here, a percent there, and that's about it. Uh, next slide, Dan. So the gross revenue by function, again, just uh, breaking down, where does all the funding come for the operating budget? So the taxation piece at 54%, uh, this is has uh, gone down a couple percent from last year. Uh, main reason for that is um, it's really just a, a mathematic function and that um, the, uh, the slots money uh, we've um, returned the budget for it to kind of pre-pandemic amount. Um, at 2.5 million estimated to come in, that makes the whole budget bigger, which makes taxation a smaller portion of that. Um, and actually, if you go to the next slide, Dan, it'll, it'll show a little better. You can see in 2021, it went up to 56%. Well, a big part of that, COVID obviously is a little bit of it, but the bigger part of it was really that uh, the, the budgeted estimate for um, slots money had gone down $850,000, which meant taxation became a bigger portion of the overall revenues. Um, so we see as, as, as um, you know, slots gets back to normal in 2023, we'll probably level out at 54% again in 2023, or may even dip again to the 53% amount. So next slide, Dan. Uh, gross expenditures by function. So again, this is taking all the expenditures and putting them into different pools. So uh, the main one uh, being salaries and benefits of 44%. Um, most municipalities typically run around 50% or some even more. 
Uh, it's really dependent on where their focus is on services offered though. It can vary significantly between definitely the upper tiers and lower tiers. Um, so here is over time, the salaries and benefits uh, since 2010. You can see we've kind of plateaued around, it's been around 44% since 2016 for the most part. So some funding challenges every year, there's always funding challenges uh, to, uh, to make sure that we can pull together the, the capital and operating budgets at a, at a reasonable tax increase. Um, so the one that's that's been hanging around for a number of years, reduced government funding is obviously the reduction in the OMPF funding. And again, we were faced with another 15% reduction in the OMPF funding at one time. That funding was about a million and a half dollars we received and um, uh, now we're down to a, a less than a few hundred thousand dollars. Um, obviously, the impacts of COVID-19, uh, huge impact on 2021. Uh, 2022, we see obviously a reduced uh, impact of COVID-19, but it is still um, still there. Uh, we'll have a slide on it that I'll get into in a few minutes, but um, uh, we do still have some reduced revenue in community services and obviously um, uh, reduced uh, interest income revenue, I anticipate as well. Um, revenue generation. <clears throat> so every year we try to, to decrease our reliance on taxation and uh, increase non-taxation sources of revenue. So these would be sources such as development charges. Um, you know, we, we apply for grants when, uh, when we can and, uh, and increase user fees um, at, at a reasonable rate and when it makes sense. Um, funding legislative requirements. So every year, the, and, and these are ongoing. Um, there's a number of requirements that uh, that we have to to fund. These would be things like accessibility legislation, um, asset management, source water protection, and we also need to meet minimum maintenance standards for our roads. Um, we also have to maintain our existing services. So these would be the services that we offer through the fire department, uh, water, wastewater services. Um, and we have to maintain our, our parks and roads and then uh, make sure our, our community centers are well maintained as well. Um, also in the operating budget, as I mentioned earlier, we need to fund our, our debt commitments. Uh, we have $2.8 million in uh, uh, debt commitments in 2022 that are in the budget. And we're also faced with a with a strange economic environment right now, where we've um, where we've got you know very historically low interest rates, and we're looking at a potentially high in, uh, inflationary environment. So over the next year, we may see, or we've we've actually built into the budget where interest rates will we're predicting that they will increase based on um, uh, advice from the banks and so forth. So next slide, Dan. So. This uh, just summarized the impacts of COVID-19 that are built into the budget this year. So um, uh, in 2022, the main areas that are impacted by COVID-19 are, um, we still have some uh, revenue and community services so that, uh, it's not, that we haven't budgeted to return to the kind of pre-pandemic uh, levels yet. Uh, I believe uh, we'll get into this when we get there, but it's mainly kind of in the aquatics area. Um, and uh, investment revenue, as I mentioned earlier, with uh, interest rates still at historical lows, we don't see our investment revenue returning to our pre-pandemic balance uh, in 2022. Um, you will recall that uh, Council wisely set up a, a, a COVID-19 reserve, I believe it was actually set up before we received any funding from the province. What we did was we took the 2019 surplus of about $780,000 and started a COVID reserve. Uh, and then the feds and the province came forward over the next uh, year or so with uh, close to 1.5 million in, uh, in funding. Uh, so that gave us a, a total COVID uh, reserve balance of about $2.2 million. Um, the 2022 budget includes about close to $500,000 of COVID-19 reserve transfers uh, to fund the impacts. And as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, investment income, we see about $130,000 of COVID money to offset uh, reduced investment income, about $230,000 to offset uh, shortfalls in community services. And then uh, there's a capital project for additional cleaning at uh, community services facilities. That's about 110,000. 
Um, so when you take all this together, reserve funds uh, for COVID-19 are estimated to be about $560,000 at the end of the 2022 fiscal year. And what that means is uh, what would remain would, would be just the township surplus portion in there. We would uh, have fully spent the federal and provincial funds. Next slide, Dan. So this slide um, depicts the, uh, the internal um, contributions of capital that are built into the operating budget. So this, uh, this is key in that these are the amounts that we have control over. Um, external forces can't really take this away from us. It's built into our base budget. Um, and it's, it's amazing to see that over the span since 2014, there's about $2.5 million increase in this amount, um, largely due to the, the capital levy. Um, is, is a stamp of course, but you see there's some big increases there that we built into our vehicle and equipment life cycle replacement, which, which definitely helps work towards um, you know, meeting our asset management goals. Next slide, Dan. So on the other side of things, we've got our external sources of funding for the um, for the, the capital uh, budget, um, and um, you can see here that uh, you know it, it has increased uh, about one point it's one million two hundred fifty thousand dollars roughly since twenty fifteen, um, and that largely is due to an increase in OSA funding. As you can see, it was about $300,000 and it's now about 1.3 million. Um, but the one thing about the external piece here, and you can see the implication of that in 2021 is we don't have control over this. You can see the pandemic obviously uh, had an impact in 2021 with a reduction in the budgeted amount for, um, for slots funding. Um, and again, I'll also note, you can see that in blue, there's a Canada Community Building Fund that is what was formerly called gas tax. Okay, next slide, Dan. So the next two slides um, are really more a checklist. Uh, we will touch on each one of these items as we go through the budget. Um, so I don't want to get hung up and going in details here. As I said, it's more a checklist. Uh, what I've done is I've gotten into the budget and tried to pull out, well, I have pulled out all the items that are um, either increasing or decreasing the tax rate uh, that are more than $10,000. So the first slide here are all the items that increase the tax rate. And then Dan, if you go to the next slide, these are all the items that decrease the tax rate. Um, and you can see that we get to the balance of 2.4% at the bottom there. This is also included in the budget book as well. All right, so next slide, Dan. So paying for growth, uh, essentially the... Um, the 2022 assessment growth uh, at 3.21% was about $481,000. We've taken uh, some of that growth and applied it to uh, layering in the staffing strategy that totaled $205,500. And we have increased the contribution to the general capital reserve from the operating budget from 875,000 to 900,000. So in total, we've, we've used 230,500 of the growth and the remaining assessment growth, about 250000 has actually been applied to the tax-supported operating budget to reduce the tax rate in 2022. Uh, that uh, worked out to about 1.6% uh, reduction in the tax rate by applying this assessment growth, unused assessment growth. Next slide, Dan. So staffing strategy, uh, I believe this was presented to council back in October at the pre-budget meeting. So these, uh, this just summarizes the impact that has been layered into the uh, 2022 draft budget. Uh, these are various positions, and I will touch on every single one of these positions as we go through uh, the, uh, the operating budget pages. So this just depicts the, uh, the breakdown of the 2022 taxation levy. Um, the, the big blue section there, I'll just start from the bottom, work my way up. Uh, the big blue section there, $15 million, that is the regu regular tax uh, um, levied in 2021. The next uh, section, the orange piece, is the 2021 dedicated capital levy that was um, levied. And the next section up, the, just shy of $50,000, $49,139, is the growth in the dedicated capital levy at 3.21%. 
Next item is the uh, regular tax growth, which was 3.21%, which worked out to $481,722. And $371,747 is the uh, 2022 regular tax increase at 2.4%. Um, so in total, taxation is about $17.4 million. And this slide here depicts the, uh, the, uh, the, the tax levy on a average residential property at $381,000 approximately. Um, so as you can see in the top right there, the tax levy change for uh, that average property works out the $27 at 2.4%. Um, there is no change uh, in the uh, dedicated capital levy uh, percentage. And when you consolidate that together, the total township tax levy is $1,279 or a 2.18% increase. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the county uh, was, was aiming for a 2% increase. That would work out the $47 increase for them, uh, which would be a total of $2,417. Education, it's expected there'll be no percentage increase. That's $583 for a total of $4,279 on that average property. Uh, and that would be a combined uh, tax increase of 1.78%. Uh, and that equates to uh, a $74 increase. One thing to keep in mind, a 1% change in the township's portion of the tax rate is $11.37. All right, next slide, Dan. So this is just the kind of the, the bottom line on the three-year operating forecast. There's many pages in the budget book, and I believe Dan will touch on this uh, later in the day. Um, but bottom line is we're, we're looking at a 2.18% increase in 2022. Based on our forecast and layering in the um, staffing strategy that's uh, in the budget book for 2023 and 2024, we're looking at a combined uh, uh, increase in taxation of 2.51% in 2023 and just over 3% in 2024. So there's obviously a number of assumptions that are built in here. The key ones being operating inflation, we, uh, we assume 2 to 3% in certain, de depending on the, the nature of the expenditure. Uh, capital inflation was 4 to 6% we used. Uh, and I'm, as I mentioned, we um, layered in the uh, 2023 and 2024 staffing strategy, and we also built in uh, COLA increases for staff as well. Uh, oh, and one final uh, big assumption that's in here is we assume 2% growth as well in 2023 and 2024. So if growth ends up being higher than 2%, obviously those tax uh, increases would go down. Okay, so I'll just shift gears here and we'll, I'll give you a few slides, high level review of the uh, uh, draft capital budget. So the total capital budget uh, is uh, about $20.5 million and it's uh, funded uh, from tax supported sources, uh, just shy of 16 million. And user pay again, which is your water wastewater uh, budget is about 4.6 million. So again, we'll just uh, show this graphically. Um, so sources of financing, uh, again, this actually is pretty typical. Uh, tax supported reserves are, are um, budgeted to fund about 60% of the $20 million capital budget. And um, the uh, water reserves are 19% and wastewater is 5%. Those are typically the three biggest pieces. Uh, development charges are about 9%. Uh, there is a small debt component as well for uh, debt that's proposed on the uh, ops facility. Okay, next slide. So gross expenditures, so kind of where is the money being spent, what areas? Um, and again, this is pretty typical. Um, we'll get to a slide that'll actually compare to uh, the five-year average. So this is fairly, fairly typical. Um, wastewater and waterworks, so the environmental budget makes up about 23% of this budget and kind of the tax supported areas are about 77%. Transportation is typically the, the highest component every year at 60%. Next slide, Dan. So use of internal reserves. So we used about uh, just shy of 19 million of internal reserves. 
this is a little different than other years. Uh, Dan kind of alluded to this earlier in that um, we used a lot more general capital reserve money than we typically do. And that's really a function of the 2020 surplus. So it was about $900,000, although it was not used during the year. And uh, if, if it doesn't get used, it ends up a general capital reserve and we use it in the next year's capital budget. Uh, and that's what we've proposed to do. And uh, you'll see that the Canada Community Building Fund, again, formerly gas tax, uh, is higher than usual. And that's because, uh, Council recall, we got a, a one-time top-up in 2021. Um, and we've, uh, we, we've used that in the 2022 capital budget. Um, and this, luckily, offset the uh, reduced OLG funding that... Uh, that uh, we got uh, in 2021, obviously due to the closure of the facility for, for the majority of the first half of the year. Okay, so this is that uh, slide I was mentioning earlier. And what this does in blue is the 2022 split um, of, of the capital budget. And the orange is the five-year average. So um, as you can see, we're, we're, there's a little bit more going into transportation this year. Uh, parks and recs down a bit and fires down a bit. But the reason for that is uh, um, the five-year averages are quite high for those because there were big projects in the past couple of years for those. Uh, you recall that uh, we funded the ECC renovations out of actually the 2021 budget, which um, pumped up that five-year average for parks and rec. And fire had an expansion of the uh, Alora fire station a few years ago as well, which uh, has increased their five-year average as well. Okay, so I'll turn it back over to Dan. Thank you, Mark. Um, just a couple of extra slides on debt before we before we uh, get into the actual operating budget. But before I do that, just to clarify something that Mark said about assessment growth. Um, if council is aware that uh, during pre-budget, we assumed a 2% assessment growth uh, for, for this year. Um, we were on track to be at about 2.1% until the last supplemental tax run we received from impact um, dramatically increased it to 3.21%. So that happened in November, um, something we were not expecting, which was a, a pleasant surprise. But yes, uh, just to confirm, our assessment growth is 3.21% in comparison to what we thought it was going to be, which is 2%. Um, looking just quickly at debt, and we'll go over this a little bit more when we get into this section of, of the discussion with the budget. Um, I just want to, I know debt's always an important topic that we talk about at Council whenever we're suggesting debt financing for a capital project. We are very strategic and very careful when it comes to debt funding. Um, for the most part, we're trying to only use debt funding for significant growth related capital projects. Um, so this, this graph represents a summary of um, current and proposed debt payments over the 10 year forecast. Um, you can see um, for the most part, tax supported um, um, debt is, is falling off over, over the forecast period and almost disappearing. Um, and you'll see the majority of the new funding coming forward is, is wastewater related, um, related to the proposed expansion to the Fergus wastewater treatment plant. Uh, we do have some other fairly significant new water debt coming on board as well, and that's in relation to providing new debt new uh, water capacity in the, in the form of a new well and, and connecting that well into the water system. So you can see that being layered in midway through the forecast period in, in dark blue and how that continues through the forecast period. Um, so like I said earlier, we're very strategic when it comes to suggesting debt. Um, one thing that I'll point out now that I can reiterate later when we talk about debt is that we do have some debt financing associated with the um, servicing of the Dixon Drive business park. Um, what we're concerned about here is um, through the McSweeney report on, on the strategy for this business park, it suggested that we're going to sell the lots fairly quickly. Um, so we are suggesting a shorter term debt financing for part of the servicing costs for Dixon Drive. Uh, we're, right now we're forecasting a five-year debt term rather than our typical 20-year debt term. We don't want to um, finance that debt over 20 years and have the lots paid off, or sorry, the lots sold over two or three years. You can't carry debt for assets you no, no longer own. Um, so we're looking at 
a partial use of an internal loan from the Economic Development Reserve, and then partial five-year term debt to pay off that servicing. Um, um, like I said, we're, our overall strategy from an economic development perspective is to ensure that um, taxpayers are not paying for, for the servicing of, of the uh, business park. So we're continuing on in those efforts, but we can um, allude to that a little bit further when we get to the debt discussion. One final slide um, is a look at our debt capacity calculation um, over the 10 year forecast. And as you are aware, council sets a, a ceiling of 25% of, of uh, revenues when it comes to your annual debt payments. So your annual debt payments cannot exceed 25% of your revenues. <clears throat> We're currently just over 7%. Um, you can see there's a, a jump partway through the forecast when we take on plan debt for the Fergus wastewater treatment plan expansion, uh, but then it starts to decline after that. But you can see where we're below half of our allowable debt capacity, which, which is a great place to be in from a, a debt planning perspective. You, you wanna make sure there's significant gap there just in case something unforeseen comes up and you have to do unexpected debt financing. So um, we're, we're planning to be very strategic, like I said, with debt funding, and we're in a very good position from a debt capacity perspective. So that concludes the presentation. Um, I guess turning things back over to you, Mayor Linton, the next step would be to start going through the operating budget. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Mark. And thanks very much, Dan, for that uh, context. Um, really appreciate that. It, put, it puts uh, us in a real good spot to now uh, have a budget deliberation. So let's take um, a three minute break and come back here and then I'll um, ask uh, for qu overall questions, comments from councillors. Let's not get too detailed here because we are gonna get into the detailed oper operating budget uh, right after this, but I did wanna provide an opportunity for councillors to provide and have any clarifying questions of the presentation that they've seen so far. So let's get back here at uh, 10, 10, 10.
Okay, welcome back, everyone. We'll uh, going to turn it over to questions of of council. We'll just go around the room today for all our questions. A little bit of a different order today to give people a, a little bit of a break of going around the, the table the same way. Um, I just uh, Andy probably won't be joining us today. Um, is is the fall was a little worse than anticipated, so he's has to be with his his daughter at Guelph uh, Hospital right now. Um, so if it, if he does show up, it'll be a surprise. I'm just letting letting folks know that. Um, okay, so just the overall questions of clarification. Um, if 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 uh, our staff feel if Dan and uh, Mark feel like we're going to get into more detail on something, uh, they'll just let you know that, um, and we'll make sure that we table that discussion for the right right page and in, in the more detailed overview of the budget. So, uh, any comments? Questions right off the top, Councillor McElwain. Caught me unaware there. Not not, not used to that. being first. <laughs> um, I had a couple of questions. Not uh, just one of the is a quickie on uh, the impact areas, and particularly, I guess, on the uh, the increases. There was one line item in there called reduction and transfer from the general capital reserve to uh, fund short term revenue losses. And I didn't really understand what that meant exactly. So I just wondered if you could clarify that, uh, Mark or Dan. So just for the questions, uh, Mark, Dan, you guys just pipe up um, and whoever feels like they should answer it, um, you guys just decide that. Um, I don't. I don't want to have to say Mark or Dan. So Mark or Dan. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, sorry, Mark. I, I was just going to say that when we get, we have that one on our list of things to explain as part of the um, changes to the community services budget. So we'll make sure we address that question when we get to that section of the budget. Thanks. Yeah, Councillor McQueen. Thanks. I, a second question I have um, for many years now you have had a, a graph showing percentage of gross expenditures representing salaries and benefits um, which does a great job of uh, describing the uh, relationship between those two numbers but um, is that first off is that gross expenditures including both capital and operating expenditures and if it is, I'm wondering if you could provide a list of the actual numbers since about 2014 of the gross expenditures and the gross salary and benefits costs. Um, probably the other meaningful number in that is the total amount of money we have spent on consultants because that kind of fits in as part of salary and benefits as, almost as well. But anyhow, those two numbers are I would love to see those two to see exactly um, what the graph is representing in real real numbers. Okay, well, I'll, I'll take a stab at that one, Dan. So all this graph is doing is I've just dug out of the operating budget, all the tax supported wage and benefits amounts and divided it by the total um, uh, operating budget amount, which you can pull off of the uh, the tax support operating budget summary that's in the budget book every year. So uh, that's the, all it's doing. So the the answer is that this is only the operating budget; it doesn't include the capital budget. That is correct. Yeah. Okay. Can you provide a uh, total expenditure of operating and capital budget for um, for those last uh, eight years? That would take some digging, but yeah, it can be done. Okay, thank you. I, I don't have that at my fingertips. That, that okay. would take a while to, to compile that, but yes. Thank you. Councillor Kittress. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I have a few questions, but I, I really just wanna understand for the taxpayer's benefit since this is when the taxpayers can view um, our process. Um, the assessment growth is on the tax bill of the resident. 
It, I just wanted to confirm that. And I'm just wondering why we say, um, in summary, the residential property of Center Welling assessed at 381 would pay an additional $27 as a result of today's budget because the assessment growth is part of the budget. You just mentioned that that was a big savior for our budget. So I'm just wondering why we, what, what is the actual increase on a person's bill from our budget? Is it 5.61? Dan, Mark? I, I can handle that one through Mayor Linton. Um, assessment growth is, is additional tax dollars that is included in our budget, but it does not impact existing residents. Um, so the, the best example is you have, you have new houses being built and, and assessed, and that results in extra tax dollars that the township and the county and the school board receives on an annual basis. So that doesn't result in an increase in taxes to existing ratepayers. That's additional taxes we receive as a result of new taxpayers coming into the community, for example. So, so the fact that we have 3.21% in assessment growth doesn't mean there's a 3.21% a increase in taxes across the board um, to, to all taxpayers. It's just, it's just an additional revenue source that we receive as a result of new taxpayers coming into the community. Um, so the, the actual blended increase to the average residential taxpayer in Center Wellington is the 2.18% township-wide impact that, that Mark had alluded to earlier, or $27 for that average assessed household. Councillor Kitchens, following? You, you have the three year where you have the tax increases, but you, you have the assessment rate as only two. Because you know that it is going to, we're, we have uh, increase in development charges and an increase will then happen with the assessment growth. So why are we keeping that at 2% when we know that it will actually be higher? Because we are projecting all these growth, oh, growth purchases and growth uh, uh, spending, and we're going to get DC charges from them. Well, we'll also get the growth assessment from that. So, why are we keeping that at two percent for the three year, or for projected for in the future? Yeah, and yeah. uh, that's a good question uh, uh, through Mayor Linton. Um, um, we would love to have more certainty when it comes to when new homes and new businesses are constructed and, and the amount of time it takes for them to result in new assessment dollars for, for our budget purposes. Um, but sometimes it, it's not as cut and dry as waiting two, three years after, after a, a home is built um, for it to be assessed. Um, sometimes there are delays at, at MPAC. Um, so we can, we can see fluctuations in assessment growth from year to year. And it, sometimes it doesn't necessarily represent the actual growth we're seeing um, in the township just due to delays in assessment uh, of, of these properties. So we're trying to be somewhat conservative in the three-year forecast. Um, we know council is not approving a three-year budget. We're just providing year two and three as, as information, inf information items to council. Um, so yes, it could be higher than 2%. Um, I'm hoping it's not below 2%, but we're, we're trying to be relatively conservative in those projections. Councillor Van Leeuwen. Thanks, Mayor. I have no um, real um, first end questions. One of the one thing I do have though is when we do go through the budget, can we try to reference the page numbers to um, to where we're talking about, like when we when we ask questions, because running through the document, I know we do this every year and we talk about the page number, but do we all have the same document for um, reference when we go through this? That's probably the number one um, stumbling as we go through every time. Uh, the other thing is, um, and perhaps maybe I missed this, but the house price that we do use called the average house price, is there a point where we can start looking at whether or not, and where's that one on page? 23 in the bottom right corner 
talks about an assessment of property of 381. Is that a, a typical MPAC price or because should that one be raised um, to the typical? Perhaps I missed that if you answered it already, Mark. And Mark? I can, I can address that one. Um, and in terms of uh, page numberings, um, I think what we prefer is to um, refer to the page number in the actual budget book. So not not the agenda page number, it's the budget book page number, which should be on the bottom bottom right of every every um, every page within the budget book. So when when Mark goes through the operating budget, we'll make sure we refer to the specific page number in the budget book, so that there's no there's no confusion there. Um, when it comes to the average assessed residential property, that's an actual look at all the residential properties in Center Wellington and what the average value is. So it's, it's an actual calculated um, average assessed value. And we do it the same way on an annual basis just to be consistent. Um, so it, that, is, that is the average assessed property in Center Wellington based on the, the assessed figures that we have. Thanks, thanks, Dan. And also it's always amazing that when you look at assessed value versus actual value, it's it's quite a bit lower. And that's why I just wanted to ask that question because um, we, we will see those assessments go up in the future as well. Councillor Dunsmore? Yeah, well, Councillor Van Leeuwen just uh, touched on my concern and that's the impact uh, reassessment of homes and the impact that has on each individual resident. And Dan, can you explain uh, to us when the, what happens when MPAC reassesses a resident's home uh, to the market value and, and what effect that has on their taxes versus how much of that is actually coming to the township? Yes, uh, thank you, um, Councillor Dunsmore. Through Mayor Linton, um, MPAC is actually in the middle of a, a, a huge reassessment process right now for, for our properties in Ontario. Um, we have been told that, that we'll see fairly significant increases in assessment as a result of this, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to see increases in taxation. Um, um, take the township, for example, we have a defined levy that we want to raise every year from a taxation perspective. And that is that levy is collected based on the assessed values of all the properties in Center Wellington. So if, if all the values go up in offset, tax rates go down so that we're collecting the correct levy amount. Um, so uh, so there's, there, there is some um, misinformation out there about increase in, in assessment means increase in taxation, not necessarily. Uh, if, you're, if your property increasing is increasing on average higher than the most, most of the properties in Center Wellington, you will see a, an increase in taxes. Um, same thing if you see your, your assessed value going up at a lower rate than the other Center Wellington properties, you'll see a decrease in taxes. But we don't we don't see a huge increase in taxation revenue as a result of it. Councillor Dunsmore, follow on? Yeah, and just to follow up with uh, Councillor Van Leeuwen's, the average price being the 300 some odd thousand dollars, and that's, uh, uh, we set a dollar value to that. It, is there a way we we can just kind of put on it for every hundred thousand dollars of value in your house? This is this is how much you pay, and then and then people can look at the approximate value of their house and have an understanding of how it affects them. So just to, when we do our percentage increase, can we do it based on a hundred thousand, and then everybody can just do the math themselves? Dan, yes, um, thank you. Mayor Linton, I'm going to try to find the page in the budget that actually provides that information. Yeah, um, it's actually, oh, it's page 23. Page 23 in the budget book. I'll put it up on screen just so that everybody watching can, can see this. Uh, but I believe it was two, three years ago, Councillor Kittress asked for that exact same information. So we put it into the budget book. Um, so let me just share my screen here briefly. Um, so bottom of page 23 of the budget book shows, um, again, an average residential property in, in City of Wellington and assessed values going from 100,000 to 800,000 and what that means in terms of this year's tax levy, um, roughly $7.16 per $100,000 per $100, in tax assessment. So we, we were aware of that being required information as part of the budget. So we added it to the budget book a few years ago. Councillor Foster. Uh, thank you, Mayor. 
questions for Dan or Mark. Um, the I recall in 2010, I was on council and uh, the total budget uh, as you presented today, that being uh, capital and operating uh, tax supporter and, and um, user user pay, the total of those um, was about $25 million in 2010. And today in 2021, or pardon me, 2022, we're budgeting at 65 million. So in in uh, approximately 11 years, we're, we've gone from 25 to 65 million for operating and capital tax supported and user pay. So that's about triple, not quite triple, it's two and a half times. So our, our, our total spending is about two and a half times more than over an 11 year period. Our population has gone from 26,000 to about 31,000 or roughly. We've, so in other words, we've got 20% more people and we spend two and a half times more money. Can you help me understand how, how we got there? One thing is increasing rapidly, our total taxation and billing and spending far faster than our population growth. Dan? Yes, uh, thank you, Councillor Foster, through Mayor Linton. Um, um, I can't confirm your 2010 number. I, that's not a number I have um, available to me, but I would expect to see growth in, in the township's budget over, over the um, 11 to 12 year period. Um, there's a lot of factors going into an annual budget. Um, we mentioned assessment growth earlier and how the, the township is growing on an annual basis, and that results in um, trying to provide existing levels of service to, to new residents, uh, which requires more budget. Um, we have um, tax rate increases on an annual basis, which are supported and approved by, by um, councils on an annual basis. Capital can really fluctuate from year to year, depending on the funding that is available. Mark went through a few slides showing that we have a number of uh, funding sources that are internal and controllable, but we also have other funding sources that are external and uncontrollable. Um, that can also include developer contributions, um, other external sources of revenue that are um, random and, and, and significant from year to year. So I would expect to see changes in our capital budget. And, and as I alluded to earlier in my asset management conversation, uh, we are looking to try to increase our capital investment from year to year to, to address the capital assets that we do own. So that would result in trying to increase capital investment in the operating budget, um, as well as trying to do the necessary capital in the capital budget. Um, and Mark has just sent me a, a note that our combined budget in 2010 was around 35 million, uh, rather than the 25 million that you're referring to, Councillor Foster, so slightly different. Thanks for the clarification, Dan. Uh, Councillor McCray? Oh, sorry, Councillor Foster, follow on. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And and yes, I I uh, I was a little Freudian slip. We went from 35 to 65, so we approximately doubled the total spend, where our population has increased by only uh, 20 percent. My 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 next question, Dan, is um, our payroll service provider should be able to provide us with this information quite easily. Can you undertake to provide to us? I I don't expect you to do this right now, but uh, for this afternoon or for Thursday's meeting, could you undertake to provide us the total annual payroll for the whole township in each year from 2010 to 2021? That's a straight, that's more straightforward. All I'm asking you to do, Dan, is run the report from your payroll provider for each year. You should have a total annual number for each of those years. Can that be done, Dan? Um, yeah, uh, through Mayor Linton, um, I think that is um, more complicated than, than you think, Councillor Foster, to, to pull together that information. Um, I would have to have a conversation with, um, with our, our payroll folks um, to see if that's even plausible. Just, just because payroll is integrated into 
each of the budgets we have and it's 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 blended through through I just don't know how easy it is for us to get a, a grand total number and especially for the number of years we're requesting so um, if council wishes to see that type of information I'll have to see um, how much time and effort it would take to pull that together I, I just I'm just unsure at this point that's it should be straightforward Dan I I've had to do that in my government career. It's, it's done quite routinely and quite easily. It's not that complicated. Thanks, Councillor Foster. I think uh, our treasurer gave a response to that. Um, so if it is something that council wants and it has to go through a council resolution. Uh, Councillor uh, Councilor McCray. Uh, thank you, Mayor Linton, through you. Uh, I'd just like to uh, commend staff for a very thorough and well-presented explanation of the budget process and efforts to meet council's recommended tax increase. The one thing that concerned me and what we've heard so far is the growing funding gap for asset management. How we're gonna close that because each year we delay not increasing just makes it even more unattainable in the future. So I think that's something we need to be aware of in future councils is how do we close that gap. Thanks, councillors. Um, so go, you can go ahead, Mark, um, with uh, the next part of the agenda. All right, thank you, Mayor Linton. So again, yes, we'll, we'll refer to the page numbers at the bottom right, um, which are really the page numbers from the budget book, not from the agenda. So I, I think what we'll do, since we've, we've touched on pretty much everything up to about page 45 um, in the presentation through graphs and so forth, um, page 45, I don't know, Dan, if you can quickly share your screen on that, if you're able. What, what, uh, what this is, is the uh, tax supported operating budget summary. So this is just a high level summary of all of the individual pages that we'll go through uh, uh, shortly. Um, one thing to watch as you're looking at this summary page is please focus on the dollar changes, not the percentages. Um, some of the percentages can look quite high and the dollar amount will be quite low because the, the size of the division is quite small, okay? Um, you turn to the last page of this, Dan, which is page 47. So a number of those graphs that I showed are taking certain numbers over the total size of the budget, as I mentioned earlier. So this is what I was referring to. So the total size of the operating budget, tax supported operating budget, is just over 31 million this year. Last year it was about 28,500. And you might recall that 2021's budget actually shrunk from the year before. Um, and that was due to the fact that uh, we had less slots money uh, budgeted and um, there was also reduced revenues due to, uh, due to the impacts of COVID. Okay, so moving on to the next, uh, section, Dan. So page 48, if you can go ahead one page. Yeah. So our, our thought today was that uh, in, in running through the operating budget, what we do is we would look at it on a departmental section, a uh, departmental basis. So I will run through all of the pages within each of the departments. When I'm talking departments or sections, we're talking about administration and we'll do corporate services and infrastructure services, community services, planning and development, and then we'll finish up with other services in the tax supported budget. So I, I'll, I'll give you a, a quick kind of one minute to five minute kind of synopsis of all the department or divisions within each of those departments. And then we'll open it up for questions at the end. And I'm just going to touch on the high level changes, uh, not, uh, not a lot of the, the detail that may be on the bottom of those pages would get into $5,000 changes and so forth. So if everybody's okay with that, um, we'll start with the administration area. So the administration area, we're talking mayor and council, youth council, office of the CAO, HR and communications and the emergency operations center. So um, before we get, before we dive into that though, I should actually step back and I'll, I'll give you some, some other kind of facts that you might wanna write down to that are related to the, the draft budget and things to watch for as we go through the various pages. So. A 1% change in the tax rate is approximately 154,700. So if you want to change the tax rate by 1%, you need to find cuts of $154,700. On uh, an average assessed property, $381,000, a 1% change in the township's portion of the regular tax levy is $11.37. 
Okay, so if you change the tax ship, township's tax levy by one percent, it changes um, uh, the the tax levy by eleven dollars and thirty seven cents. Um, I will make a note, and this was uh, bolded in the binder as well. The twenty twenty one actual amounts are as of November nineteenth. Uh, therefore, you've only got kind of a partial year there when you're looking at actuals, and they also exclude any year-end adjustments, obviously, because uh, we haven't hit year-end yet. Um, in each division or in each page, you'll typically see administrative costs. Um, for the most part, what's rolled into administrative costs are items like telephone uh, costs, supplies, training, office, small office equipment. And then you also typically see a line item called operations and maintenance. And operations and maintenance uh, typically includes expenditures that are unique to that department. Uh, so these would be things like the audit fee in financial services or election costs in legislative services. Uh, the wages and benefits percentage increase can, uh, can vary significantly between divisions due to the number of staff moving through steps in the grid. Um, and, and why would people be moving to the good? Well, um, basically we could have replacement of staff uh, through the year due to retirements. And there are some significant examples of that within the 2022 draft budget. There's regular staff turnover. And also you may recall 2019, we had a job evaluation study and we uh, phased that in over a few years. Well, 2022 is actually the final phase in of that job evaluation study. So there's still some individuals moving through uh, the steps in their salary band um, uh, related to that study that was done uh, three, four years ago. Um, so major items that will impact wages and benefits. So staff remuneration increase that's built into this budget is 2.2%. The CPP maximum increase uh, for 2022 is actually 10.5%. And uh, just a uh, heads up, uh, that, max, that increase uh, is expected to be Ten in the ten percent range for the next few years, as well as uh, the government continues to phase in their uh, their CPP measures. I think they call it their CPP enhancement program. Um, then EI maximums have also increased seven point one percent. And group benefits, uh, we got lucky this year for twenty twenty two, and that it was a marketing year for our group benefits, and that resulted in an increase of 08 percent. Um, what typically happens after a marketing year, though, is we get some large increases to follow up. So 2023 and 2024 will probably face some big increases in group benefit percentages um, as they try to recoup the, I guess, their costs that uh, they forego in the year of, of a marketing year. Um, so overall, what does this mean? Um, typically, you would expect a 2.3 to 2.4% increase in the wages and benefits line for a division if all the staff were at the top of the grid for a full year beginning January 1, 2021, okay? And don't worry, I put notes in there on every page where we vary significantly from that 2.3 to 2.4 sort of target, all right? So that's just general comments. So now just moving into the administration area. So Dan, hopefully you'll be able to, to cycle along page by page with me here. So if you can turn to the mayor and council page, so what we're looking at here, the only major change here is, is COLA. So the cost of living adjustment and statutory benefit adjustments. Okay, if you wanna to move to the next page, Dan. The youth, youth council. Um, so essentially the scope of the budget's decreased with only one paid youth mentor position budgeted in 2022. In prior years, uh, we budgeted for three mentors that would be paid uh, positions. Um, essentially, all this does is results in less proceeds required from a planned golf tournament to offset costs of the division. Um, and the plan is if there's a surplus in this division at the end of the year, it'll go into a reserve to fund any future potential deficits that would, that would come out of the youth council division. All right, so it's really budgeted for cost neutral. Okay, next page, the CAO Human Resources Communications. So the main increase here is, again, from the staffing strategy that was uh, discussed with council back at the October pre-budget meeting. We've layered in the new health and safety position, uh, which has a total cost of $121,400. 
And uh, there has been a digital media part-time contract position for the past few years, which I believe was 21 hours a week. Um, it uh, has been budgeted for full uh, permanent full-time in 2022, which adds an additional cost of $49,800. Um, also, you'll see there uh, under the operations maintenance line, the health and safety budget uh, for supplies, staff training, and resource materials, which totaled $6,550, has been moved from page 101 in the budget, which is the health and safety committee uh, page, which when we get to it, we'll show a zero now. Uh, onto this department, the main or division. The main reason we moved it here is because of the health and safety position. We'll oversee that budget and the health and safety position. We'll report to the HR manager. All right. Uh, and then the last page in the administration department area is the emergency operations center. Uh, and there's there's no changes budgeted here at all. So all of this is just secure internet and cable for the council chambers. There any questions on the administration area? So these would be pages 49 to 52. Great, thanks, uh, Mark. And at the end of every section, we'll just go through uh, all of council. And if there is any, if you just wanna pass, feel free to just say pass, but we'll just go and give every member of council the opportunity to speak after each uh, section. Starting with Councillor McCray. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lynn. It was suggested in one of our earlier um, budget discussions is that council not take a, an increase in pay for 2022. So I'd like to put that on the table. I believe that was recommended by Councillor Dunsmore. Okay, so what we'll do um, is I'll keep a running a parking lot of, of things like that. Um, and at the end of uh, at the end of the time, we will um, they'll require motions to be moved and seconded. Um, and we'll make sure that we we get to that. So I'll I'll keep track of all those those parking lot items. Okay, Council. Um, Councillor Foster. Well, nothing further to add. Thanks. Councillor Dunsmore. I'm good, Kelly. Thank you. Councilor Van Leeuwen. Pass. Councilor Kittress. Uh, I was going to mention the same thing as Ian, but that's fine. So we'll get, we will get to that, uh, Councilor Kittress. Councilor McElwain. Pass. Okay, go ahead, Mark. Okay, thank you, Mayor Linton. So next section, Dan, I guess if you can share your screen would be corporate services. So the first area that shows, so again, what we'll go over here is legislative services, financial services, IT, general administration, bylaw enforcement, stray animal control, livestock act, and tile drain loans. So if you wanna to go to the next page, Dan, with legislative services. So. Main change here, obviously, um, is is the election. So, um, the estimated cost of the election is one hundred and twenty-two thousand um, dollars. And in order to to have enough funding in the election reserve, we had to increase the operating budget transfer to the election reserve by fifty-four hundred dollars. You can see that under the transfer to reserves line. Um, and uh, that's really the majority of the change here. The wages and benefits are just uh, essentially people moving through the, the salary grid is why you're above that 2%, uh, 2.3 to 2.4% guideline I gave. So financial services, uh, the increase is due to the net cost uh, associated with the new manager of purchasing and risk position that was approved by council back in September. Uh, this position has a net cost of financial services operating budget of about $39,600 as uh, built into the revenue line is $100,000 in procurement charges uh, that will be charged to various capital projects in 2022. Okay, next page. Uh, this one will be information technology and services. 
So the increase here is due to the, the new IT coordinator position uh, that was discussed back in October. Uh, it has a net cost of uh, $50,300. After deducting $50,000 of additional revenue, um, this position is expected to generate through services provided to other lower tiers in the county. Okay, so that's why we had the $50,000 increase in revenue shown there. So the total cost of the position is $100,300. Uh, with a net cost after deducting the revenue of $50,300. Uh, there's also increased uh, software licensing costs of about $43,700. You can see that in the corporate support line. Uh, and this is due to um, the implementation of various new programs. And the main ones having the impact here would be citywide, uh, which is the asset management and work management program and Office uh, Microsoft Office 365. All right. In general administration, there's always a lot going on in this one, but I'll just cut through the everything, all the transfers that are going on and just give you the bottom line on, on what, what really to be concerned about here is um, there, there's net bud budgeted uh, costs in this department or in this division this year associated with the ownership of 205 Queen Street, which is the former medical offices in, uh, in Fergus. Um, so that uh, net impact is $17,600, but of that 13,200 of those costs, which were snow clearing costs, uh, have been transferred from the other health services uh, division, which is later on in the budget. Um, so really the net impact of taking on 205 Queen Street is $4,400. So the 17,600 that's included here, less the 13,200 that was in another department uh, in prior years. Uh, there's also a $22,000 increase in insurance premiums included here. Uh, this will be a common theme as I go through. Um, insurance premiums increase for the township about 12% this year, which is significant. Um, uh, there's also a uh, cost of oh, the cost increases in general administration are offset by an $86,000 increase in costs that are recovered uh, from the environmental services budget. So that's that uh, cost recovery line there, the $86,381. That is essentially the 20% of administration costs of, from the tax supported budget. They get charged over to the environmental budget. All right. Uh, and lastly, the financial impacts of a decision at September's pre-budget meeting to forego WSIV excess loss insurance and use the savings to self-fund any future claims are reflected in the general government division. Um, this results in a decrease in estimated WSIB expenditures and an equal reduction in the transfer from the WSIB reserve, which would be under that transfer from reserves line. Um, the transfers of the funding for the WSIB reserve are contributed from each division, and there have not been any changes in the, the contribution amounts from each division or the total amount that's contributed to WSIB reserve. So as a result of all this, there's no impact on taxation. Essentially, now we have two reserves, a WSIB ABO reserve and a WSIB excess loss reserve. All right. Uh, next page, Dan, would be bylaw enforcement. Uh, there's really minimal change to this division here. Uh, there's a slight reduction there in the administration line, and that's about it, really. Uh, next page, stray animal control. So the increase here in the operations and maintenance line is, is mainly due to an inflationary increase in the Guelph Humane Society charge uh, uh, as per the agreement that uh, the township of Center Wellington and Guelph Aramasa have with um, uh, the Guelph Humane Society. Next page, Livestock Act. Uh, again, no changes to this division. Um, typically in a year, we have about $250 to $500 in costs associated with this uh, division, and that's just how we budget for it. Um, and tile drain loans, uh, there's no taxation impact from this cost center at all. We're strictly a, a middleman in the loan process. And I believe that is the end of the corporate services area. So open it up for questions. Thanks, Mark. Questions uh, from Council, Councillor McElwain. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, 
In the, on page 54, Mark, uh, under legislative services, the transfers from reserves, uh, this is not that important, I guess, but because I know what it's for, but in 2021, we budgeted only 7,000 and, and transferred out 40,000. So I'm just curious why that decision was made mid-year or part-time, partway through the year. Okay, right. so you, oh, so you're you're looking at the actual amount that are in 2021 of 40,000. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not honestly. I again, I, I'm not sure what that transfer is related to. Uh, oh, actually, I do know what that's related to. Just give me a second here. I can double check in the system here, but I believe that is coverage of um, uh, legal costs because that transfer reserve, what makes that up 129,300, it's not just the election. There's also uh, coverage of um, legal costs for integrity commissioner. So we've transferred in yeah, $38,404 of that is uh, from the legal reserve to cover off integrity commissioner costs in 2021. The residual is just covering off every year we have, uh, um, I forgot who it's paid to, data fix, I think the company's called, but they maintain our voting register. We have costs of about uh, 2400 bucks, I think it is, every year to, to cover off the, the, the costs. And that comes out of the election uh, reserve. So, yeah, the, the majority of that transfer is to, to um, fund the integrity commissioner costs. Thank you. And one other question. Um, the wind turbine capital reserve, uh, what is that exactly? Wind turbine cap. Oh, so you're on page 57. Oh, I'm sorry, 57. Yes, no problem. So that's the general administration area. So that used to be called the WPD uh, reserve, I think it was called. Um, and uh, Dan, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but the company was bought out by uh, another company, and uh, that's why the name of the reserve essentially has changed. So this is just $22,000 per an agreement uh, that I think expires in 20. 35, I think it is. It's a 20 year agreement. We get $22,000 a year. We're setting that money in a reserve and it'll be used to um, essentially do some kind of project, uh, either related to uh, wind turbines or something in kind of the Bellwood area that's that's affected by uh, by the wind turbines. So this, this was basically as a result of them using our facility while they were installing or something of that nature or, or using our roads or I can't recall this reserve actually uh, the details, so I was just wondering what it was. Colin is probably the best one to speak to this because I think he would have been involved in the the, the uh, agreement. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Mark, and and through Mayor Linton. Uh, yeah, it's a condition in the uh, uh, municipal access agreement for the wind turbines. Um, there was a, a condition in there that uh, essentially established a, a community uh, benefit contribution of, of $22,000 annually. And so we've been collecting that uh, since ooh, I think 2014 or so. And uh, that's been been put into a reserve. And uh, yeah, and as, as council may recall, there was a, a report uh, that I brought forward, I think back in the summer, just with the, uh, the change in ownership. So it's no longer WPD. It's uh, I believe Capstone Infrastructure is the, uh, uh, the new ownership, uh, new ownership group for those turbines. So I just checked to clarify, yes, we get funding until 2034. Councillor Kittress. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to go back to 54. Um, we had, uh, I was wondering in the legal costs, was any of the uh, procedural bylaw legal aspect was that used in that or where did that fund funds come from for the procedural bylaw and how much was that is that part of that legal services transfer page 54 yeah i don't have that detail like that that detailed information in my fingertips i'd have to go digging in the general ledger for that information that that would take a little bit of time 
could we get could we get that like just so i know like what the that cost uh, sure dan okay. are you writing that looks like you might be writing that down <laughs> Uh, I have another question. Um, it says when the, we take uh, 205 Queen Street, we are increasing our revenue. Um, did we get revenue before? Didn't we have revenue before from the people using that? Um, and I'm wondering like, how much is that per square foot? Like, is that one? one person renting it or is it several or how's that revenue coming in so just reference the page that you're at Councilor. 57 uh general revenue general administration revenue and in the bottom underneath number one it says rental revenue ex it says estimated uh for 205 and i'm just wondering um so I'm kind of wondering about the rents on there. Is it one Dan. person or is it several or? Dan? Uh, thank you, Mayor Linton. Um, so through you, uh, this is, um, I guess, an extension of the conversation that the CAO had with council a couple of months ago on 205 Queen Street, where the building uh, is no longer a medical facility and we're looking to um, have some staff move in there um, in the near future. We're also proposing that part of the building be rented out to a third party. Uh, we're in uh, preliminary stages and in, in developing what that looks like, what the, the rent revenue would actually be. Um, but that's something that we will come forward to council with at a later date. Councillor Van Loon. Thanks. I don't have any particular questions. Uh, most of them have been asked, but one thing I noticed, and I think we're going to have this hit us everywhere, is uh, in the cost of insurance. Um, I can't believe the cost that we're going to get increased wise from uh, uh, insurance, fuels, uh, anything to do with uh, the operating side of things. So I am thankful um, when we point this out that we're able to hit the budget that we even are sitting at. Councillor Dunsmore? Yeah, I have no questions. Councillor Foster? No questions. Councillor McCray? Uh, no questions. Okay, go ahead, Mark. Okay, next uh, Department of Infrastructure Services. So, uh, page 62. Okay, Dan's already there. All right, so this will uh, uh, cover transportation. Uh, Fergus down, Fergus and Laura downtowns, crossing guards and cemeteries. So, you know, turn to the, the transportation administration page here, Dan. So this essentially, will, uh, my comments here will, will cover off pages 63 to 65, which is all the transportation budget. <clears throat> um, overall, the, the budget increase for transportation is $99,247, which is 1.99%. Um, and that, that increase is mainly due to uh, $32,800 increase for public works building insurance or facility insurance and a $5,000 increase for uh, fleet insurance for public works vehicles. Uh, there's also a $20,000 increase uh, budgeted um, for fuel costs for uh, the public works fleet. And the rest of the increase uh, is essentially the cost of living adjustment and inflationary increases to external costs such as materials and outside services. And really uh, the, the increases for materials and outside services have been pretty minimal. Uh, you'll see them within um, kind of the gravel resurfacing area, line painting, and uh, I think there's one other area too, and, and uh, they're, they're fairly, fairly minimal, just inflationary increases. Um, if you can turn to page 66, I guess it is, Dan, which is uh, the Fergus and Alora downtowns. Yeah, so the Fergus and Alora downtowns. Um, so the increase here is mainly due to, again, this was in the staffing strategy for 2022. Uh, it's a new temporary three-year seasonal contract to assist with maintenance in the downtown areas. So the total cost of this position 
is uh, $12,600, and it's been allocated equally between the two urban centers. Okay, so that's why you have a $6,100 increase here. And on the next page, I think it's might be slightly more, but there was some uh, adjustments in machine time that was allocated to these. That's why it's not identical, but there has been a position of $12,600, split 6,300 to each of those downtown areas. Uh, crossing guards, which is the next page, Dan, uh, there's no significant changes here, only cost of living adjustments and, and benefit adjustments. Okay, and cemeteries. So this uh, division we have, um, we're proposing that it be a cost neutral uh, division going forward. Uh, and what that means is uh, essentially there's a budgeted deficit here of $8,125 for the year. We're proposing that uh, we transfer money in from the uh, cemetery reserve to offset that deficit and make this uh, zero impact on taxation. Um, so what that means is we're essentially working towards a self-sustaining cemetery uh, budget, both from a capital side and on the, um, uh, on the operating side of things. So other than that, Change. There are some minor um, increases to training utilities and column bearing and subscription costs. Um, and these are offset by an increase in revenues, which are mainly from anticipated column bearing niche sales. I think that's it actually for that section. So if there's any questions. Questions from council, Councilor McCray. Uh, sorry, I don't have any questions. I was just indicating I couldn't hear you. Councilor Foster. Question for uh, Colin Baker, Mayor. Um, before directly Colin, um, I'm getting a lot of uh, feedback that cemetery maintenance has never been up to snuff these last two or three years. I've had a number of complaints about it. Um, and secondly, um, I've also had a lot of feedback that they don't see the need to have a special person doing downtown maintenance. Our own guys should be able to do both of these items. And so there's a budgetary impact here. Could you help me understand why we're, um, letting our folks down on cemetery maintenance and also that why we can't do downtown maintenance ourselves with the crew we have. Colin. Yep. Uh, through Mayor Linton uh, to Councillor Foster. So uh, cemeteries, um, I'd say, uh, you know, in, in 2020, um, we didn't hire students. So our, our students, uh, you know, really help us out with, uh, with grass cutting in particular um, throughout the summer months. So, uh, so we looked at uh, using our full-time staff, so kind of incorporating um, a lot of grass cutting in, into their regular duties. Uh, so, so the cemeteries were certainly a, a focus, um, you know, through that summer. Um, if there's something specific, uh, you know, in terms of maintenance, I know we've had some, some issues establishing the grass uh, in, in Block D and we're continue, continue to, uh, to, to work on that. But um, yeah, I'm not aware of a specific issue in terms of, of, of the maintenance um, within, uh, within the Bellside Cemetery or is there, is there a specific concern or just in general, you know, the grass cutting and, and gardens aren't, aren't being maintained. I'm just trying to understand the, the concern, Councillor Foster. I've had more than one constituent point out to me of insufficient cemetery maintenance. And this has been an ongoing issue for perhaps three or four years. Uh, I've had uh, people raise this with me each year over a period of time. So this is not a new issue. Call it total number of operators you have on your staff in the roads and in the roads area that uh, that would be doing in the summertime uh, road and cemetery maintenance so number of full-time staff so we have uh nine operators nine, yep nine full-time uh, road operators skilled operators uh working out of the 
East Garage in Fergus and eight working out of the Alora Garage. So we got 17 guys. There's no snow plowing in the summer, obviously. Um, I'm having a hard time understanding why I keep hearing about cemetery maintenance from constituents. I've heard it annually. And secondly, I, I, I'm having a hard time understanding why the 17 guys can't maintain our two downtowns. So again, Councillor Foster, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of a specific complaint um, related to the cemeteries. If, there, if there's a specific issue, we can certainly uh, follow up on that and get you some more information. That's, that's no problem. Um, you know, our, I know our, our operators and, and all of us within infrastructure services take great pride uh, in, in maintaining this, the cemeteries, uh, both in Alora and Fergus and the rural ones as well. They are very uh, special areas to, uh, to a lot of people in the community, um, a lot of our staff as well. And, uh, and, and we all take great pride um, in, in maintaining those. So yeah, certainly if there's a specific concern that, uh, that you're able to pass along to us, we will definitely look into that and, and follow up and, uh, and make the correction, absolutely. Well, you'll recall, Colin, I have done exactly that more than once with you on cemetery matters. I forward you a number of complaints over the last three years. Okay. That's it, Mark. Yeah, I would just like to speak to that issue because I did have uh, a complaint from a, a resident regarding uh, the condition of the plot that uh, his mother was buried in. And I contacted Colin Baker about it. And then the resident called me back two days later to thank me and how quickly staff fixed it. So um, I don't know where Councillor Foster is coming from, but anytime I've had a complaint and I've sent it forward, it's been fixed uh, completely and quickly. Well, Neil, I've had similar complaints. Uh, point, of order. point of order, Councillor Foster. Um, I, didn't, I didn't name you, so this is, this is not just a discussion time right now. Councillor Van Leeuwen. Thanks, I have nothing. Councillor Kittress. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I have, a it's page 64, um, operations, plowing, sanding, and scarifying. Now, I, I know that these are not complete data which unfortunately um, it has $580,000 as the actual when we had budgeted uh, 1.173,400. And I was wondering um, because we, that's November 17th, I think you say this is the last data that we have. I was wondering what you would estimate would be the, um, obviously it's weather related, but you know, there's, you know, there's only one month left. Um, and I'm just wondering like what you would estimate that number of actual as possible taking historical uh, data taking. And I'm wondering why we only decrease it uh, 26,000. And I would like to make a motion to decrease that um, half a per, uh, what is it? Uh, what's a percent? Percent is uh, one hundred and forty thousand uh, dollars, half a percent of a, so seventy thousand dollars to cut in our budget for that because I, I don't see this is where global warming is a I don't know, I'm going to be a heretic a positive um, uh, because it you know one degree is uh, or half a degree determines if you're going to snow or rain. <laughs> And, uh, you know, and, and I know that I have friends down in Simcoe and it is about two degrees less and they never get any snow, you know? <laughs> so I'm just saying that, like, I feel that the global warming thing here, um, we're budgeting um, that it's going to be a lot of snow, but it isn't happening. And this has been over a period of time. So I just like to sort of have a discussion and a, a motion to, to, to reduce that by half a percent, which is, I think it's $70,000 or something like that. Okay, we'll get to the motion in the parking lot when we talk about the other things, but I do think it is incumbent for uh, uh, Colin to explain um, the, the, the deficit there. 
Yeah, uh, thanks, Mary Linton, and and I think I'll I'll rely on, on Mark as well. He does a lot of the uh, historical analysis uh, of our spending for uh, for that particular cost center. And uh, yeah, yeah, certainly, you know, it's um, you know the weather, uh, climate change, um, you know, th things are our weather patterns are are, are changing and. And, and we, what we have taken our approach in establishing this budget is looking at our, our historic um, patterns in terms of spending for, uh, for, for snow plowing. And so there's really uh, uh, no magic to it. I think uh, Mark takes a, an average, like a, a, I believe it's a, is it a five-year average of our previous uh, spending and, uh, and works that into the, uh, into establishing this, this budget uh, number. And so, uh, um, we have had had winters where um, where we have approached those numbers um, and uh, pretty severe winters. Uh, I recall 13 was very, very severe. Uh, kind of the first first winter I got here. So welcome to the township. Here's the worst winter we've had in a long time. <laughs> so um, and, and then we had a subsequent winter. I think it was it was maybe uh, 15. That was also uh, we, we did approach those budget numbers. Um, it's, you know, uh, yeah, it's it's hard to predict the weather. Obviously, uh, we don't know in a given winter how much how much snow is going to to fall. But uh, uh, we do know we have to be ready. We have to have material ready, equipment, operators, uh, staff, you know, ready to respond. And uh, um, yeah, and and it does fluctuate from from year to year. I would just note, you know, if there is a surplus that does go back into the uh, um, into the is a general capital. Um, and then, you know, it does get, does get reused, but um, I'll maybe pass it over to Mark to, to add a bit more, more detail to that. Mark? Yeah, Colin's correct. We, we do, um, you know, once we do the budget, we take a look. Does it make sense historically for the past five years? Um, and is it in line with, with those actuals that have happened? So Colin rattled off some, some years where we have come close. I number 2019, we were pretty much bang on to that number that's in the budget there. So that's not that far ago. And I don't recall 2019 being an overly bad winter. Um, one thing you got to keep in mind, a huge component of uh, the, the balance or the budgeted amount there is actually something called machine time. Okay. All this is, is an allocation um, from an accounting standpoint is really a nothing. It's an allocation of estimated costs for um, fleet fuel, insurance, uh, repairs and maintenance, and replacement costs. Um, and there's a total for that. And each machine is assigned a rate. And when they use that machine to do snow plowing, it gets charged to this cost center. So the main reason that we're under in a lot of these and looking at the history here that I've got on screen is we haven't even come close to the machine time targets. So the reduction you're looking at there is actually a reduction in machine time mainly. Um, if you want to cut this, essentially, like the only pieces that make up this budget are materials and supplies. And then looking at history, we've been pretty darn close to that. That's your sand and salt. So if you cut the materials, you're setting yourself up for a deficit. And the rest of it is labor and payroll applied or benefits, right? Uh, if you want to reallocate that somewhere, you've, you really haven't cut anything without cutting a position, really. So in order to make a cut here, you'd have to either cut a position or set yourself up for a deficit on sand and salt materials, which means we'd run out. Uh, last year we budgeted, so 2020 actuals, we budgeted $335,000 for sand and salt. We came in at 318,000. So there's been price increases, but we budgeted again at 335,000 for sand and salt. That's pretty much just keeping an inflationary increase in there. Salt prices uh, vary considerably from year to year, if I remember correctly, Colin. Yeah, and I just I would just add to that uh, 2019. Um, if I recall correctly, uh, it, it and I remember having some conversations on this one. It snowed almost every weekend. It seemed uh, uh, that that winter, uh, it, it, and so that that requires you know kind of overtime. And uh, our staff coming in on on weekends, I believe it, there was quite a bit of snow over the the, the Christmas Boxing Day 
time frame as well. And uh, yeah, that resulted in in quite a bit uh, of overtime in order to uh, to address those uh, snow events. And, and you're correct, Colin. I can see that in the 2019 actual was where we were over budget on labor costs. We were way over on material costs by 100000 that year. And the reason that it came in close to uh, budget that year is because machine time was under by $160,000. And again, machine time is a nothing in this budget. It's a, a management accounting way of allocating overhead costs located in another part of the budget to each of these line items within the transportation operations line. And it also, we have machine time allocations within um, uh, Parks and Rec as well. Councilor McElwain? Pass, pass, sorry. I thought you were calling me something there, Councilor McElwain. I didn't get the P. Councilor McRae? Uh, thank you, Mayor. And then, um, further question through you to um, Mark. So the uh, sanding costs that are identified under the plowing, is that sanding also used for sidewalk maintenance? So is that where you're putting the cost for the sidewalk sand and salting? Yeah, actually all the sand and salt costs go under plowing, sanding and scarifying. The reason I ask is um, with climate change, we may see less snow, but we may also see more freezing rain events. And we have been seeing more of that in this community. So that's something for us to also consider before um, deciding to reduce that budget. That's a good point. And that's probably because, again, for material and supply costs for sand and salt, essentially we're looking at historical numbers. And that's probably what is impacting that is the, the increase in freezing rain that we've had. Okay, go ahead, Mark. Is that the end of that section? Okay, so I guess we're on to community services now. So, Dan, if you can share your screen again, please. It should be page 70. Okay, so I'm not going to read all these sections to you, but uh, essentially the main ones are going to be, that we'll talk about be fire, parks and recreation, um, the theater, tourism, and uh, the, the community grants as well, and the senior center. So if we turn to page 71, Dan. So the fire department, so fire, uh, the overall budget increase is 0.6% or $9,070. Um, you'll see there, there's a wage increase of only 0.1%. Uh, this is mainly due to uh, some retirements in the past year. Uh, that were um, uh, those uh, individuals that retired were at job rate and their salary band and uh, the replacements were hired at a lower step in the grid. So that's essentially why you're not seeing the 2.4% uh, uh, amount there. Um, but what this means is that uh, we'll see future increases um, greater than the cost of living index in this department for the next few years as uh, those uh, individuals work their way through the salary band. Um, there's also a $12,450 increase in fleet costs. And by fleet costs, I mean insurance, fuel, and repairs and maintenance. Uh, and uh, that cost increase is offset by increased revenue from uh, burn permits and a minor increase in revenue anticipated from a mutual aid agreement we have with Mapleton. And how we determine that, we just look at the history and uh, um, over the past uh, three to five years, We've seen an increase in uh, revenue from that mutual aid agreement with Mapleton. So we've increased uh, revenue slightly there. Uh, next page, Dan, is the municipal fire training officer. So minimal changes here. Uh, and uh, I think all council knows this, uh, this division is funded 100% by the county. All right, so parks and recreation. Um, I'll bundle all this together. So this will be pages 73 to 81, which covers off uh, parks and uh, the, the sports plex and ECC um, and the administration area here. So the total, there's actually a decrease in the parks and recreation and culture budget this year of uh, $129,286, which is 3.61%. And of course, uh, this is mainly due to the return of revenue in most areas to pre-pandemic levels. 
Um, so the anticipated impacts of COVID-19 and the closure of ECC in August for renovations to the facility are reflected in the budget. Uh, and of course, this is mainly in the sportsplex and the ECC cost centers. Um, as the remaining impacts of the pandemic and the ECC closure are temporary in nature, we've transferred uh, from the COVID-19 reserve uh, $232,000. Uh, in 2021's budget, that was $476,300. And there's also a $23,000 transfer from the general capital reserve. In uh, the 2021 budget, was $85,700. And um, they've been budgeted to fund the shortfalls in net revenue. So I think it was Councilor McQueen had a question earlier on about the one line items and the impact analysis. Uh, I think it's the, the $62,000 change or something in the reduction from the general capital reserve. Well, it's the difference between 85,700 that we had transferred from the general capital reserve in 2021 to the 23,000 that we're expecting uh, uh, transferred from the general capital reserve in 2022's budget. And again, these are just offset um, funding shortfalls. Um, that are expected to be short-term in nature, I should mention that as well. Uh, and where are those transfers included? They're actually included on page 104 under the other revenue and expenses cost center, which we'll get to uh, near the end of uh, going through these pages. Uh, the wages and benefits uh, increase in administration. I see Dan scrolled ahead, but uh, <laughs> uh, back on the very first page, the wages and benefit increase includes the recreation program or contact, contract position moving to permanent full-time in 2022, add an additional cost of $15,800. And that again was included in the uh, staffing strategy piece that was discussed back in October's pre-budget meeting. Um, significant cost increases that are kind of unrelated to the pandemic that are within um, uh, the parks and recreation budget is there's an $18,000 increase in fleet costs, uh, such as fuel repairs and maintenance and insurance. Uh, again, common theme here, a $25,850 increase in insurance premiums for the ECC sportsplex and parks. And there's a $55,000 increase in passive park expenditures for additional hydro and water charges at O'Brien Park for the new splash pad and the washroom that's, uh, that's located at the park. There's additional labor of $26,400 and machine time of $5,300 allocated to passive parks for irrigation. And there's costs associated with tree removal in parks of $5,300. So that's it for the parks and recreation section, uh, significant changes. So Dan, if you can go to the Victoria Park Senior Center, which should be page 82. Okay. So the wages and benefits line here includes the reinstatement of customer service representative hours to pre-pandemic levels. So that's why uh, you'll see the wages and benefits line there increasing 7.9%. Uh, and uh, there's the return of program revenue and expenditures to pre-pandemic levels. So you'll see a large increase in the revenue line and obviously a large increase in the programs line. Um, and what this results in uh, is an increase in the amount transferred to the Seniors Reserve Fund. So pretty much if you take the difference between the revenue line, the programs line, and the transfer to, uh, well, the difference between those two is pretty close to the amount that gets transferred to the Seniors Reserve. And that's all based on the calculation that uh, has been in place for as long as I've been here. So a, a number of years. Uh, so next uh, couple pages, Dan, the Ferguson Lower Downtown Beautification. So no significant changes uh, in these two budgets. Pretty minor. Uh, and the next page after that, the Fergus Way Scale Building. Uh, no significant changes here as well. Again, for the most part, you're looking at allocation of of machine time or uh, uh, cost of living adjustment increases for any labor that may be allocated to these cost centers. Uh, the Allura Public Washroom, so this is a washroom, it's located at 10 uh, East Mill Street. <clears throat> um, no significant changes here as well. And the next page, Dan, is the Fergus Grand Theater. So what we, but what we budgeted here is return of operations to pre-pandemic levels. 
So you'll notice uh, there's increased revenue and expenses. And um, in the 2021 budget, we budgeted for uh, the facility being open for half the year. So the wages were only budgeted for half the year. What you've got in 2022 with back to normal operations is a full year of wages in there. Um, next page, Dan, tourism. So the main change here is the return to regular part-time staffing levels at the tourism office in Laura. Uh, this results in increase in the wages and benefits line um, for this division. And celebrations, uh, no change uh, here. So that's just for a Canada and Victoria Day celebrations. And the last section is actually over two pages. Uh, and this is the grants to community groups. So. Um, there's been a, a $5,000 reduction to the regular community impact and specific annual grants. So this, these are the grants that we've had for uh, well over a decade now. Um, so the budget in 2021 for these types of grants was $70,000. Um, staff proposing to reduce this to $65,000. Main reason for that is total funds that have been requested for 2022 were less than $65,000 from potential recipients. Recipients, So the deadline's passed for um, applications and they came in at under $65,000. So we've reduced the budget to that level. Uh, if you go on the next page, Dan. So there are two new grant um, grants available. Um, so there's a new arts culture heritage grant in 2022 with uh, you can see $60,000 budgeted. And there's no tax, no impact on taxation here as it's funded from a transfer from the Arts Culture Heritage Reserve Fund. So that 60 grand of that 65,000 under transfers for reserves is, is uh, what I was just speaking about. And then there's also a new Neighborhood Wellness and Connectivity Grant in 2022 with $5,000 uh, available. And there's no impact again on taxation as it was funded from a transfer from the Neighborhood Wellness Reserve which essentially was funded from unused grant funds uh, from the 2021 budget. And I think that is it for community services. Great, thanks very much, Mark, for that. Uh, over to council. Um, Councillor McLean. Um, thanks, uh, Mayor. Mark, just, I may have missed it, but on uh, community impact grants, the 2021 actual was only showing as 18,000. Is that really always spent on the community impact grants last year or this year? I know it was down because of COVID, but I didn't know it was down that far. Uh, so you are talking on page... Oh, 91, I'm 91. sorry. 91. So... It's a, sorry, I was looking for the page there where you're asking a question. Sorry about that. So you're talking about the eighteen thousand actual? Yes, exactly. Yeah, and I, I see Dorothy's in here. She may be able to speak to this a little better, but uh, I believe that awards were down quite a bit last year. And then you can see the thirty-one thousand was unused funds from the grant program in twenty twenty-one that we transferred into the wellness reserve. So do you see that, Councillor McLean, the thirty-one thousand? Okay. 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 So, Dorothy, I don't know if, if you can speak to the 18,000. Uh, yes, th through your, you, Marilyn. Um, the total approved for 2021 was $18,080. There was a total request of 38, and some of those funds were not eligible um, for the funding. So, we only approved 18,000 last year. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Kittress? Uh, thank you, Mayor. I have a few questions. Um, a lot of the community services are based upon um, that we'll be back at 100% uh, pretty much uh, uh, capacity of what we're doing. And I was just wondering about the uh, theater, the Grand Theater. Um, it basically is a money pit and I'm just wondering, um, uh, uh, do we have a strategy to sort of break even or 
are we planning something? I know there was before this whole program, but you know, COVID sort of wrecked that. And, and like with a lot of institutions, once you kind of get your, you know, people are still afraid. Um, and I'm just wondering whether that's realistic to um, have an asset like this, um, but not use it really, not get, not have a plan to use it. And so I'm just wondering, um, do we have a plan? Uh, and I'm wondering if, I, I just like to have some investigation of having private, having something, some private organization running this instead of us. And I don't know whether that's a motion. I, I just want to look, have a, just explore that possibility. Um, and then we would reduce the costs and, um, so that that's kind of like one of my that's one of my things I'd like to do. I'd like to sort of have uh, just make motion for staff to explore private uh, ventures there uh, instead of us. Um, that's number one. The other one is the sixty thousand dollars. That's page ninety one now. Uh, the sixty thousand dollars is that OLG monies that we are now because we had extra OLG monies, is that OLG monies? And I'm wondering, um, since we already had, uh, we had a, a very interesting and comprehensive discussion about uh, the cultural landscapes and studies. And I'm just wondering, um, is that money uh, the community groups one allocated already? Or can we sort of, um, allocate maybe for these heritage studies, some of that OLG monies? I'm just, maybe somebody could explain that. Sorry, what page are you on, Councillor Kitchen? 91. Sorry, say that again? 91. 91, okay. It's the $60,000 grants to community groups. And I'm just wondering, uh, is that OLG monies? Um, is that all allocated already, Mark? I can I can confirm that. Yeah, that that is coming from OLG money. So it's based on that calculation where a portion of it goes into the Arts, Culture, and Heritage Reserve, and a portion also goes in the Economic Development Reserve, and a portion of it goes towards capital. So uh, I can answer that portion of the question. <laughs> Councilor Kittress, has it been allocated? like two groups already? Dan? Thank you, uh, Mayor Linton. Um, this is the um, grant application process I referred to in my presentation where we, um, we have released the application process. I believe applicants have until December 31st to file an application for these funds. And then the applications will be reviewed by council in the new year uh, to be allocated during that process. So. It is open to arts, culture, and heritage. Um, um, so it's, I guess it's dependent on who applies for, for the funding through that program. Okay, thanks. Councilor Van Leeuwen? Oh, Councilor Kittress, do you have a follow-on? Um, I just wanted to uh, have a larger discussion, as I said, about the theater, about so I would like to go back, come back to that as a motion to discuss that for staff to look into some private, uh, private use of that, like on a, on a big scale, like, and I just like to explore that. That would relieve some of our costs maybe. And then also, so I'd like to sort of put that as a motion to look into that. Yeah, that's in our parking lot. Um, that's the third item on our parking lot. And that's a big uh, policy decision. Um, and we will make sure that uh, we get to that when we get to the other two items that we have so far. Councillor Van Loon. Thanks. Um, I, I would support the uh, that question that uh, Councillor Kittress is saying about the theater, but also um, the $60,000 one. I am, I am curious, to, especially when it comes to the heritage, because we set that funds aside um, should we not be like, if we're increasing the grant side of things, should we not be looking at using some of those funds? So perhaps we should review the total amount of money going to the grants for those groups. Is that something we can review as well at that time? 
Dan. Uh, thank you, Mayor Linton. Um, yes, when we when we released the grant application as approved by council during pre-budget, we were specific that council were able to award up to sixty thousand dollars as part of the grant application process. So I, I guess it's it's up to council direction if you want to redirect some of those funds to heritage initiatives, for example. Um, so that is something we can talk about when we review the applications. Councillor Dunsmore? Yeah, so um, I have a question for uh, Fire Chief Tom. I always get concerned when I look at the, the uh, fire budget because the growth that's assessed in this community and where we're headed. Um, do you have a, uh, a rough idea how many firefighters that we're going to have to hire over the next uh, 10 years or so? Or is that, uh, is that in the, uh, the budget somewhere else? Chief? Uh, thank you. Uh, through you, Mayor Linton, uh, that is discussed in our fire master plan. Uh, this year, you'll see that we're hiring right now to, um, Approximately six firefighters, that'll get us back up to our 66. Um, by 2027, the master plan has us at 90. So we have to hire that many people um, before 2027. Um, right now, the, uh, the problem is where the station, the third station would be built as far as allocating the land so that we can draw that three kilometer circle that we refer to when we hire the firefighters. And then to have them trained before the station open, obviously they can't just run to the station for the first day and go on a call. So that is all discussed in the fire master plan and we're trying to follow that as closely as we possibly can. Okay, and just for my own um, information here, is there a particular level of firefighters before the province deems that we have to be full-time firefighters instead of volunteer system? So what there is, is there's two standards. There's an NFPA standard for uh, full-time, and there's an NFPA standard for volunteer part-time. So we follow NFPA 1720. And what that does is that every call we go on, we send our times into the Ontario Fire Marshal's office. They look at those times and we have to have, it's a calculation that's done so many people on scene at so many kilometers away in a certain amount of time at the 80th percentile. So we follow those times um, and send them in and we are meeting those times now. But as uh, the town grows, um, obviously, our boundaries aren't changing yet, but the uh, call volume will go up and it'll be more difficult to get to those because of infrastructure and things like that. So right now we are following that standard at what some time that we can't follow the standard, we would be moving more to a composite idea where we would have some full time firefighters um, that could do prevention, public education and station maintenance things through the day. And because it's a there's not as many calls at night. So that standard 1720 is what we're following right now and what we're meeting right now. And we'll continue to do our best to meet that. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chief. That was good information there. Uh, Councillor Foster. Uh, no questions, thank you. Councillor McCray. Uh, thank you, Mayor Linton. Uh, through you, I guess this would be a uh, question to Mark. Uh, regarding Councillor Kittress' um, comments about the Fergus Grand Theatre and looking into uh, having a private operator, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's my understanding that some community groups, such as the um, Laura Theatre Group, um, help to um, raise funds to pay for the lighting equipment and sound equipment in the Fergus Theatre. So would we not have to consider their... Um, donations as part of a discussion whether or not we want to hand that over to a private operator? Yeah, that, that would, I, I don't recall if there was donated uh, assets at all to the theater. I think somebody from uh, community service would be better able to speak to that. But if, if there was, yes, that would probably definitely be part of that conversation. Yeah, and just to remind, I will turn it over to Dorothy to answer that question. Um, this is a that this is a big decision, um, and we will have to get into significant amount of discussion um, about that because that is a significant departure um, that 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 motion would entail. Not something that was in our strategic plan, but it is something that um, council has every right to ask that question. So we will be talking about it, but there's it's that that's not a simple motion, that's for sure. Dorothy. 
Yeah, I just I want through you, Marilyn, and I just want to add that um, the volunteer committee of the theater are a major contributor to funding for that building as well, in, including any equipment and whatnot. Um, I sit on that board level with them, and we've, as part of the um, equipment replacement, we've determined exactly what has been purchased by the township and what's been purchased by that organization, and it is quite extensive. So I just want to share that with you. Um, and as far as a plan going forward, yes, we're doing everything we can to bring the community back into that building. Um, I was there two weeks ago to, at a production and it was amazing to see um, just the excitement of people wanting to get back into live theater. So um, I just wanted to share that with you that we're slowly getting our people back and, and I believe we'll see them back in a big way. Um, that's my comment, thank you. Great, well, thanks. Uh, move forward, Mark. All right, next department is planning and development. So page 92, Dan. So he's getting that up. So what we'll talk about here is the building department, the planning department, economic development, committee of adjustment and heritage center Wellington. Okay, so first uh, division be building division. So next page, Dan, uh, the majority of the uh, $60,000 increase to revenues due to the cost neutral calculation that uh, we're required to do under Bill 124. Bill 124 requires surpluses from building permitting activities to be transferred to a reserve fund and deficits uh, to be funded from that reserve fund. Um, the budget also includes a $5,000 increase in professional fees for potential building code violation issues, and that's under the operations and maintenance line. Planning. So the changes in revenue and wages are mainly due to a minor adjustment uh, for the planning position that was approved in the 2021 budget. Um, and approximately 70% of that uh, position is funded from uh, increased planning revenue and the increased planning revenue you would have seen in the 2021 budget. Uh, economic development. So the increase uh, is due to, it's mainly in the wages line in there and it's due to restructuring the economic development position in 2021 after retirement. Uh, this resulted in a higher grade on the salary grid. All right, and committee of adjustment should be next. Okay, and the increased revenue and per diem costs, which are under the wages line, um, essentially we're just moving those in line with historical averages. Uh, this can fluctuate a little bit from year to year, this cost center, depending on the number of uh, meetings that they have. And the last uh, division in this department be heritage, and there's really no significant changes there. You can see there's a there's a thousand dollar increase or decrease, sorry, in the training budget, uh, which is in the administration line, and a, a eleven hundred dollar increase in professional fees, and that's to prepare uh, bylaws and, and do some research for designations. So I'll just open it up for questions. Thanks, Mark. Questions from Council? Council McCray? I'll pass. Councillor Foster? Pass, thank you. Councillor Dunsmore? No questions. Councillor Van Leeuwen? No questions. Councillor Kittress? Yes, um, I guess it's page 93. Um, about the building uh, uh, permit charges. Um, our totals are, I'm just wondering, we were supposed to have a cap at those and I'm wondering whether we've reached the cap and whether the permits um the cost of them will be reduced we seem to be um having those increase in revenues and i'm just wondering is there a period where we can actually review that and when is that happening then 
Thanks, Marilyn. And I'll take a shot at this and Brett can add to it if, if he wants to. Um, staff are in the middle of a, a, a review right now of both building and planning fees. Um, that was a RFP that council awarded earlier. Um, that that um, study will determine whether our building and planning fees are at the correct levels currently or whether there, there needs to be adjustments to that. Um, so we can see that coming forward to council um, in 2022. Um, also, um, just wanted to point out, as, as Mark mentioned in, on page 93 specifically, we, we calculate the revenue um, based on that building calculation of, of recovering indirect and direct costs associated with the building department. So um, basically what that means is any revenue collected above and beyond the revenue identified in, in the budget basically automatically flows to the building reserve. Um, so that will continue as is until we get the new study that justifies what thresholds or, or prices should be going forward. Councillor Kittress, follow on. Um, but from what I understand, um, we are almost at the threshold where we don't ha have to have any more going to the reserve. So um, when will we get this study next year to determine um, what the permit fees will, could be or in the future? Dan or Brett? I can, I can start. Um, just, just the question around um, hitting thresholds. Um, the thresholds are established in the report itself, and it's basically looking at the costs associated with going through an economic downturn within the building department. Um, that changes as obviously the building department uh, changes and, and the township changes. So the last time we did that study, the township looked quite a bit differently than it does right now. So we're we're updating those calculations so we know what the thresholds are today compared to when we did the study 10 plus years ago. Um, in terms of timing, I'll, I'll defer that to Brett. Uh, uh, well, I would say I think the, the study Watson are engaged and they're ongoing and uh, it's required quite a bit of staff input as well to, uh, it's a, a walking through the process for a planning application, and a building permit application step by step. So COVID has slowed things down a bit that uh, from the township point of view, as well as the consultant point of view. And we have had some changes internally that have affected us. We have a permit clerk on mat leave. So um, the staff resources at our level have been a little bit challenged to try to deal with it. Um, one thing for sure is that we're seeing uh, you know, one of, one of the impacts of COVID was a lot of people went out and started doing home renovations and additions and, and whatnot. So certainly in terms of our total number of building permits, uh, that's been significantly impacted by COVID as a result of people doing all those things. So one thing to keep in mind that uh, when we look at that fee study and our growth, and certainly I, I think both planning and building are gonna, gonna see this. Um, the building department is required to meet mandated times. When a permit application is received, a permit shall be reviewed in a certain period of time. For a residential permit, for example, that's uh, as little as 10 days. When somebody calls for an inspection, they're entitled to an inspection within two days. And so one of the things that we're gonna look at going forward with the volume of permits that we've had in the last few years and the volume of, you heard the, the presentation from the county on our growth numbers, it's a significant increase in the annual number of permits. And so a possible outcome is not necessarily that our fees go down, but that we need to hire more people and spend more money in building because we do have to meet those legislative uh, timelines. Similarly, in the, in the planning side, uh, one of the things council will have to discuss when we discuss our fees is the last time we did the fee study, we stopped short of 100% cost recovery. And so something that uh, council will need to consider, and, and that will be part of the report, is whether we move to 100% uh, fee recovery so that um, the tax base is not 
subsidizing the uh, conducting of planning applications. So that in itself would result in an increase from where our fees uh, sit today. But we do, we do hope the study is gonna come forward uh, early in 2022. We know from our point of view that a lot of the legwork that staff had to do is already done. And the report sits with the consultant to bring back the recommendations in terms of the fees. I know there may be a little bit more other work because they're looking at um, the involvement of community services staff and uh, uh, infrastructure services staff sort of in the, in the process in terms of a new subdivision. For example, when we get to planning the parks, then we've got community services staff. We wanna recoup some of those uh, costs as well. And then of course, um, infrastructure services has a bunch of people that are involved in a subdivision review. And we wanna try to capture some of those costs as well. So those steps are all being, uh, being worked through. We wanna move to um, cost recovery to the greatest extent possible, of course. Thanks for that, Brett. Uh, Councilor Kittress, follow on. Uh, thank you, Brett, for, thank you, Mayor, for that. And thank you, Brett. Uh, I just have a question about this recovery of costs. Do we, are we still going forward with the economic development, uh, like commercial and, uh, and industrial or business part being less recovery of costs and, or is it doesn't matter whether it's residential or the economic development? Yeah, I think I think what you're referring to is a few years ago we did have uh, a recommendation come through the economic development uh, task force that we're looking at our fees. Um, we did for a period of time uh, sort of freeze our commercial industrial uh, site plan fees. In the last few years, we've increased them, I think, by the same uh, relative uh, rate as all of our other fees. So for this year, um, that would be the 2.4%. But um, for sure, that fee that we're, we've been charging is not recouping the actual cost or the amount of staff time that goes into it. And of course, with some site plan applications, um, there, you know, they're significant and we're seeing some significant size of buildings. I think when we put the freeze on, we were thinking more of the small, um, you know, local company that's expanding and not wanting to uh, penalize them, if you will, with, with uh, large fees. But the reality is we need to recover the cost of staff time that goes into reviewing it. And as time goes on and the number of regulations we see, for example, um, source water protection, for example, our applications are becoming more complicated. So certainly I see the direction. And if you look at surrounding municipalities, uh, their fees for things like site plan uh, are significantly higher than ours. Sorry. Go ahead, Councilor Ketchers. Um, so from your, thanks, Brett, uh, from your explanation, when this report comes, do you think that that will be an increase for the economic development side? Is that, is that what we could possibly be looking at? Well, I, I, I mean, I think we'll see a study recommending an increase in fees to meet cost recovery, for okay. sure, for a site plan for commercial development or an industrial development. And then council will have to decide if it wants to uh, collect the fee that would give us 100% cost recovery or, or charge a lower fee and not have cost recovery. Um, but I think what we're seeing in the market of the people that um, we're in competition with or where the businesses are coming from um, that are coming to Center Wellington, they're moving here from larger centers where the fees are significantly higher. 
So I think, uh, you know, we could have five or six years ago compared ourselves to Wellington North or somewhere and said, our fees are higher. They're charging very little in Wellington North, for example. And I'm only throwing that out as an example. But the reality is the businesses that are moving here are coming from other places uh, that are larger centers like Well, 4KW, where the fees are significantly higher and we're not seeing a resistance. And in fact, we're getting some development applications um, surprised that our fees are as low as they are. So, Sorry, sorry, I'm just getting to those questions. Councilor Kittress? Um, wouldn't, um, wouldn't that be part of our economic development strategy though? Um, as part of that, like as we consider these fees, I mean, that's what we've always try, tried to do for economic development. I'm just wondering it, it, when we get the report, will it, will it uh, be going to the economic development uh, committee first or how, how's that? Go? Cause I, I just sort of see that as a, we want all these people to come here. Um, like, absolutely. And we want to sell the park out and we want to build another park, you know, like, and so I just sort of see that because a lot of times, so I'm just wondering, would, would that go to the economic development? And then um, they sort of see that as a strategy. I mean, I think it's a possibility that goes to economic development, but I think from the McSweeney report and the Watson study that was looking at the business case for a municipal business park and the work that the task force themselves came up with. We also hired uh, Wine Garden Associates to do a review. What we're seeing is that the fees are not a deterrent. What, what people are looking for is available land, which is in short supply uh, and even things like our development charges now don't seem to be a deterrent to development. So those kind of fees, the prime thing is having the land available and ready to go for someone to build on and a process that's not cumbersome uh, in terms of the approval process for site plan. Um, so they're really looking for not so much cost competition because most municipalities are charging similar rates for development charges now, or at least the ones that we're in quote unquote competition with. So the fees are really not as big an issue anymore going forward in the market the way it sits today. Councilor McElwain. Um, thank you. Uh, Councilor Kitchers asked my question, so uh, I'm fine. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Councilors. Uh, on to you, Mark. Okay, so Dan, if you can share your screen again, page 98, which is other services. So this section will cover GRCA, other health services, health and safety committee, contribution to capital fund, uh, the OMPF grant, other revenue and expenses, uh, debt, the BIAs, and then taxation. So this uh, essentially is the last kind of department of the tax supported budget. So if you can go to the first page there, Dan, page 99, I think it is. So GRCA, so overall in the GRCA levy, and this is based on their, their draft levy. Um, I don't think they approve it usually, uh, the final levy until into January, but uh, of all the time I've been here, I think they've only changed the draft levy number once, and that was just a few years ago. So uh, as it stands now, the increase is 3.6% to the, the levy. Um, and as council is likely aware that, because uh, we've been doing this for a number of years, properties not connected to municipal water and wastewater services get assessed a special levy and properties connected to municipal services pay their portion of the levy through water and sewer rates. So the reason that you're not seeing an increase there of the 3.6% is every year we look at the number of properties that are connected to municipal services and adjust the percentage accordingly. Um, and obviously the growth is uh, in the urban centers, which are connected. So they're bearing a, a larger portion of that 3.6% increase in the environmental budget and they'll pay for it through water and sewer yeah. rates. Next page, Dan, other health services. So uh, you recall earlier that I mentioned, uh, I think it was 
$13,000 of costs were moved to uh, the general administration area for snow clearing that's related to uh, the former medical office building at 205 Queen Street. Uh, so all that remains in the budget essentially is uh, the health professional recruitment costs of uh, we budget every year for, for $20,000. Um, and uh, there's a transfer from uh, the health professional recruitment reserve to, to fund this. So the impact on taxation is, is zero in 2022. However, that reserve uh, doesn't have a lot left in it. I think it might be less than $10,000 at this point or projected to be at the, uh, less than $10,000 at the end of 2022. Uh, next page, Dan. Health and Safety Committee, you'll recall earlier, I mentioned that with the health and safety position, residing in the uh, CAO HR and communications uh, division. We've moved the health and safety committee um, expenditures, which essentially were supplies and training. Uh, we've moved that budget of $6,550 to the, the CAO um, uh, HR communications uh, division. Contribution to capital funds. So there's a total increase of $211,539 that's directed to the capital budget to fund capital projects. And the Ontario non-specific grant. So this essentially is the OMPF grant uh, that I alluded to in the presentation where at one time we were receiving uh, uh, over $1.5 million. You can see uh, it's, it's confirmed for 2022 that we will receive $196,400 or a 15% decrease from, uh, from the year before. And other revenues and expenses. So the change here, um, mainly due to, to a few things, we've got a $244,300 reduction in COVID-19 reserve transfers to fund the pandemic impacts in the community service department in 2022. So that was 476,300 in 2021, and we're reducing that to 232,000 in 2022's budget. There's also a $62,700 reduction in the general capital reserve transfer to fund the net revenue shortfall at DCC due to renovations planned to the facility in 2022. So in 2021's budget was 85,700. In 2022's budget has been reduced to 23,000. And there's a $180,000 increase in budgeted interest income due to an anticipated increase in interest rates in 2022. Uh, and that's offset by an equal reduction in the transfer from the COVID-19 reserve. Uh, there's also a $750,000 increase in OLG proceeds, uh, and that's offset by uh, transfers to the OLG Capital Reserve, the OLG Arts, Culture, and Heritage Reserve, and the OLG Economic Development Reserve Fund. <clears throat> Excuse me. So next page, Dan. Net debt. So the main change here is the inclusion of estimated 2022 principal and interest debt payments associated with the land purchase um, on Gartshore and Fergus uh, and a corresponding transfer from the Public Works Development Charges Reserve um, is, uh, is budgeted as well, which will fund 100% of those debt payments. Um, so the net impact on taxation uh, of, that, uh, of those debt payments related to Gartshore is zero. And the next page is the Fergus BIA. So they're, uh, they budgeted for no change in their levy in 2022, and that was uh, approved uh, at their AGM back in November. Uh, and I believe at five o'clock, we have uh, representatives from the BIAs coming to uh, review their budgets with, uh, with council as well. So next page, the Allura BIA. So they are proposing a, or I've actually passed it through the membership at their AGM in November, a 7% levy increase. And that works out to $4,381. All right. And payments in lieu of taxation or PILs, you may hear, hear it referred to as, uh, we just, uh, we, we expect an increase of uh, $22,300 in uh, 2022 from the 2021 budgeted amount. So you can see the actuals there were about 243,000, <clears> excuse me, and uh, just applied uh, an inflationary increase to that actual amount. 
And the last item here is the taxation township uh, purposes. So this reflects the 2.4% increase in the regular tax levy and a 0% increase in the dedicated capital levy, which nets to an overall tax township tax levy increase of 2.18%. And there's also a $20,000 increase in supplementary taxation in 2022 that's based on uh, historical experience or averages when we look at that. All right. And that is it for that section. Great, thanks, Mark. Uh, councillors, uh, Councillor Councilor McCray. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And through you, I have just one question uh, from Mark uh, related to the Health and Safety Committee. So the um, total expenses shown, does that include um, training certification for employees throughout the administration? Or are those actual training and certifications carried, carried underneath the individual department um, training budgets? Uh, I'm not sure if Tom's still on the call. They may actually put some of their recertification costs in their fire budget, but for health and safety training, I, I believe that that is born within this health and safety amount of $6,500. Rashid may be even able to add to that as well. Anything to add to that, Rashid? Yep, thank you very much. So very general training uh, um I think is paid through this, but uh, Bruce is here who's been uh, on committee longer than myself, but I know each area budgets for their own professional development budget. And I think health and safety or a course uh, uh, requiring, you know, more than a couple of hundred dollars would go there. So Bruce, is there anything you can add to? Bruce? We can't hear you, Bruce. Doesn't look like you're muted, but we still can't hear you. No. Okay, we'll come back to Bruce if he has anything to add. We'll make sure we insert him into the discussion. Anything else to add to that, Councilor McCray? No, I just sort of, you know, things like fall arrest. Um, yeah. Where does that training fall? Councilor yeah. Foster? Yes, I'm looking at page uh, 109. I see that the total capital levies, just about a million six, million five seventy seven to be precise. And the regular taxation is 15.8 million. My question for Mark is then, uh, so the levy is about 10% of the total taxation. Would I be correct in that statement? Million six and almost 16 million. Sure, yeah. Sorry? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yep, that's correct. Okay, so so really then the levy is really a, a ten percent levy. It's the levy as we're levying it now is ten percent of the total taxation. So so we really have a ten percent capital levy. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not following the logic there. Um, are you, Mark? Oh. No, not, not really. Obviously, the levy over so year, years, over, over years, years levy, levy is obviously increasing. Sorry, Councillor Foster, um, when we turn it over to staff, if you'd let them speak, please. Mark? So the capital levy uh, began, I believe, was in 2015, and we ended increases in 2020's budget, I think it was. So yes, obviously, math-wise, that is going to add up to a, a, a larger number, which will obviously be a larger percentage of the overall tax levy, correct? So the, yeah, the phrase a 2% levy is, is not a correct uh, term is what I'm driving at. It's a 10% levy. Thanks for your thoughts on that, Councillor Foster. Councillor Dunsmore? 
No questions. Councillor Van Leeuwen. No questions. Councillor Kittress. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I kind of would like to follow up on uh, Councillor McCrace because that was on my list too, the health and safety. Um, this is really for Rashid. Um, we're hiring a new person for this. Um, the health and safety and having these committees it was a 2015 thing that the government brought in. And I'm just wondering, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, I know for myself, there's, there's courses that have to be done and they have to be updated regularly because each department needs one or two people. So I'm just wondering, um, it seems like really low, uh, that's all. I'm just sort of saying, um, has, have the, have the, has this health and safety been actually implemented like in a, in, in a real scale? Because I just find these numbers excessively low for a larger multi-million dollar organization like ours. And that has over 200 staff. Rashid? Well, thank you very much uh, uh, through you, Mayor Linton. So, Yes, Councilor Kira. So I think every area, and I would encourage other managing directors to jump in and help me out because uh, they've been running the show long before I arrived here. So uh, if they have budgeted amounts in their own uh, GLs where they've been providing health and safety refreshers, certifications, courses, licenses, renewals, I totally understand, Councillor Kittress, where you're coming from. So I, I don't have that knowledge, but I'll tell you that uh, why this position is asked is because I we felt the need uh, in human resources to request that to council that we need to set up a proper health and safety system here. Um, uh, we need to improve on what's existing, and we also need to look into all those details of budgets. This is first time actually I'm six, seeing this $6,000 amount uh, for health and safety committee. So I take your point and uh, um, I can assure you with hiring the health and safety manager we will be looking at centralizing the whole system of health and safety and uh, departments helping us out so call in uh, or if mayor lets uh, other managing directors to help me out on this one please yeah does anybody have the answer for the whole organization how we budget for health and safety but Dan do you have that or do we have to go to each of the managing directors yeah, I can, I can provide a high level overview, Mayor Linton. Um, uh, Rashid is correct. We do have costs that are health and safety related borne by every, every department within the township. I believe the health and safety committee expenses are just the costs associated specifically with the committee, um, not, not with overall health and safety compliance. Um, so we do have other health and safety related costs throughout the township. And like Rashid mentioned, we are um, looking to hire a health and safety position in 2022 to help centralize that whole process. Follow on Councillor Kittress. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you for that answer. Um, I just would like to know what it actually is. Is that possible by like, I don't know, Friday or whatever, <laughs> like whatever, what's the next day, the second? Um, that we could sort of see what that cost because I, I just sort of when I looked at that and I knew that we're hiring a new person I thought well wow, this is minuscule for the organization so can we get that kind of number like future please so you're asking for all health and safety related um, expenses across the organization yeah that's okay what okay we'll put that we'll put that on the on the parking lot um, make sure that we understand if that's something that can be pulled together quickly Councillor McQueen Thanks, Mayor. Uh, just uh, one quick question. The uh, health professional recruitment, uh, we've had the same amount budgeted for a number of years, but we only spent $6,000, $6,200 last year. And I'm curious why that was. I don't, I'm don't. i on that committee and I don't remember that topic actually being discussed that, that they were spending less than we allocated. So, Mark? curious. Yeah, uh, so the $6,000 you're seeing there, what, what page is that? Uh, oh, page 100, sorry, Mark. 100, okay. Yeah, so the 6,000 that you're looking at there, uh, 
that has nothing to do with uh, really recruitment costs in 2021. What it is, it's actually the snow clearing costs at, uh, at uh, 205 Queen Street because uh, the townships always paid for snow clearing costs at, uh, at the medical offices. Um, and that was budgeted in there. So every year we budget 20,000 as far back as I can recall. And typically that amount actually, uh, so what, what happens is once a year we get an invoice from hospital because they uh, handle all of the, uh, the costs and making the disbursements for the cost. Uh, then we get an invoice from them usually in January. and the whole reason that we have a reserve is because they haven't been spending the 20,000. Okay, so what was happening in prior years was it would come in about $15,000. We budgeted 25 grand that wasn't spent, would end up going in to build up the reserve to cover off years when um, they did spend over 20,000. Okay, then it got to the point where the reserve got so large, I think it got up to 50 grand. We said, okay, um, let's stop moving unspent funds into the reserve, let's start funding the expected expenditure in the next year from that reserve. Let's start using that reserve because it's not being used, okay? Not sure if that answers your question or I went into a little more detail than you needed, but essentially we haven't got the invoice for 2021 yet, nor will we until January. Thank you. Okay, thanks, counselors. It is now 12.19. Um, so we're going to break for lunch, um, and we'll get back at it at uh, 1 o'clock. Um, and I think this is a, a good time to start. And um, I think the next item is moves into the staffing strategy. Am I correct, Mark? And Dan, yeah. Okay. Perfect. We'll have a good lunch, and we'll see everyone at 1.
Okay, folks, it's 102. Hopefully everybody had a good lunch. Um, we'll get started here. Um, and I'll turn it back over to uh, Mark to continue with where he left off. All right, thank you, Mayor Linton. Um, so the next piece we're going to go over was the staffing strategy, which uh, Rashid was going to take us through, and this for 2023 and 2024, which staffing strategy is in the budget book beginning on page 35. So Rashid. Okay, starting on page 35, uh, over to you Rashid. Well, thank you very much uh, through you, uh, Mayor Linton. So uh, these are the forecasted vacancies and positions which each department and division has uh, <clears throat> forwarded to the, the SMT meeting. So. We go over um, every year to request all the possible positions and changes to positions uh, for for uh, each department and division. And uh, I know the CAO has previously provided a detailed report on uh, how this process works. So I would just uh, uh, point to these 2023 uh, and uh, 2024 and beyond positions. So. Once again, uh, for now, this is the ask. It's been shared with council to, um, as a forecast, uh, 2022 were actually already presented to you. So any questions on these positions or uh, um, I'm happy to take those at this stage. So um, every position has its descriptor there and the need and how the need's been established. So we put them onto forecast report to see if, if things change in the year off, then definitely depending on the agenda of the council and the priorities and the needs of the department, if they change, uh, these positions do get adjusted accordingly. So I'll just uh, stop there. So if you have any questions. Okay, so just for council, just to uh, let council know we're on the main uh, sheet that has everything on one page is page 43 in our package. Um, so that's what uh, Rashid was speaking to. Dan, you wanted to add uh, a comment? Uh, thank you, Mayor Linton. I'm just going to bring that that one page screen up on the screen for everybody to see so that we know um, which positions we're talking about here. Perfect. And then I'll open it up to questions uh, from Council. Councillor McQueen. Sorry, my screen just got messed up there. Um, I uh, don't have any specific questions. It, I, I guess my only comment is um, that's a lot of permanent employees in a very short time. And I, I think until we, um, until we get to the 2023 and 2024, it's hard to ask specific questions though, so. That's it for me for now. Yeah, fair comment, Councillor McLean. Councillor Kittress? Um, as you know, I put forward a motion earlier in this year and um, when it was uh, presented, um, it did not provide a business case for the positions that we were going to do this year or for any other ones in the future. And um, I still think that that uh, um, needs to be done. Uh, I think a comprehensive review of, for the business case for you need to have a comprehensive review of the positions that you already have and do an analysis. And um, I don't see anything like that here. So I, I sort of just, uh, it's just the same thing as uh, we've always done. Um, and I don't think that that's acceptable. Councilor Van Leeuwen. Um, I would uh, reiterate uh, Councilor McElwain's comments. It's hard to comment on, you know, years out, but um, I see a lot of like temporary part-time moving into full times. I just, I do caution us not to, uh, I like the planning, but also to not get too far ahead of ourselves in, in approving these years out. Councillor Dunsmore? 
Yeah, I'm fine with this. I, I can uh, see the work that's gone into it, and I'm okay with it. Councillor Foster. Well, I, earlier today, I I asked the question about um, the need for uh, someone to help with downtown infrastructure when we have uh, 17 operators already. So earlier, I mentioned. Um, cemetery maintenance. Uh, back in 2019 and 2020, you know, we, we tabled for this term of council uh, the same document three years ago. I believe it had 36 positions total on it, including those ones we see on the document just shared for 2022. Those are kind of the last six for this um, three-year plan. So we, we've done a lot of hiring and we hire each year, and I don't believe it's coincident with need, as Councillor Kittress pointed out. I don't see a business case for each of these. Uh, there's a pattern here of hiring people temporary and using it as a justification to do it. And then each year we turn those temps into full time. That's a troubling pattern to me. As I pointed out earlier, um, We've had, uh, since I've been involved with this council, we've had about a 20% growth in, in population and our budgets have basically doubled from 35 to 66 million. Part of that and the biggest portion of that is wages. And I've asked for total annual payroll each year. And that, uh, is a pretty straightforward ask. And I'd like to make sure that's in the parking lot there. Um, you mentioned uh, giving uh, direction to obtain that info. It really is a straightforward matter to get your total annual payroll from your, from your report, from your payroll service provider. I think you would find a, a rapid growth in total salaries each year. And I think that's why I can sense the resistance to even provide that information. And back in 2015, Mayor, you went to the people and asked for a 2% surtax, a 2% levy, because we didn't have enough revenue to fix our bridges. And I think you'd find effectively there's revenue and there's expenses. And you've been, we've increased the revenue with a bridge levy. We've misstated or otherwise, in my view, misrepresented the true rate of, of taxation on that levy. And it'll come to no surprise to to you folks, as I've talked about this quite a bit, quite often, we didn't come clean to the people with uh, a clear statement of the true rate of taxation. In the years previous to 2015, there was no bridge levy. And I think you'd find a pattern between growing wages and the amount of the levy each year, which is now a 10% levy for a million five on taxation of over 15 million. And um, so I'm not in favor of these uh, six positions. I hear about um, a downtown maintenance person when we've got to 17 already. I hear about a digital media associate and all these positions right here. Um, I haven't seen the business case for hiring them. They've just been expressed as a want. And um, yeah, as I said often, we've got to control our operating costs, and if we don't, we will never have enough money for infrastructure renewal. So I'm not in favor of these six positions. That'll come to no surprise to anyone today. So I think we need to do better with controlling our staffing costs. That's our main cost driver, salaries. And I really would like to see a report on our total annual payroll and see just how it's grown over the last 10 years. So just, the, there's no real question there. So just to provide a little bit of clarification. Um, yes, I did get that item. It is in the parking lot. We will talk about um, that question that you had earlier um, and the level of effort required on staff to bring that to, bring that to uh, council. So yes, that's, that's an easy one. As far as uh, staff having resistance to show numbers, uh, staff's job is to provide information to council and our staff do a great job in providing information to council uh, as requested. So um, there's no such thing as staff resistance to provide uh, numbers. 
um, they will let us know how, if, if council wants uh, staff to move ahead and provide some numbers, um, uh, council will have to make that determination and staff will let us know how long that's gonna take and we'll identify if it's worth it or not. That's council's job. Councillor McCray. Uh, thank you, Mayor Linton, through you. Um, I recognize that we're becoming a small city in 20 years. So I am I'm challenged with this ongoing small town feel because we need to be realistic that we're growing and we're gonna be the size of Guelph um, in the 60s in 20 years. So we need to strategize our future staffing needs. So it's great to see that staff are looking forward and starting to identify what type of staff positions they need to fill for each year. And that's an important exercise that needs to be done. So I applaud staff for doing this. One question I do have in terms of maintaining service levels and thinking of um, future growth, I'm looking at the planning department and just questioning, do we have sufficient staff if, for example, we are considering and decide to proceed with a CPPS or a DPPPS system? Will we have the staff we need to be able to do that, given we're also going to be reviewing the various um, heritage studies that will be coming in as they're getting done? So I, I guess I just put that out as a question. Do we have sufficient staff in the planning department to address all of this growth that's coming at us? Brett. Well, I think, I think we've uh, alluded to when Mark got to my budget page, there's a position there that hasn't been hired to review development applications. Um, there's another position policy planner you see in beyond 2024. So I think that's key to move those heritage studies forward and the community planning permit system once we get council buy-in. Um, the one thing that, that we, we do with planning applications in times when we get um, busy like we are right now, uh, we use planning consultants to review applications on our behalf uh, and they get AR rebuild back to the applicant. So there's no uh, no taxpayer cost, but that's what we do in times when we're busy. Um, and certainly that's that's sort of where we've been lately. Some of our applications were, we're using a third party to review them. Okay, thanks. Go ahead, Mark. All right, next on the agenda, I think Dan was going to speak to the three-year operating forecast. Yes, uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, through Mayor Linton, I'm just going to try to find this in our budget book and then you can have reference to it as we're speaking to it. So the three-year operating um, write-up starts on page 111 in the budget book. Um, on page 111, you can see some of the assumptions made within the, the three-year forecast. Um, and, and again, this is this is provided for, for council's information. So in, in a lot of cases, we're trying to be conservative in these estimates and they'll be refined further as we move into 2023 and 2024's budget process. Uh, but we're looking at, um, we estimated operating inflation between two and 3%. Um, obviously we're expecting inflation to come down, um, hopefully during 2022 into 2023. Uh, capital inflation between four and six percent. Um, again, we're we're seeing significant capital inflation right now, and we expect uh, that to to alleviate sometime, hopefully in late 2022, early 2023. Uh, we've incorporated the staffing strategy that was just recently discussed in in the three year forecast, um, including any wage related assumptions um, and COLA adjustments. Um, assessment growth has been assessed at 2% per year for 23 and 24, and we, we discussed that uh, through a question from Councillor Kitras earlier in the, in the meeting. Uh, that is conservative, um, but again, we, we, can't, we can't predict assessment growth um, at this point and, and how much assessment growth is going to make it through MPAC's uh, system. Um, so it's, it's a conservative estimate at this point in time. Uh, we've, we've assumed 10% um, increase annually on insurance premiums. Um, as mentioned, um, as part of pre-budget, we did experience approximately 12% increase in, in insurance premiums for 2022. 
Um, and uh, we've seen fairly significant increases in insurance annually um, for the last number of years. So we're assuming 10% going forward. And we're trying to show a ramp up in WSIB contributions and part of the three-year forecast as well. Um, as part of the reserve, reserve fund policy discussion as part of pre-budget, and, and Mark even alluded to this this morning, uh, we are self-insuring some of the WSIP-related costs now going forward, and, and best practice would show that we increase our contributions to the reserves to, to mitigate risk. On the bottom of page 111, you can see the, um, the change in, in departmental um, net budget uh, from year to year. It doesn't change too much, um, maybe a percent here or there um, throughout the forecast period. And then at the top of page 112, you can see the overall impact on the, um, the taxation levies um, from, from year to year. And again, this is just provided for information purposes and will be subject to full budget processes in 2023 and uh, 2024. From there, you can see the various departmental net budget um, changes from year to year. Um, and it's in the pretty much the same format you saw in, in, in the operating budget we went through this morning. Um, and the last page um, that actually Mark brought up as part of the presentation itself is on page 128 of the budget book that shows an overall summary of, of the three-year operating forecast based on all of the assumptions that I just mentioned. Um, so it shows the 2.18% uh, blended increase for 2022. For 2023, it's showing a 2.51% increase, and for 2024, a 3.05% increase. Um, a lot can change when we move into those budget processes. Uh, one thing that's missing at this point in time is um, through the asset management planning process, whether we'll be seeing a, a proposed increase in capital investment during, during 2023 and 2024. And, and the resulting impacts on the budget due to that. So, so that's something we would have to investigate further after we get our asset management plan approved by council. Uh, that concludes my high level summary on the three year operating and be happy to uh, answer any questions. Thanks, Dan. Uh, questions from council? Uh, Councillor McCray? I have no questions, thank you. Councillor Foster. No pass, thanks. Councillor Dunsmore. No questions. Councillor Van Leeuwen. Um, no questions, but Dan, I have to say it's it's actually quite a, an impressive document based on percentages, departments, um, strategies. It's it's. Um, I make budgets for my own company year over year with staffing and projections and that, and to take every single department percentages, scrolling through, it's, it's quite impressive. So thank you. Councillor Kittress. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I have only one question. Um, it's regarding the bylaw enforcement um, it looks like there will be a hire for that. And I'm just wondering, um, what is the rationale for that hire? Um, and um, in 2024, and that's on page 115. And I'm just wondering, is that for parking? Is that for, well, what's the reason for that? And I'm just wondering also, uh, and, I'll ask a question after that. I have another question. I'm just wondering when when we were looking at the bylaw officer, I see that we've only raised like five thousand dollars. It was over our ex expectations. But I'm wondering, uh, is there plans, you know, as you hire more people for this, um, of of having more fees or fines and stuff like that? I don't know who's going to answer that one. Who's best to answer that question? First on the type of position and secondly on that second part as far as revenue goes. Dan? Thank you, Marilyn. And I can start and then Carrie can uh, fill in the blanks. Um, so so a, a, another municipal enforcement officer is identified in the staffing strategy um, as a requirement. And I, I believe the 
justification is around the, the level of activity from an enforcement perspective uh, with our current uh, municipal law enforcement officer. Um, you are correct that a, a decision has to be made at some point what our, our long-term goals and objectives are for parking enforcement. And this could be part of the roles and responsibilities of bylaw enforcement going forward as well. Um, from a, a revenue perspective, maybe I'll pass that one on to, to Carrie to, to answer. Carrie. Yes, thank you. Uh, through you, Mayor Linton, um, uh, we, um, given council's position on a voluntary compliance is our, our number one goal and laying fines and court proceedings are our um, last resort, unless that, uh, that position by council changes, we, uh, we, we don't expect to raise any more revenue than, than what we estimate, um, given that, that council's position is voluntary compliance, and that, is, uh, that means less, less fines. But if when we get into the parking side of it and the money rate and revenue right now, as we've talked about before at this council, goes to the county, and um, township council has made that clear, and I've made that clear that that isn't what we, that isn't a position that we can keep going forward with. The township needs to needs to receive revenue um, for this activity, and I think and the county is aware of that. And the count, county's budgeting that went on um, the the draft budget that went on a couple of weeks ago uh, that was clarified at the county level that they do anticipate some revenues going to the township. That's a, that's a discussion that will have to happen, but it it obviously has to happen. We have to receive uh, money back from the, for parking enforcement in our downtown. Councilor Kittress. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, since you were privy to that budget and the process, I was wondering what uh, kind of numbers were they uh, talking about in their budget that we could possibly receive. If that were to if it were to be transferred to us, we didn't talk about numbers. That's obviously the next step that has to happen. Okay. Councilor Van, Councilor Van Loon? No, I have nothing here. Did I switch the order here? Am I go? Did I? Okay, <laughs> sorry about that, <laughs> Councilor McElwain. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I do have a question. I was, I'm not sure whether uh, we want to talk about it now or when we talk about the bridges and later. Um, I noticed this year um, there has been a line item added to the dedicated capital levy of the assessment growth. And um, it's included in this uh, three year operating forecast. Um, we talked about assessment growth a couple of years ago, and I thought there was an agreement that assessment growth would not be added to the capital levy. Uh, the capital levy was supposed to be 2.8 million. It is 2.8 million and adding the assessment growth every year, it gets it up to, you know, three point something million, three and a half million by the end of the 10 years kind of thing. Um, I, uh, that wasn't what council agreed to when the um, levy was put in, it was agreed to a $2 million max annual. And uh, so now we're going beyond that and uh, it has never been approved by uh, council. Yeah, I think um, I need to answer that one because that was a council decision. and. I remember back to when we put in place uh, the 2% uh, bridge rebuilding capital levy back in 2015, there was a 2.8 target that we were going, going to try to achieve uh, throughout this point. But what council did move forward on is approving a 2% increase uh, uh, per year. Um, and then for that to be uh, reduced in 2020 um, and eliminated in the last year, which is this year here. So we moved ahead on that schedule. I know that there was some discussion about a 2.8% um, uh, target. Um, I, I don't think there's anything that we have as far as a resolution that says that 
uh, 2.8 was um, a limit. Um, it was the target. And obviously, uh, a dollar back in 2015 is not the same as a dollar in, in 2020 with inflation and that kind of thing. So um, I think that we've abided by um, the principles and the intent behind that 2% compounding capital every every year um, and that's where we're at right now i don't know if, if there's anything that you want to add to that dan uh thank you mary linton uh yeah just just to follow up on conversations we've had in the past um i i completely agree with you that capital inflation makes our bridges more and more expensive every single year um to so to to set an upset limit for, for capital investment in, in bridges and culverts doesn't work from a best practices asset management perspective. Um, those, those, those bridges worth millions and millions of dollars will continue to increase in cost year by year. Therefore, funding should increase year by year as well. And the, the easiest way to at least partially offset those cost increases is to add assessment growth to to, to those amounts in the dedicated capital levy. So you're just taking additional capital levy funds from, from new residents, for example, and adding it to adding it to the, the levy, um, which, which still represents a 0% increase for existing residential taxpayers and commercial taxpayers. Um, other than that, I, I think we'll find in, in when we bring the asset management plan forward um, in early 2022, um, it'll show that additional funding is required for, for bridges and culverts above and beyond what we have now. So this is just a, a small step we can, we can make in the right direction to make sure that we're increasing that funding envelope. Councillor McLean, follow through. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I don't doubt that there is, that the costs have gone up where I have a real problem here is that this extra allocation was put into the budget without bringing it to council first. And we had, we had agreed to one thing and now all of a sudden is slipping in another expense that or another line item that we had not agreed to. And so I think it's important that these decisions get made with council, not just staff. Dan? Thank you, Mayor Linton. Um, the the um, strategy of adding assessment growth to the dedicated capital levy was actually addressed in our presentation at the, I believe it was the September pre-budget meeting. Um, so if you look at um, the discussion we had in the September pre-budget meeting when we talked about the 10-year bridge plan, um, it was addressed in the presentation as well as the documentation in that pre-budget meeting. Councillor Kittress. I think I've asked my questions. Oh boy, sorry about that guys. I'm losing my mind here. Okay, go ahead, Mark. All right, thank you, Mayor Linton. Uh, next we'll move on to the water and wastewater operating budget. So those are on page, they begin on page 130 is the the text, um, the actual budget pages begin on page 134. So Dan, if you can share your screen on, on page 134. And I'll just give you, as I did with the tax board operating budget, I'll give you a quick synopsis of uh, the environmental administration, waterworks, wastewater, and then the municipal risk management official uh, uh, pages that uh, make up the environmental budget. So. For administration, um, well, I, sh I should mention that for Waterworks, based on the uh, uh, rate study that was done uh, back in 2020, um, water rates, we built in an increase of 1.1%. And for wastewater rates, there's an increase of 3.2%. And those are right out of the recommendations from the rate study. Um, so for administration, environmental, so the environmental administration costs are accumulated and they're allocated 42% to the Waterworks division and 58% to the wastewater uh, services division. Um, some major changes to the administration cost center are 
uh, $16,700 increase in insurance premiums for environmental facilities, an 80,000, or sorry, an $83,900 increase in the allocation of administration costs from the tax supported operating budget. So that's the 20% of uh, administration costs and tax board that are transferred over to the uh, environmental budget. Excuse me. An $8,400 increase in the portion of the GRCA levy that's charged to the environmental services budget. So this is the other side. Uh, we talked about the special levy uh, for, uh, for the GRCA uh, earlier in the, in the morning. Uh, there's a $20,500 decrease in internet charges um, from uh, Center Wellington Communications. And uh, you'll notice there's a new line item there called meter maintenance. So, <clears throat> and that totals $48,000. In prior years, um, the costs associated with meter maintenance were booked directly to the reserve. Um, out of the, the uh, rate study was done in 2020, um, it was recommended that the meter maintenance reserve essentially get consolidated and rolled into the water and wastewater general capital reserve. So we did that. And as a result, we've now got this new line item in our operating budget called meter maintenance. Uh, next page, Dan. So waterworks, um, the increase in the budget is due to uh, $118,896 increase in the transfer to the waterworks general capital reserve. The $20,100 uh, $20, increase in the transfer to the vehicle and equipment replacement reserves. Uh, there's an $84,000 increase in debt payments, which are 100% funded from development charges. Uh, and, and this uh, debt is related to new charges for funding the Salem Bridge water main construction. Uh, Council will uh, recall that back in April 2021, um, a decision was made uh, to, instead of uh, funding the cost of that project from external debt, we decided to fund it uh, internally as a loan from reserves. Uh, there's also an $81,669 increase in the environmental administration cost charge to the waterworks budget. So that's the 40% or for, sorry, 42% of the uh, water of the administration costs for environmental charge to waterworks. And the rest of the changes are, are basically the result of reallocations of hourly labor costs between the various service lines in the waterworks budget. Um, and then overall, 65.3% of Waterworks debt payments are funded from development charges in 2022. So next page, Dan, should be wastewater. Uh, so the increase in wastewater budget is uh, the inclusion of a new wastewater operator position with a total cost of $82,300. And again, that was in the staffing strategy. An $84,520 increase in the transfer to the wastewater general capital reserve, a $19,900 increase in the transfer to the vehicle and equipment replacement reserves, and a $30,000 increase in biosolids management costs as due to growth. Um, historically, we've done three kind of haulages of, of uh, biosolids each year, and we need to do an extra haul now um, based on growth. Um, and there's a $10,000 increase in the chemical costs as well. Um, for repairs and maintenance at the two wastewater treatment plants, there's a $20,000 increase in contracted services. And um, environmental administration costs, so the 58% the of the administration costs that are charged to wastewater, that's an increase of $112,000. $781. And then overall, with the debt payments related to wastewater, 100% of those debt payments are actually funded from development charges in 2022. And then the last page, Dan, should be the municipal risk management official. So minimal changes here. Um, this is uh, this division is funded 100% uh, by the county. So just open it for questions on, uh, on the environmental budget. Thanks, Mark. Uh, questions from Council. Uh, Councilor McRae. I have no questions, thank you. Councilor Foster. I'll pass, thanks. Councilor Dunsmore. No questions. Councilor Van Leeuwen. Thanks. Um, 
Dan, Dan or anyone who can answer this, uh, one question for the environmental side is, is because it is a um, supported mostly by a user pay system. Do we have any way of tracking complaints to the costs of, of uh, environmental? Like, I have to say, it's not something that I receive phone calls on as a counselor or the cost of water, wastewater, but I'm just curious, do we, do we hear anything or do we get a feedback? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Marilyn. And that might be a good question for either Colin or Dino, um, as they would probably hear any complaints that may come in. Yeah, Colin. Yeah, I, I would just add uh, uh, through through Mary Linton to to Councillor Van Leeuwen. It's uh, it's it's a uh, you know our rates are 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 very uh, I guess set through through regulation, right? So it's uh, you know there's the sustainable water and and sewer uh, regulation that requires municipalities you know to do full cost recovery uh, for you know operations and and uh, maintenance replacement. Of the uh, the water and wastewater systems, so um, yeah, just uh, typically um, we don't get a lot of complaints about rates. Uh, where we do get complaints, and I'm sure some of the councillors around the table have received some of these, is when a high bill uh, due to water high water use comes in, you know, or there's maybe a toilet running while well, that's undetected for a number of weeks, or uh, you know, some sort of leak to the internal plumbing that's that's running through the meter, and there's a bit of a high bill. Um, so we were, we're quite proactive in, in dealing with those. Like as soon as we uh, do the download for our meter data um, at the at the beginning of the month, we uh, uh, we're, we're in immediate contact with any unusual reads uh, from from water meters. So we're quite proactive in terms of notifying the public. Um, the uh, advanced meter uh, infrastructure as well is is a or smart meter technology is is the route that. Uh, uh, most municipalities are, are are looking at or going with, and, and we're we're no different. Um, it's it's going to allow us to uh, or allow the resident to actually get real time feedback on their water use, uh, not just through their bill. So that's another kind of positive um, communication tool that we'll have with uh, residents, just to uh, inform them on their water use, help help them to use water uh, efficiently, and uh, and kind of you know uh, keep the keep their bills low. Kittress. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, this one is for Colin. It's on page 136. Um, we're hiring a new employee. I remember last year when we were having discussions about the wastewater, um, we were training a person for uh, the level. And um, are we going to be having two people uh, that are qualified to run the sewage treatment or are we just hiring because um, somebody's left or something like that? I just kind of want to know what that hire is about or whether we will, because we weren't fulfilling the requirement and we were, we were had a, a consultant helping us do that. So I'm just wondering, can you explain that? So the public and for myself, actually. Absolutely, yeah. No, no. Thank you for the question, uh, Councillor Kittress, and through Mayor Linton, and uh, I might get uh, uh, Dino to provide the most recent uh, update as well. Uh, so, so yeah. So as as we discussed last year during during budgets, uh, we were relying on uh, uh, a contractor uh, to provide our overall responsible operator um, designation for the operation kind of oversight of the wastewater treatment plants. And this was allow, uh, allow us time to um, kind of develop and, um, and, and obtain licenses for uh, one of our existing staff members. And so uh, who, was, who was still able to be, take on that role of overall respons responsible operator, uh, but only for about half of the year. And so we had to have um, someone else uh, responsible for that for the other half of the year. And so, uh, so great news, uh, our, our current operator um, has taken his tests and uh, I understand he has, has passed them. So uh, we're just waiting to get uh, licenses back from the ministry. So I don't know, Dino, if you have uh, kind of an update on that and, and any timing associated with that. Yeah, uh, thank you, Colin, and through you, Mary Linton. Um, we have, uh, it was recently written, there was 
Um, some delays uh, due to training being um, uh, put on hold because of COVID and whatnot. Um, but that training's been obtained. Uh, the test has been written. He's passed. So um, we're moving towards getting him certified. I'm assuming it should take about three weeks through the ministry to obtain that certification. So um, fairly confident by the end of the year that'll be achieved. And uh, and just to step back, um, the reason he was able to act in, a, in an uh, overall responsible operator for half the year is it's a regulatory thing. Uh, he was available for the full year. <laughs> he was here, um, but they're only allowed to act for 160 days, um, and that's built into the regulation. So um, in, in addition to that, <clears throat> we have another uh, operator who's written his next level, so we have a backup for our um, employee ORO as well. So we'll, we're fulfilling both roles within the same month or so. Thanks, Dino. Thanks, Colin, for that. Councillor McElwain? I'll pass. Okay, on to you, Mark. All right, the next item we were going to speak to, I believe is actually the last page in the agenda package, which is the changes to the 10 year capital forecast. So I don't know, Dan, if you can share that. Based on the print on I got, I think it's, it, it is the last page in the agenda package. Okay, so what you're looking at here are all the changes that have been made since the pre-budget meeting on October 4th. So right at the top there, I don't know if Dan's able to move his cursor there as well with it. Um, yeah, so that line there is the bottom line from the 10-year uh, uh, forecast that was presented on October 4th. And you can see we've got uh, 14 items that have been added. Two of them should be definitely have, have been expected and that's items seven and eight, which are the vehicle and equipment replacement uh, amounts. Those schedules were completed after October 4th and been consolidated into the budget. And uh, you'll find in your budget book as well, um, a series of schedules to report, uh, 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 support those numbers. And at the bottom, we've got an adjusted balance. And we compared that adjusted balance to the, yep, to the numbers that are in the 10-year capital forecast in the draft budget. And you'll see there's no difference. So all the items that have, uh, have been added since October 4th are listed there. And we've also included a column there for funding source for the new projects uh, that have been added. And at the far right, there's also some... Uh, some brief comments as to uh, why the project has been added. I'll just open it up for questions at that point. Great, thanks for that, Mark. Um, questions from Council, Councillor McElwain. Thanks, Mayor. The um, one that jumps out at me is the uh, termite management program. Um, we had, uh, budgeted, I thought, sixty thousand dollars per year, and it seems to have gone down to forty thousand dollars a year, and it should be going up instead of down. I mean, we are that that's well, it's going in the wrong direction. I'm just wondering why it went down. Uh, we have been trying to uh, increase that budget and get a uh, larger emphasis on termite management. And just as a little bit of background, I discovered just this week that um, a couple of things, I guess. First off, we have been, we, the township, have been putting down mulch that is not bark mulch. It is not the termite resistant bark mulch that the township has said that they're going to be putting down on a regular basis. And that is very disappointing. And they're doing it on Water Street, which is one of the most biggest termite infested areas in the township right now. Um, we also uh, have told the folks on South River Road that they're far enough away from the termite problem that they don't have to worry about it with their fence wooden fence posts and stuff like that. We're not paying attention to termite management at, at all. And if the township isn't paying attention, then we can't expect the, the residents to pay attention. And so cutting that Cutting that budget to me is just, um, you know, being 
hiding her head in the sand, very honestly. Yeah, so there's three questions there. Um, let's deal with the, the budget one first. Dan? Yeah, thank you, Mayor Linton. Uh, this isn't an increase, this is not a decrease to the budget, this is an increase to the budget. So this is this is funding in addition to what's already in the 10 year capital forecast, which was $60,000 a year. So this is suggesting um, an $80,000 top up to that in 2022 and a $40,000 per year top up to that in 23, 24 and 25. So that would that would give, uh, I believe it adds up to $500,000 total for termite management between now and 2025. Um, yeah, so so yeah, just a point of clarification, we're not reducing, we're increasing the budget. That's good news, thank you, Dan. Um, I misunderstood your uh, your foil, your slide. Um, it's still not still not going to be enough over that length of time, but thank you. So the so the other two questions, um, the one related to the mulch, um, I'd like an answer for that, please, and then also the direction to uh, new homes with the fence posts. If somebody could talk to those two things, that'd be great. I don't know who the right person is. I don't know who who what department um, was laying down mulch. Um, but I wouldn't mind an uh, answer for that one if there is one here. Otherwise, we have to research that one a bit. Yeah. Colin? Uh, yeah, thanks, Mayor Linton. So, so I believe uh, uh, Councillor McElwain's referring to uh, the South River Road uh, reconstruction, extension of services, water sanitary, storm uh, to the Haylock subdivision. And uh, uh, yeah, the developer. Um, had their contractor uh, install a, a new fence, a wooden fence, and uh, some uh, some landscaping along South River Road, and I believe there there was some uh, uh, some mulch applied um, in those gar those new gardens. Um, so I, my understanding is they are outside the termite zone, so we are um, not subject to uh, kind of the restrictions that would be in uh, you know subject to within the termite zone, but. Uh, you know, perhaps that's uh, that's something that we can can verify and uh, just even respond back to uh, to Councillor McElwain. Councillor McElwain, follow on. Yes, um, you're you're partially right, Colin. But there is also uh, some trees on South River Road, or on uh, Water Street, around 110 Water Street. Uh, I guess in the township uh, right away there that have non bark mulch and. Okay applied to them this year as well as in Bissell Park. Perfect. All right. Thank, thank you, Councillor McElwain, for that clarification. Uh, so that's, that's something we can certainly follow up with, uh, with uh, our urban forester, uh, Matthew Allen, and just uh, uh, get some, some clarification on, on what's being used there. And uh, um, yeah, if there's a, a change that needs to be made, uh, we'll, we'll definitely ensure that gets uh, completed. Councillor Kittress? Um, are we doing 142? Is that the page we're at? I just want to make sure I'm at the right page. Yeah, Marker, Dan, can you verify we're at 142? Basically, what we're doing is we're going through attachment D that was in the um, draft budget report that is in the, uh, the budget um, agenda. Yeah, so that chart that we had up there, what page was that? It, uh, it's like page 366 of 366 in the, the agenda, I think. No, 363 of 366. Okay. So, Dan, I think you probably just need to share your screen again. Probably the easiest thing to do. Did you have a question on that page, Councillor Kitchens? No. Councillor Van Leeuwen? No, 
Sorry, I don't have a question on this, but you said 366. I've been looking for that document when you took it down. I, my pages don't go that high on the actual PDF. I'm not sure where, where you got that one from. Just so I can review it again later. I, I, it's just stamped on the bottom line, page 363 or 366. So it would have been the agenda at some point in time when it all came out. I'm not sure which which day it was, but uh, I don't know if anybody else can confirm that. My budget my budget draft only says page 251 is the last page. Oh, you're, you're going from the budget book. This, this actually refers to the PDF for the whole agenda package. Sorry. You will uh, find this sheet in the budget book. Okay, thanks. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, this is the first page that hasn't been right. Like every page, whether you're looking at it in the PDF or in paper, they have the numbers right. This is the only one that the number hasn't been hasn't been right. Councilor Dunsworth. Yeah, thank you. Uh, through you, Kelly. Um, I want to go back to the termite management program uh, with the. Um, the amount of funds that are in there. You say we're increasing the program. Who's working on the plan? Do we have a, can you give me a rough idea, somebody of, of what the plan is moving forward for the termites? Are we accepting responsibility for the township property within the termite zones? And what are we anticipating the, the homeowners to pay? Can you give me an idea of what we're doing? Yeah, Brett, if you could update us on that. Um, council provided some direction. So if you, uh, with termite management just a couple months ago, can you let us know where we're at with that? Yeah, thanks. Um, well, the last time council discussed termites, we had the presentation uh, from Paul Balfour of Balson, uh, and that was in October. And since that time, we've done, um, we've gone back and looked at additional funding. So this um, allocation of funding, the way we propose to add the funding will give us $200,000, I believe, in total for two 2022, because we had 60,000 um, in 2021 budget that's been un, uh, not spent. So I think the top ups were to give us a $200,000 starting point in, in 2022. Uh, we've consulted with the city of Kitchener. They had a neighborhood with termites and did a termite program. So we thought that it would be beneficial for us to consult with them. We learned some, uh, some good information from city of Kitchener building staff that uh, about treatment with nematodes being very effective and, uh, and also cost effective. And so we've gone back and looked at what Dr. Miles had left us in terms of uh, a termite management program and uh, tried to, our thoughts are that we would incorporate a, as much of those things as we can. So a big priority would be an education program uh, for residents, uh, and also I think ourselves for our own property. Um, again, dealing with, uh, wood chip mulch, stacking firewood off the ground and putting it on patio stones instead, um, tips about transferring plant material, looking at, at removal of stumps, um, organizing the yardwood cleanup weekends with the bins provided so people can dispose of yardwood. Uh, making people aware of what the county has now provided in terms of uh, their willingness to accept termite material. Um, and then the program itself that we would engage a party, we anticipate an, an RFP would need to go out to provide these services, but we expect um, there'd be yard inspection for stumps and infested trees that get removed. Uh, borate treatment uh, and treatment of outdoor things like woodsheds and garages, installing borate rods and fence posts and wooden retaining walls, um, laying out some uh, monitoring traps so we can monitor on an ongoing basis. Uh, and then also part of Dr. Miles' uh, program that we could continue. And again, we had good feedback from the city of Kitchener on how effective it is. It would be uh, nematode treatments. We're also looking at um, that we would update our termite control bylaw. Now that we have termite areas mapped, one of the things that the city of Kitchener told us is that, um, you know, if you live in a termite area and you treat your property, it's very annoying to have your neighbor not treat theirs. 
So uh, termite control bylaw would be used to um, look at enforcement of people that aren't treating their properties when they're in the zone. And uh, again, if, if people use conventional termite treatments, uh, those would largely be in Dr. Miles' program, even at the owner's expense. And we are, but we are going to investigate a way to get a partial rebate or some sort of uh, financial relief from the township uh, to carry out those kind of treatments. And same with spring and fall nematode treatments. Uh, those are very cost effective, as we learned from Kitchener. They can be done uh, fairly easily. Um, people already do those kind of things just for uh, yard treatment to control grubs. So we think that uh, we could have a program where we help homeowner, homeowners with low costs. So the idea is with uh, an injection of $200,000 that we have available in 2022, we'll need to develop an RFP and have a vendor that would carry these services on for the next five years. And I don't disagree with Councillor McElwain that we may need to add more once we know what, what the RFP comes back. We might need to add other costs in subsequent years, but this gives us a, a good head start. Justin Foster. Councillor McRae. Thank you, Marilyn. I, I noticed Councillor McElwain had his hand up. I think he wanted to continue the question with termites, so I'll let him go first. No, that's okay. You can go and then I'll get back to Councillor McElwain. Uh, that's great news about um, the progress being made on the termites. So I look forward to seeing more about the termite management program. And um, thank you, Seth, for everything you're doing in that regard. Councillor McElwain. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to uh, check with Brett. The Both Dr. Miles and uh, Balson termite control and the gentleman I've been dealing or talking to a lot in, in Toronto, all basically recommend that the programs be managed on a block by block basis, not by individuals. Is that kind of what you're planning with your RFP then is, uh, is putting together a program that, that somebody will manage that? Yeah, that's right. I think um, if we looked at the details of what Dr. Miles had left, left us, um, his approach was to tackle sequentially the, the uh, properties that he identified. And on the mapping you saw, I think he called them sort of the red area. And that would be a methodical uh, sequential treatment. Uh, his focus was on the, um, the outdoor areas of the properties, obviously, primarily, and we would do it that way. Um, and then, but it, it seemed to us and we can get, get other advice from the vendor, but the, if people were treating um, with conventional termeticides and treating indoor areas, though they, those were, would be the kind of thing that the homeowner would be expected to, uh, to pick up the cost of that. But the township's program would move sequentially. So he had the red areas and the blue areas, and that was his idea of moving around sequentially through those areas, for sure. Okay, Mark. All right, next uh, on the agenda, Dan, I believe you're going to go through the long-term debt forecast. Yes, thank you, Mark. Um, through Mayor Linton, so we're back to the budget book um, and the, the long-term debt forecast Actually, the, the current year debt payments actually starts on page 248. So we're right at the, near the very back of the budget book. Um, page 248 outlines the um, existing debt principal balances and, and payments um, anticipated for 2022. Um, but what I wanted to focus in on was um, the information after that, which is projected debt. Um, I showed uh, a few slides as part of the presentation this morning um, that there's a stacked bar chart showing all of the, the uh, existing and, and projected debt payments um, for the next 10 years. 
as well as a, a debt capacity analysis showing that we're under half of our debt capacity limit projected over the 10 year period. Uh, but what I want to draw your attention to just a, a summary of where we anticipate using debt over the 10 year forecast is on uh, page 249. And I'm going to bring that up on screen here. So this is the um, anticipated use of debt over the 10 year period. And obviously this changes year to year as, as township priorities change, as the timing of capital projects change. Um, but we're, we're anticipating um, the use of debt, as I mentioned earlier, very strategic, uh, focusing on the long-term growth related needs of, of the township where we can use offsetting development charges to pay for um, principal and interest payments. Um, you'll see uh, we have some unissued debt currently. Um, the water supply strategy, phase two groundwater investigation study, uh, the Dixon Drive land servicing that I mentioned earlier in my presentation, and then a little bit of pre-approved funding for the um, operations facility. Um, so that debt would only be incurred as those those projects significantly progress. Um, and obviously we'd have to go through a very similar debt issuance process that we went through recently with, with the Gart Shore Street uh, property acquisition. Um, just to point out some of the significant capital projects that we are showing as, as debt funded. Um, starting at the top, we have uh, new wells, well areas three and five. Um, those are anticipated to like, well area three being completed within the 10 year forecast and well area five being started and, and almost complete by the end of the 10 year forecast. Uh, we have some water mains um, in 2024 uh, that are required to connect in the new well um, to, the, to the water system. Um, so again, 100% growth related to, to connect with that new well into the water system. Uh, so those are the three items uh, below the two new wells. Uh, below that is the Dixon Drive um, employment land servicing that has already been pre-approved as part of the 2020 budget. Uh, then we have the corporate operations facility that was approved by council and, and we'll have to go through uh, multiple phases of, of approval and, and design over the, the next few years. From there, we have the Fergus expansion, um, the Fergus wastewater treatment plant expansion at almost $30 million in total. Um, the timing of that will be um, um, determined. Um, I believe Colin is, is doing a uh, water wastewater servicing master plan in the near future. And that will look at the, um, try, to, try to be a little more accurate in, in, in when we need to do that expansion to the Fergus plant. Um, so for now, it, it's in the middle of the 10 year forecast and we can adjust that when the servicing master plan is complete. Uh, below that, we have some fire related growth items. We have the new fire hall, again, mid year um, in, in the 10 year forecast and associated uh, vehicles and equipment associated with, with the new fire hall. And then finally, the last item is uh, sitting in year 10 of the forecast, which is a provision to acquire additional parkland and green space. Um, so most of these items are predominantly growth related um, and, and there are significant items that are very hard to budget for from a cash flow perspective. So this is our approach to uh, using, using debt in a smart and effective way so that we're obviously well within our debt capacity limits and, and continuing on in doing the growth related needs of, of the township. Um, that's the end of my comments and I'd be happy to uh, address any questions. Thanks, Dan. Uh, questions from Council? Council McCray? Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. I really don't have any questions. I'm just, um, it's intriguing to see just how much it's costing to connect a new future well to our existing water system. Councillor Foster? Thanks, Mayor. Uh, Dan, what do you mean exactly by unissued debt in 2021, the first column of page 249? Um, through Mayor Linton, that is debt that um, through previous budget processes were approved by council. 
uh, but we have not um, issued, we have not incurred that debt because the projects have not progressed to the point where uh, we we need to incur that debt. So we we don't want to incur the debt until we absolutely have to. So from a cost savings um, and debt capacity perspective, um, so when when those projects um, reach the point where we need to um, debt fund those projects, then we'll, we would be coming forward to council with with the necessary bylaws. Councillor Dunsmore. <laughs> no, I just appreciate how detailed this uh, this report is, Dan, so we can see where we're at. And I, I'm looking at 251, page 251 with the graph, and um, I'm appreciative of your um, expertise and how much attention you pay to the, the debt that we're managing. So thank you. Councillor Van Leeuwen. Thanks. No further questions on this. Councillor Kittress. No questions. Councillor McAween. Thanks. Uh, I just uh, quite curious about the uh, water main extensions. Uh, and I'm not sure if it's Dan or Colin, but um, Wellington Road 7 to the urban boundary for Woolwich water main extension. And then we have the uh, other one to third line and what are we um, putting in uh, water and sewage out beyond the existing urban boundary? Is that basically what we're talking about there? And and the Wellington Road Seven to to urban boundary. Um, where what is that? Where is that exactly that we're talking about? Owen. Yep, uh, through Mayor Linton to uh, Councillor McElwain, thank you for the question. Uh, yeah, so the, these are our, our feeder main projects that will connect uh, a, a new well, a new water supply well to the existing distribution system. So these were uh, identified as part of the uh, water supply master plan. And um, yeah, essentially this is uh, construction values, um, design and, uh, and engineering and construction for these uh, new feeder mains. Um, so if you can picture um, like the Woolwich, uh, Woolwich Street, I think maybe should be added to that first descriptor for 2022-042. Uh, so that would be County Road 7 uh, to the urban boundary. And then we have uh, another piece where um, we've got the water main extension on 18, uh, urban boundary to, to third line. So that's extending to area three. And, uh, and then also a, uh, uh, a third line water main. So these are, are taking the uh, kind of those, if you recall the map uh, in the water supply master plan that had a kind of a, a large circle that identified areas three, uh, three, five, seven, and eight were kind of the top four areas, high pri or priority areas to uh, start the groundwater exploration program in. Uh, this is uh, the, the, the suite of water mains required to connect to, uh, to area three, if you will. Thank you. Great, thanks. Okay, Mark or Dan. Okay, um, I will take us back then to page 162 in the budget book, which uh, I'll give you a brief overview of the uh, vehicle and equipment replacement uh, schedules. So instead of going through these schedules one by one, I've, I've prepared kind of a summary of uh, the items um, the, the significant items that are due for replacement uh, in the next year. So page 162 is a summary of the very detailed summary pages um, for vehicle replacement. And page 175, I believe it is, is the summary of all of the detailed equipment replacement uh, pages. So I'll just go through department by department and then um, highlight what the um, uh, vehicles to be replaced are. So in public works, there's uh, two ton and a half trucks, two one and a half ton trucks, sorry, a sweeper, a rubber tire loader, and various attachments for some of these vehicles. In Parks and Rec, uh, we're scheduled for a new ice resurfacer and a tractor with a front end loader on it. In fire, there's one uh, pickup truck, one SUV, and one van due for replacement. 
In the building department, there's one SUV. And in environmental, so user pay, um, there's a pickup truck, a one and a half ton truck, a camera truck, and uh, the county funded uh, vehicle uh, is due for replacement. It's a small SUV. So those are all the vehicles. Uh, on the equipment side of things, so Dan, that's page 175 is the summary. Okay. Um, under IT, it's uh, main, main, mainly the annual uh, workstation replacement. So that's laptops and, and desktops and so forth. Um, and server and storage replacement. Public works, there's a gravel retriever, a hydraulic pump, and a sidewalk sander. In fire, it's various, suppress, uh, various suppression equipment. Uh, fire, there's a fire safety trailer that's shared with other lower tiers that's due for replacement. And there's also some personal protective equipment as well due for replacement. Community services, there's a number of items, but uh, the, the big ones are, uh, there's some, some flooring at the sports flex uh, due for replacement. Various pool, arena, and fitness equipment, uh, digital signage at Sportsplex, lighting at the theater, chiller at the ECC, pool boiler at the Sportsplex, uh, some windows and siding at Bellwood Hall, uh, some windows and exterior wall work at the tourism office at 10 uh, Mill Street, and lights and service replace, uh, surface replacement at the Tower Street Tennis Courts and a shelter at Confederation Park. And then in, for environmental, it's uh, mainly hydrant transmitters. So that's a full list of all the major items that are due for replacement that are listed. Um, I'll just open up for questions. Oh, and this covers essentially pages 162 to 203. Thanks, Mark. Um, questions from Council? Council McElwain? Um, this is kind of a general type of question. Have we, or has staff, looked at all into doing some um, environmentally friendly vehicles and replacement instead of uh, instead of uh, all of the gas powered uh, cars and trucks that we are now purchasing. Um, I, I think it's time that we had a plan for starting to do that. And I'm just uh, curious whether that is, if there's any plans for that kind of thing right now. Dan, Mark, I don't know if council's provided that kind of direction yet to staff. I know we have at the county level, we're going to be starting pickup trucks, electric pickup trucks in 24. Um, but I don't think we've provided direction to do that as council yet. It could be a parking lot item if you wanted to speak about that. Do you have any other comments on that, Dan, just to confirm what I said? Yeah, thank you, Mayor Linton. Um, I agree. We, we don't have direction on that to date, uh, but it's definitely something we could uh, start looking into and discussing amongst all of the departments. So it's it's something that I know is is uh, an emerging issue and something we can look into. Councilor Kittress. No questions. Councilor Van Leeuwen. No questions. Councilor Dunsmore. No questions. Councilor Foster. Thanks, Mayor. I guess I, I've often wondered why it's deemed necessary to have, I believe, a seven year replacement schedule for trucks. And uh, lots of people run their trucks longer than that. And I'm wondering is there any rationale for seven years? And, and why couldn't we go to perhaps 10 years or, or even longer when? Uh, the, you know, lots of uh, our citizens run their vehicles 10, 11, 12 years. And I realize there'd be some additional maintenance, but some of these are large numbers. We could get more service out of a truck if we went to 10 years life instead of seven. Dan? Go ahead, Dan. Colin? Go ahead, Dan. 
Thanks, Mayor Linton. Um, we do shift, um, while the general rule is seven years for, for pickup trucks, we do shift them based on actual usage from year to year. Um, so uh, we don't stick to seven years and replace it just because we can. We, we shift it based on actual usage. And as we focus more on asset management practices going forward, um, I see this shifting more to a, a rule based on um, kilometers and usage rather than uh, based on uh, a useful life of seven years or 10 years. Um, so I see this as being refined further as we move forward. But we, like I said, we do unofficially, we do <coughs> shift um, vehicles based on actual usage and condition. Councilor McCray. Uh, thank you, Marilyn. Um, this question, I'm not sure who it goes to, maybe to uh, Colin or Dino. The hydrant transmitters, are those related to tracking um, for system leakage in our water lines? Uh, yeah, uh, Dino, do you want to tackle that, uh, that question? Sure, thank you, Colin, and through you, Mayor. Um, they are. Uh, we have three of them in use in Alora, and um, they have proven to be quite useful through events or where we've had breakages. Um, they provide uh, advanced real-time notification of uh, pressure, temperature, and an acoustic. They shoot an acoustic um, transmission through the uh, water mains at two in the morning. <laughs> and so if there are um, inconsistencies between days, uh, we start to do an investigation and determine if there's leak or of course, if it's surfacing, we're, we're aware of it, but uh, that's what those are for, yes. Follow on, Councillor McCray. Yes, thank you. So in fact, these transmitters have actually helped you to significantly reduce some of our water usage due to leakage. Is that not true? Again, thank you for your question and through you, Mary. Yes, they, they have. Um, they help detect um, small service leaks uh, to the point of even running taps, um, if there are outdoor taps running for a long time. Um, the, the, they have had uh, some technolo technological issues. These actually have been on um, our equipment list for a few years now. We're waiting until the technology lands a little more soundly and we, they've become a little more reliable. We would like to place another three in Fergus and, and Mirror uh, in some high risk areas. Okay, Mark. All right, thank you, Mayor Linton. So next area we wanted to go over is starts on page 245, which are is the start of the reserve and reserve fund uh, schedules. So they run from page 245 to 247. Um, there's nothing in particular I wanted to point out here, but I, I can't stress enough that these are very important pages in this budget book. Uh, and as I mentioned in the uh, presentation this morning, the reserve and reserve funds are an important linkage between the operating and capital budgets. These are the funds that we use, uh, a significant portion of these funds are what we use to fund the capital budget each year. Um, they also provide some stability in the tax rate from year to year. An example, again, would be the election reserve, where we tuck money away each year for four years so that we have enough funding um, uh, available to offset that large one-time increase, uh, one-time cost um, every four years. Um, so pages 245 and 246 are all of our um, tax supported reserve and reserve funds. And page 247 has our user pay reserve uh, reserves and also the development charge reserve funds are all listed on page uh, 247 as well. So I'll just open up if anybody has any questions on those pages specifically. Councilor McCray. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, Mark, perhaps you could just explain a little bit more of what the Alora Meadows Groundwater Collection Reserve is all about. Is that related to their storm management pond? Or? Yeah, that question probably is better directed to Colin there. I see him smiling. <laughs> uh, uh. Thanks, Mark. Uh, through Mary Linton, I always love talking about groundwater. So, uh, uh, yeah, it's um, a feature that was was built uh, into the subdivision. So it's a, a separate uh, uh, groundwater collector. So a series of, of perforated pipes and uh, piping systems that essentially lowers the water table. 
and uh, keeps the uh, the basements in certain areas of that subdivision where uh, the water table was was quite high, uh, keeps their basements out, out of the water table. So, you know, folks, uh, sub pumps aren't running continuously. So, so there's a, a special charge kind of created for that, uh, the uh, life cycle replacement of that system. And Oh, hopefully a long, long time. I think we've got it on a, an 80 year life cycle or something like that. So yeah, that's what, what that's all about. Councillor Foster. I'll pass, thanks Mayor. Councillor Dunsmore. Yeah, thank you, through you Mayor. I've just, uh, and I know it's in here somewhere and I think I've, we've discussed it before, but I know there's people watching it. This money is a lot of money in reserves. What's our investment policy on this reserve? Where is it sitting? And are we gaining any, any interest on these reserves? Dan? Thank you, uh, through you, Mayor Linton. Um, we do have a fairly detailed reserve, reserve fund policy on, on the, the tracking and usage of these reserves. Um, anything labeled a reserve fund, um, which is, um, predominantly at the bottom of the tax supported area. And then um, the, the, the DCs are reserve funds. Those accrue interest and, and the interest is added to the reserve fund where with the straight reserves, interest is not added to the reserves. It, um, interest is part of uh, general operations. Um, as, as outlined in our reserve reserve fund policy, we're tracking towards target balances in a lot of areas. Um, Obviously, key areas um, such as WSIB, we have some funding to do to, to self-fund from a WSIB perspective. From an asset management planning perspective, obviously, we're, we're short when it comes to capital investment. Um, but most of the other areas, we're tracking towards target balances and we're in, we're in good shape. Obviously, there's restrictions to uses of, of various reserves and reserve funds, especially with the reserve funds and the obligated um, section of, of, of reserve funds. Um, but um, I think we're in very good shape from a, from a target balance perspective, other than those few items that I identified. Councillor Van Leeuwen? No real questions other than um, this is where we can really see that building code reserve fund for 2.9 million. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see where that that discussion goes when we start to review our long term needs for building. But it's it's definitely a good fund sitting there at this point. Thanks, Councillor Kittress. Thank you, Mayor. I don't have any questions, but I I did want to talk about that building reserve. I'm just wondering where that is supposed to be capped at. Um, um, and uh, I understand that you're going to be reviewing it, but doesn't wasn't it a cap of 2.5? Um, who's the right one, to, uh, Dan? Yeah, thank you, Mayor Linton. Um, um, I believe the cap was estimated at that amount, but that was back in might have been 2005 or 2006 when the original study was was completed and as i mentioned earlier a lot has changed from from 2005 to 2021 in terms of um, the building department itself and support services around the building department um, i think it's, it's it's not a matter of reaching the cap it's it's about redoing the study and and finding out what um, target balances we have and adjusting the building permit fees uh, accordingly. So that's something we're in the middle of doing right now. Councillor McQueen. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, just curious, the working capital reserve, do we ever use that? Is that just always been sitting there as a, as a backup in case we need it, but have we ever used it or curious. Dan? Thank you, Mayor Linton. Um, it's not really a reserve we we use. Um, by definition, the working capital reserve is there to ensure that we have cash flow. Um, we hit, for example, the, the time of year where our cash flow dips the most would be, I would say, in January, where we're just finished um, the entire year. 
and we have yet to start interim taxes for the following year. So most, if not all municipalities have a working capital reserve, which is to ensure that you have sufficient cash flow to get through those low cash flow areas. Okay. And, and have, do we ever get down that low, Dan? I, that's what I was kind of asking about. Uh, through Mayor Linton, um, not, not recently, no. Um, um, a few years, a number of years ago, um, when our, our reserve policies weren't as, as adequate, um, we would hit years where you, you hit a relatively low patch, where you would get close to a, um, a, a low balance, and we've never had to um, dip into our line of credit, uh, but we have a line of credit just, just in case it's, it's needed. But um, I would say in more recent years, um, given, for example, the, the healthy balances in, in some of our other reserves, we haven't had to uh, dip that low, but it's, it's still good practice to keep a working capital reserve um, just in case, um, depending on, you could have a year where you have significant capital improvement and significant spending uh, that may take away or deplete some of your reserves. Okay, Mark. All right, thank you, Mayor Linton. Uh, I think the next item we were going to discuss was municipal access agreement. So a revised annual fee structure, which is Colin. Okay, before we go there, let's take a bit of a break. Uh, it's two thirty. Let's take a, let's take a seven minute break, and then we'll get back to where we're at. We've been going for quite some time. I know it's a lot of fun, and we forget the timing, but we should take a break.
Okay, welcome back, Council. Uh, over to you, Mark. Right, thank you, Marilyn. So next item we were going to discuss is Municipal Access Agreement's uh, revised annual fee structure, and that is Colin. Yeah, great. Thanks, Mark. And uh, through Mayor Linton to 12 Council. So uh, the report uh, before you here this afternoon uh, is related to um, uh, an update to our fee structure for municipal access agreements. And um, yeah, if Council will recall, last December, um, we had some discussion during the budget process about uh, about revisions or potential revisions to the annual fee, the annual permit fee. And, uh, and so staff have, have taken some of that, uh, that discussion and, and feedback received uh, through uh, the budget process last year and, uh, and have prepared this report. Uh, it's authored by, by Adam Dickieson and uh, don't believe Adam's joining us, but uh, we also have uh, Adam Gilmore, our manager of engineering, um, joining us uh, as well to help answer any questions. So I'll just uh, quickly give an overview of um, uh, our proposal and uh, then open it up for questions. So, so essentially uh, the township uh, since 2008 uh, has had this uh, municipal access agreement process in place. And essentially these are agreements with uh, all telecommunications companies that uh, kind of own, operate, maintain uh, their plant uh, or infrastructure within the township's road allowances. And so, uh, so some of the companies uh, that, uh, that this would apply to are like uh, uh, Bell, uh, Rogers, Kojiko, uh, Whiteman. And then more recently, uh, we have uh, some uh, uh, more local providers, uh, NetFlash, um, ATEL, uh, North Frontenac is another provider that's maybe you'll, you've seen in the advertiser providing service a little bit further north of us. So our current fees um, in the 2021 uh, fees and charges, uh, we currently have an annual fee. Uh, it's applicable to all providers of $5,729.10. And so, uh, so this fee uh, essentially covers uh, township uh, annual costs associated with uh, our permitting process for telecom. So just uh, to provide an overview of the um, kind of some of the tasks associated with uh, coordinating utilities within the township's road allowances. Uh, quite often they are uh, moving plant or installing new, new facilities. Uh, so we're reviewing their plans, commenting and uh, reviewing, approving. Uh, once they're approved, uh, quite often there's uh, uh, field meetings to go and uh, establish running lines or look at kind of obstructions in the field that need to be dealt with. Uh, during construction, quite often there's there's issues that come up that uh, staff need to address, whether it's with uh, the construction itself or uh, concerns from uh, from residents. Kind of post construction, we're also inspecting the areas to make sure they've been uh, uh, properly reinstated or properly reinstored, like the sod or the sidewalk or curb, you know, hasn't been damaged as a result of some of the uh, the work that they've completed. And, um, and so there's, in some cases, not always, but uh, quite a bit of follow-up and, uh, and making sure that uh, things are, are restored to kind of township staff satisfaction and, and to the uh, community satisfaction as well. Uh, we also have a, a software system that's fairly new that uh, allows these utilities to submit their permit applications electronically. So now, um, instead of paper copies and, and, and moving paper uh, plans around and permit applications, they are submitted electronically and uh, reviewed electronically and the permit uh, is issued electronically. Uh, so, so part of the, uh, the discussion back in, in December um, of last year was, you know, you know have, have staff looked at um, the level of effort um, for rural and uh, installations in the rural and hamlet areas? Uh, are, is there um, less effort on staff's part uh, to, to kind of coordinate uh, that construction, the permit review? You know, is there less impacts um, in the rural area? And, um, and so we've looked at this in detail and, and you know, staff, staff do agree with some of the discussion that was, was occurring that yes, indeed, there, there are certainly uh, less uh, effort on behalf of staff to, uh, to coordinate uh, to oversee and inspect uh, the uh, telecoms within the uh, uh, within the road allowances in the rural areas and with with ham within hamlets. So as a result, uh, so staff are recommending that um, that a 
uh, uh, deduction be applied uh, for telecoms uh, working within the rural and hamlet areas. So a 50% uh, reduction on the annual fee, which would put the, uh, uh, the annual fee in 2022 rates at uh, $2,933.30. So that would be the uh, 2022 rate. So for uh, any uh, existing uh, telecoms working in the rural and hamlet areas, uh, future telecoms that come in and uh, want to install uh, their plant that uh, they would just be occupying or just working in the rural areas, uh, that would be the, uh, the annual fee uh, going forward. And uh, I just uh, want to add, we've we have done some comparative reviews of uh, of that uh, of our fees against uh, neighboring municipalities, and um, uh, honestly, the the fees are are, are quite. Uh, it's a broad range, uh, to be honest. Um, you know, from very nominal rates, like uh, you know, um, really no annual fee, <laughs> or or very nominal uh, reduced rate. Uh, to we've seen at the, kind of the higher end around six thousand uh, dollars per year for for telecom. So we feel that uh, um, that the uh, the proposed rate at fifty percent reduction um, or discount from the uh, kind of the urban telecom, uh, where there's certainly more issues, more staff time to coordinate, uh, certainly seems reasonable based on our review of uh, neighboring municipalities and their fee structure uh, for their municipal access agreements. So I think with that, uh, I think we'll uh, we'll open it up for questions. And uh, yeah, yeah, I think with that we'll open up for questions from council. Thanks, Colin, and thanks for being on on our meeting here, Adam. Now I know uh, Councillor Macklin, you brought this up, so I'll let you uh, speak to this item first. Uh, thanks, Mayor, and and thanks, um, Colin and and Adam, for uh, doing this uh, background work, and thanks for coming forward with a. Uh, a, a lower fee. Um, the only question I have, I mean, I'm happy with what you've done. The only question I have is that there's a, um, there's also a, an upfront fee and I can't remember what it was called exactly, but it, it was like a $10,000 one-time fee. Is that also being considered or is that going to remain as it was? Colin? Yeah. Uh, Adam, do you want to tackle that one? Yeah, thanks, Colin. And actually, we are joined by Adam Dickinson, and I'm going to bounce that one over to him, uh, being our resident expert uh, on uh, dealing with those uh, telecom companies. So Adam Dickinson, if you can hear me, uh, if you don't mind chiming in there. Good that, was a pretty, that was a pretty grand entrance there, Adam. What, what was it? I, that was that was pretty nice. It's like okay. you you like you walked into uh, a blinding light. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Mayor. And and uh, f with regard to the the question about the ten thousand um, uh, dollar initiation of uh, the agreement, these are that amount ha was established way back uh, in two thousand and eight when the first uh, agreement was struck, and in more current times that. Uh, that number is reflectant upon the number of um, end users that are um, going to be um, uh, gain access to the um, the service. So uh, it is it's an amount that um, is is influenced by how many uh, customers are being proposed as opposed to uh, a flat rate. It's prorated based on, on uh, the number of customers. So that rate, that, that, uh, that, that cost is still in play then? That's correct. It hasn't, it hasn't dissolved in, entirely. There's still a, a, an initiation, uh, a fee for each of the new um, telecoms that uh, establish an agreement with the um, township. Thank you, Adam. Councilor Kittress. 
Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, we're on the uh, reports part, but I thought we were we didn't do the uh, capital budget part. I had a few questions on that in the budget. Um, I was wondering if we would be going back to that or at any time, because I, I realized that we're moving down the reports here. Um, but I think when we were moving around, uh, we were jumping to the reserve and to the debt. And, you know, I don't, don't think we did the capital budget part. So, uh, I, Yeah, sorry, we did. Um, yeah, we did the capital 10 year capital uh, forecast um, for yeah, from the end. I'm not I just the 10. This the capital one for. 22. Um, I just had a few questions. There's some odd things that I just kind of want to ask about and uh, and just generally want a few answers to them. Because this budget will be the only time I probably could ask them. So, Yeah, so we'll, um, when we get to uh, the draft budget, um, and then we're going to hit the, uh, during the draft budget, when we get to item 8.4, that's when we're going to, that's when we're going to talk about the parking lot items. Um, and if there's things that you want to bring out um, in your comments at that time, you can do that. Okay. Councilor Van Leeuwen? Oh, okay. Councilor Van Leeuwen? Sorry, my computer's a little slow today. No, I've got no questions here on this point. Councilor Dunsmore? No, I'm good. Thanks. Councilor Foster? Thank you, Mayor. My question for Adam uh, Dickerson. Uh, Adam, um, having internet access to rural areas is an important thing. And we had, I think part of the spirit of this, looking at this had that in, in its sight. I, I guess I'm wondering, Adam, is this uh, fee a, a deterrent to utility companies um, for uh, improving or increasing um, internet access in rural rural areas. Uh, through you, Mayor Linton, uh, it's really difficult for me to say without having a look at the the books from the telecom providers. But it, in the grand scheme of things, it's fairly nominal, and the the t the host township has every right to. Uh, charge a fee that can um, uh, uh, that that um, compensates for staff time and uh, that's all that it's really doing is 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 are these fees are are to uh, compensate for the staff's time that's put in so I haven't heard from the telecoms uh, counselor Foster that it's a deterrent Thing to add to that, Colin? Yeah, thank you, Mayor Linton. Yeah, I, I would just add, uh, we're not not aware that it's a deterrent. Um, I think we, we did receive some, some feedback from uh, just through when the uh, SWIFT program, uh, Councillor Foster was was being rolled out and, uh, and, and some of the kind of smaller uh, high-speed internet, internet uh, providers were starting to, uh, uh, to, to access that program. And, uh, you know, they're just, maybe we're used to, to working in more rural communities and, and weren't uh, used to seeing that, uh, that level of, of fee. So, um, so hence, hence the review, you know, that's, that's what really triggered this about uh, a year or so ago uh, was, was looking at uh, kind of tiering our system between uh, the, the urban and the rural. But as far as we're aware, none of the other uh, providers um, have concerns with, uh, with our, our, our annual fees. Councillor McRae. Uh, thank you, Marilyn. Uh, I don't have any questions. Okay, I'll read the recommendation of the Council of the Township Center of Wellington authorize a revised fee structure for municipal access agreement annual fees as presented in report number IS 2021 11, municipal access agreements revised annual fee structure dated November 30th, 2021. Can I get a mover for that, please? Councillor McElwain, second of my Councillor Dunsport. All in favor? And that's carried. Thanks very much, Colin. Thanks very much, Adam and Adam.
Moving on to 8.2, the 2022 fees and charges bylaw. And we have a report from uh, Dan Wilson. Welcome again, Dan. Thank you, Mayor Linton. Um, so this report outlines the proposed fees and charges for 2022. Um, as council will recall, as part of pre-budget meetings, we were given instructions for um, an increase in fees and charges of 2.4% uh, unless a, a, an alternate increase or decrease was, was warranted. Um, my report does outline a few um, instances where uh, we did go above or below 2.4% and we're happy to address any questions that council may have in those areas. Um, when it comes to parks and recreation fees, just a, a point around implementation. Um, in general, parks and recreation fees are effective April. Uh, the Victoria Park Senior Center fees are effective the beginning of June. And the Fergus Grant Theatre fees are effective the beginning of July. Um, other than that, we have some legislative fees, especially when it comes to some of the cemetery fees and fire fees um, that we don't really have control over. Um, the um, municipal access agreement telecom fees that Colin and Adam just uh, discussed, uh, the, the reduced rates are reflected in, in the bylaw itself. Um, and one other point, um, we have increased the water wastewater rates um, as based on our water, approved water and wastewater rate study, uh, which is a 1.1% increase for water, 3.2% increase for wastewater. And that's reflective in the water and wastewater operating budgets that Mark has gone through with us today. Um, that concludes my remarks and I'd be happy to uh, address any questions. Thanks, Dan. Councillor McRae. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, my only comment is, yeah, it's a challenging task to find that balance between fee increases and um, increasing property taxes. So I believe staff's recommendations are quite reasonable in terms of what they're recommending. Councillor Foster. I'm, I'm not in favor of raising fees 2.4% and I'd like a report vote on this matter your worship when the time comes. Okay, we'll do that. Councillor Dunsmore. Yeah, I would just be repeating uh, Councillor McRae's words. I'm happy with it and I'm, I'm happy for the work staff have done on it. Councillor Van Leeuwen. I have nothing to comment on it. Councillor Kittress. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, as I earlier uh, discussed about the uh, building and uh, planning uh, fees, um, these increases, will they change when we get the report? <laughs> or are you anticipating um, them uh, staying the same and then the year after doing that? Or what? what's the... How, how's that fees going to, how are their fees going to change? Dan or Brett, you're going to answer it? Okay. Yeah, I'll answer it. Uh, I anticipate that uh, at least on the planning side, if there's a significant change in the fees, for sure, based on the study that's done, that we would bring that forward uh, mid-year in a separate report. Uh, and the building fees... What, what you see in the bylaw that's in front of you are not the fees for the building code related items. So the building permit fees normally come anyways to council in a separate bylaw. So we're hopeful that when the report comes, that will be the time that the fees are set. Councillor McElwain. Thanks Mayor. Um, I don't really have any comments. Just uh, I, I made my comments when we went through this in the pre-budget that I thought that we should be deducting 0.33% from the 2.4 this year because we overcharged by 0.33% last year's fees and charges. And uh, I think that should, in fairness to the residents, uh, that should be... Uh, reflected in, in lower fees this year, but uh, um, my suggestion was defeated, so it is what it is. Okay, 
Thanks, Councillors. I'll read the recommendation of the Council of the Township of Santa Wellington pass the bylaw to establish the 2022 fees and charges for various services provided by the Township and repeal bylaw 2020-57. Can I get a mover for that, please? Councillor Dunsmore, second by Councillor Van Leeuwen. All in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. And then, then I will uh, turn it over to our clerk for a recorded vote. Uh, Councillor Van Leeuwen? Yes. Councillor Foster? Opposed. Councillor Wayne? No. Councillor McRae? Yes. Councillor Kittress? No. Councillor Dunsmore? Yes. And Mayor Linton? Yes. yes. It is carried. Okay, moving on to 8.3, Ontario Regulation 28409. Um, can you just explain again, remind us what this is, Mark? Yep, thank you, Mayor Linton. Um, so essentially this is a housekeeping item. This report's been coming forward in a similar format since probably 2008 or nine, 2009, I guess it's been. Uh, so essentially OREG 28409 allows for the exclusion amortization or depreciation, if you wanna call it that, and post-employment benefit estimates and municipal budgets. So uh, we're not aware of any municipalities that actually would budget for amortization and post-employment benefits and actually levy taxes on them. Um, amortization is a reflection of historical cost of assets and not replacement costs, or, so it's not a good basis for budgeting. Standard practice for budgeting for capital asset replacement is uh, the township's approach, which is, uh, uh, life cycle costing using replacement costs. Um, so if this report though is not accepted annually, then the township essentially would have to include amortization in their tax levy. Okay, thanks Mark for that. I'll read the recommendation, then I'll get questions from council. Uh, that the council of the township of Santa Wellington adopt report number COR 2021-72 regarding additional and financial disclosure requirements for the 2022 budget year pursuant to Ontario Regulation 284-09. I get a mover for that, please. Councillor McRae, second by Councillor Dunsmore. Any questions, comments on that one? All in favor? Opposed? Sorry, Councillor Foster, I didn't get your vote on that. I'm abstaining from voting on that. Okay, so that's opposed. Okay, so moving on to 8.4. Uh, this is the whole uh, draft budget here. And so at this point, now it makes sense for us to turn our attention to uh, the parking lot items. So there's two, uh, uh, two groups of parking lot items here. One was for information items, requests for information items from staff and the other was regarding potential uh, council motion. So we'll deal with the information items first. Um, the first item was a question related to the cost for the procedures bylaw. And I've, I've received that uh, total from our staff and the total cost for the procedures bylaw um, was $24,828.93. ninety-three. So that was the cost um, for assistance to do to, for the consultants to do that work. That doesn't include staff time. So that was the first uh, item checked off. The second item was related to a question about all health and safety related expenses across the entire organization. And to answer that question is not quite as simple. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dan to explain um, why it will be difficult to get that information. Dan. Thank you, Mayor Linton. Um, as mentioned earlier, um, the majority of our health and safety related compliance costs are blended into each department's budget. Um, so just as an example, if we're looking at um, training and development for health and safety, 
it could appear in many different departments' budgets, and it's blended in with with training and development uh, for that department for all other needs. Um, so it would be a quite a huge undertaking to go through each of the budget areas and try to specifically identify what is health and safety related and what is not healthy and sa health and safety related. Uh, that said, um, we do have the new health and safety position in the budget for 2022. Uh, we do have a health and safety related um, planning project in, in the capital budget that is meant to um, refine our health and safety policies and procedures and, and uh, centralize health and safety across the township. It's, it's something we can we can put on the, the list of things to look at when we're when we're doing that in 2022 to not only centralize the, the process of health and safety, but to centralize all the costs associated with health and safety so we can reflect that to council when needed. That was your uh, question, Councillor Kitchis. Does that uh, answer your question? Uh, obviously, that's one of the reasons why we have to move ahead with an approach so we can answer that question more easily. Councillor Kitchis? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, so you're going to actually have to be doing that anyway, um, realistically, for uh, because it's, you're, you, as part of the HR, you're going to have to uh, present that and consolidate all that. So um, I'm just wondering, um, is the, I understand that all training, not just the health and safety training, was done in, as a budget item in so you'd have to go line by line in each department okay so it would be helpful to see where where health and safety is since we're starting this whole process in the future um because i just as a when it, when i saw the six thousand sixty five hundred, i thought that's nothing um you haven't been doing it actually you know like that's what my first thought was and i know that it's a legal uh regulation that you have to do it so i'm sure it's buried somewhere um and i just think that it's so that the public knows what that we are uh doing the proper legal i think we should have it publicly in one place so I'm glad that you're going to be doing that in the future. I hope that you add that when you do it for the next budget, whatever. Okay, thanks for that. Um, the third, the third information item was uh, payroll totals, payroll totals per year since 2010, and um, I've, we've we've talked about that uh, with Mark, and they've identified that that can be provided. Um, by the next council meeting, that is in a, a it, it go. You need to go by each department, but um, it's one number per year, so the staff will get that back to council. Anything that you want to add to that, Mark? No, I think that covers it. Essentially, we'll just pull the numbers out the annual T four summaries if that's sufficient for Councillor Foster. Councillor Foster, that was your question. Does that work for you? Yeah, what I'm, I'm interested to know, Mark, our total payroll for each year, township wide, uh, over those years, 2010 through the current year. I realize 2021, you may have to, the year to date for 2021, you may have to extrapolate a little for the current month of December and a budget figure for 2022. But yes, you, I want to see, I want to see how our I want to see our total payroll expenses township wide over those 10 years, as well as a uh, year to date for 21 and, and projected for 2022, which is the budget we're working on today. Dr. McLean. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I actually asked that question as well, and but I also asked to uh, provide the total gross expenditures by the township each year. I only asked for 2014 to present, not 2010, but either is makes me happy. Uh, but I did want to see the uh, gross expenditures as well as the uh, as the uh, um, cost of employment. Uh, Mark, is that something that could be provided at the same time? 
So when you're talking gross expenditures, are you going by the budgeted gross expenditures? If you're, if you're looking for actuals, that's a little more difficult because what happens is you're well aware with your end financial statements. Um, that's when you do all the PSAB adjustments and we start splitting assets between what's a capital asset and what is just a regular expenditure. I would suggest a more consistent method might be just the total budgeted amount. And reason being is that's fairly con comparable from year to year. Um, it, it would be a, a, a lot of work. It would mean undoing our year-end processes, essentially, which I don't think I could do that going back that many years. Okay. Um, I, I, the budgeted process is, is fine, Mark. I, I guess basically I just wanted to know the total amount that we are spending, and I understand that there are some, um, some things that make it difficult, the um, budgeted amounts are fine, but I, I want to make sure that we include all of our revenue that is being spent, not just you know, operate, not just operating costs, but capital costs as a total amount of revenue being spent over that period of time. So including um, you know, the gas tax and including OLG and including et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, adding up to whatever the total amount of money revenue and, and how much is spent. Can I suggest that since the majority of wages go through the operating budget, that we take the total off the operating budget summary? You know, that summary that we looked at early on in, in the discussions earlier, if you start mixing in the capital budget in this, you, you're, you're going to make a, a real mess of this. And I don't think you're going to get what you potentially are looking for. You start mixing in the capital budget, you're going to get developer contributions and all kinds of stuff in there that vary from year to year. You're going to have years where it's going to look like wages have gone down significantly as a percentage of the total budget. I think you'd have a real mess. <laughs> okay, let's... Uh... It, what I, I really wanted both. Um, if you feel seriously that uh, adding the uh, capital budget in there is not going to be providing any useful information, then um, I'll take your word for it and uh, just do the comparison against the operating budget. But um, I, what I really wanted to see is how much we as a township are spending every year, because I think our spending is has really skyrocketed over the last uh, eight to 10 years. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm just trying to get a, a good feeling of how much that actually is happening. Any uh, uh, information items that we, that I missed? Councilor Foster? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, to be clear, Mark, what I'm interested in is the total gross payroll. That um, so that would be salaries plus all payroll taxes. That's our net payroll cost as an employer. So rather than just the sum of everybody's T four, I want to know what the, our total expenses as a, as an employer, our total gross payroll, including all payroll taxes. Yes, and we can get the majority of that off the T4 summaries, as you're probably aware, right? CPP, EI are all totaled on there. We have EHT reports. Uh, I believe there's an annual report that's done for group benefits, and I believe there's an annual report done for OMER. So we'll pull all that information off those reports. The only thing I'm not uh, sure about is if uh, we have all of that stuff in offsite storage, it may get destroyed after eight years. I'm not sure what the legal requirement is on that. Okay, so we may only be able to go back seven. Okay. Okay. So, Councilor Kittress. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Can I ask my questions about the capital 22 capital budget? Just some, in, some queries I had about it at this time.
let's go through uh, the parking lot items and then um, and then hopefully some of those will be touched on on the parking lot and then we can go through um, those. Okay, so um, then we have five items that I captured uh, as the parking lots. The first one is um, a, a request and a potential motion to defer wage increase for, for council compensation for 2022. And that was um, mentioned by Councillor McCray and then Councillor Kittress also um, in, indicated some interest in that. Um, I'll, and so I'll turn it. That's that's a that's a political that's a political decision. So I'll turn that to Councilor McRae uh, if you want to make a motion on that. Thank you, Mayor Linton. Yes, I'd like to put forward a motion that Council consider uh, not taking a pay increase for 2022, and that we keep our uh, current salaries. And um, I'm just thinking too that maybe the money we save from our salary increase can go towards um, supporting the youth council. Um, maybe we can just deal with the first part, Councilor McCray, just keep it clean, um, if that's okay with you. And if I can get a seconder for the motion to uh, defer wage increases, I think who also mentioned, Councilor Kittress, did you mention that that's something that you were interested in or? Councilor Kittress, I'm looking for a seconder. I don't want discussion yet. I'm looking for a seconder for that motion. Councilor Kittress, okay. Um, discussion from Council. Uh, Councillor Foster. Our accountants talk about materiality, and in this case, we're talking about six thousand dollars, a thousand dollars of increase for six councillors and, and, and a mayor on a sixty million dollar budget. There's there's no material impact on our budget. Um, Councillor McCray, I, I, I realize it's maybe a symbolic gesture, but it's it's really not going to have any impact on our budget. Six thousand dollars on a sixty million dollar budget. Um, it seems too that we have, in the past, we have had many many acclamations, and in 2017, 18, I believe we do a study of councillor wages because our wages had fallen below other municipalities. So um, I think we should think carefully about this and the resulting impact, um, which is going to be uh, uh, non-material. There's going to be no material impact to the total budget. And we may have the unintended consequence of making worse our, uh, our ability to attract good people to run for office. Councilor Dunsmore? I would say if it's immaterial, it'll have an immaterial uh, impact on people wanting to run for office. I, it is a symbolic gesture. We've had staff take uh, decreases and hold off on, uh, on wage increases to help out during this time. And I think it's only responsible for council to do the same. Councilor Van Leeuwen? I think it's a, a good idea to hold off on our on our increase and where we go with the funds we can decide later. Councillor Kitches. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Um, it's it's purely symbolic. Um, you know, that's that's just all what it is, uh, and uh, I think it is. It, it, I agree with Councillor Dunsmore. It's it doesn't really affect the budget at all. Like. And so it's just symbolism. I think a lot of people are, are still struggling. And I think that it's a good gesture to try to uh, empathize with them and to understand that we are conscious of their uh, predicaments. And hopefully um, there will be another review and then we will see where our wages stand. Councilor McElwain. I agree that uh, it is a symbolic gesture, but I think it's an important one and I support the idea. Okay, yeah, um, just a couple comments for me. I, uh, we went through a process a while ago that I didn't really like and that uh, uh, increased the pay for both the mayor and the councillors. Um, I'd like to see uh, councillors 
compensation tie back to what our staff do and not ha having us talking about our own compensation, increasing it or de decrease decreasing it. I'd like to see our compensation just pay, uh, tied back to staff so we don't have to talk about what we get. I think that's a cleaner way to do it. So um, I'd, I'd prefer that approach, but you know, I understand, um, uh, I understand it's difficult times for people and we want to uh, make a statement and lead by example. So I can understand uh, the motion for sure. Okay, so a call to, the, to question all in favor. Opposed. And that's carried. Second item that I have on the parking lot is related to um, removing $70,000 from the plowing, sanding, and scar uh, scarifying um, budget item. And I, before we, I turn that over to Councilor Kittress because that was his, um, his uh, suggestion there. I want um, I want Mark to talk about what that is because I, I think there needs to be a little bit of context put to that number. Mark. Thank you, Mayor Linton. So I, I spent a few minutes looking back over the past five years in detail. And, and essentially what makes up that line, as I mentioned earlier this morning, is really three components. You've got labor, um, you've got machine time, which again is really just an allocation, right? It's, it's a nothing from the standpoint of the overall township budget. And you've got materials, which I talked extensively about this morning, which essentially is the sand and salt that we purchase. Um, so over the past five budgets, we've actually gone over budget quite significantly one year, actually over $100,000 over budget on the sand and salt costs um, uh, portion of it. So I would suggest that if you want to take 70000 it should not come out of the materials portion of it. Uh, machine time, again, is a nothing. And the labor, the labor applied or the labor component uh, three out of five years as well, we've gone over budget uh, as to the estimated amount of labor uh, for that line item. So where we're at fault in all of this really is on the machine timeline. Um, and all that means is that at the end of the year, we've been under on machine time recovery and we've been over, or sorry, we've been under on the machine time applied to this line item. And we've also been under on the machine time recovery. So essentially, if you want to take 70,000 out of here, um, you essentially would have to probably remove a position and of which three out of five years, we've been over budget on this line item. And if, because if you don't remove a position, you're essentially taking the labor applied out and you would then have to tell me to what other line item do you want me to put it to? Because we know what our total pool of labor is, right? For our hourly staff within public works, we put in an estimate for overtime, and then from there we apply it to all the various little line items that are within public works. So grass cutting, uh, the, this line item, snowplow, uh, winter sidewalk maintenance, and so forth. So I hope that explains or gives a little bit of context to the amounts that are with, within that, that line item. Councilor Kittress? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I don't want to reduce the salt and I don't want to reduce the labor. So the machine time seems to be where we are always, uh, it, it, it's not clear and defined to me exactly how that is calculated and how it seems to be something that you can uh, change or fiddle to make work so i don't that's where i see like how, how is it um because in this last year you have very close to the actuals so you have your salt you have almost all your labor you might have another two hundred thousand, but even then we would be at 750 which would be so how is this machine time allocated and how is it? So that's my thing, because if it's just machine time that you're allocating, then you can change $70,000 easily because it doesn't, it's not clear to me how you um, accrue that or dispense it as a budget because it seems like it's variable. And so that's partly why I say um, if 
we're not using it or it's not being allocated or you see that's the problem with the budget because like do you add that in january when we do the kmpr thing like when it's all done do you just sort of adjust it at that time or is it is the number that you have there which was five hundred and sixty thousand dollars um is that accurate? Like, like, are you doing the machine time at, uh, throughout the year? But it doesn't appear to be. Um, so that when we get the budget, so I just sort of don't understand because I, I see that the machine time is variable and you could take $70,000 out of that. And we could have all, I'm hoping that you have already bought all the salt <laughs> and, uh, you know the labor will will just we'll see how that goes so uh, can you explain that because that's sort of what my my idea is about it i i feel that it's very flexible yep. fair, fair enough that, that's that's a very good question um and it is a, a difficult concept to get but essentially uh, short answer to your question would be if you reduce the machine time then you're also going to reduce the cost recovery line item that go that is in fleet repair and maintenance line item and essentially you've done nothing to the budget, okay? So what happens is, and yes, machine time is recorded throughout the year. We have a system called work tech right now that'll be replaced by um, uh, Citywide, uh, which we've been using for well over a decade now that essentially each uh, piece of machinery we have or each vehicle has its own machine time rate. And as long as staff, and this is this is a big, thing too is if staff are not keeping a separate timesheet and putting this time in then the machine time will not get allocated to the correct cost centers okay there have been consistency issues with that in prior years there's also been issues where uh, we've we purchased a new vehicle and the rate has not been set up properly within the system as well but at the end of the day it has zero impact on the surplus absolutely no impact because all it does in accounting terms goes credit machine time recovery within public works and it goes debit to the line item to which you charged it to. And it's a wash, okay? And all machine time is attempting to do is taking the total cost of insurance, repairs and maintenance, uh, fuel, and an amount to replace those vehicles and equipment in the future and attempting to allocate that uh, through a, 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 an, an hourly rate on a piece of machinery when it's used, and then it gets allocated to a line item. Does, does that explain it a little better? It, it, it is a, it's a crazy concept to get, but this essentially is management accounting of what it is. It's a, and it's an attempt to take a pile of costs in one central location and allocate them out to various line items within the budget based on their usage. Okay, and, and looking at the history, we've been way under in many years on machine time here, but again, we can, we can do it. We can reduce it 70 grand, but all I'm gonna do is I have to reduce the machine recovery line item by 70 grand as well, which means nothing happens whatsoever to the budget. Okay. Dan, did you wanna add anything to that? Your hand was up for a bit. Yeah, just, just to clarify what Mark is saying, we basically take the cost associated with fleet so like you mentioned, insurance, repairs and maintenance, gas and oil, that type of thing. And it all goes into one cost center. So in Collins department, that's called fleet repairs and maintenance. All those actual costs go into that one cost center. And what Mark is describing is we try to allocate those costs to all the various cost centers like plowing based on the actual usage of the machinery. Uh, so by allocating those costs to plowing, we're not increasing the total budget. We're, we're removing it from this fleet repair and maintenance section and, and putting it into the plowing section. Um, and that's just our way of trying to allocate a proportion of the fleet repair and maintenance costs to plowing. And it's, it's, it's a better way to reflect how we're using our machinery. So, so what Mark is saying is we can't just arbitrarily reduce machine time for plowing by $70,000 because that's just an allocation of costs that are actually being incurred under fleet repairs and maintenance. Um, we can't, I advise not reducing fleet repairs and maintenance because insurance is going up by 12%. Gas prices are through the roof right now. 
and we have repair and maintenance on our fleet. And that's those are items that I, I suggest we don't play around with. So just to clarify, so reducing this line item, you'd either have to address salt, sand, or machine time. One of those three things in order to reduce that as suggested. Uh, yes, and and as I mentioned, or just I, as I just mentioned, reducing machine time. Um, unless you want to reduce our budget for insurance, repairs, and maintenance and gas, um, there's I don't see the benefit of reducing machine time at this point. Councilor Kittress. Thank you, Mayor. I think I'll just withdraw this at this time. Um, the reason is, but I do have a I have a request. Um, is there a, a you're, you're changing the system, the work tech to something else? Will there be a better way of of us seeing how this is all um, put together? Because it is confusing. Because if you're just shifting um, sort of costs that are basically um, they're they're necessary because you need to allocate. Um, that you're repairing, you're, you're doing your asset management properly. But um, is there a way of sort of, because if you did it, um, if you had a system where you could see where each operator is incurring maybe costs, um, and is that where we're kind of going? Because let's say you have, a, you have somebody that's an expert, they're not going to have very many costs on the machine because they, they run that thing like a, you know, they, they, it's like their backhand. They, they know how to run the plow and there's no maintenance. They don't hit anything. Um, but, you know, if you have somebody, then you could sort of see it. So is there a system that we're now adopting that would do that? Dan? Um, basically, as mentioned, as Mark mentioned earlier, we're, we're trying to transition from one system to another so we can we can look to try to simplify the overall process, but what what the allocations out to to cost centers like plowing are? They're actually like hourly rates. So just by merely using a plow for an hour means a, an hour of of time charged to plowing for for that machine for that piece of machinery or equipment. Um, so um, we we set hourly rates based on um, trying to recover all costs associated with re fleet repair and maintenance. Um, so that's that's something we're trying to redefine under this new system. And I think um, once we have that new system more or less refined, we can do uh, an education session with council on how this actually works. Thanks, Dan, for that. Um, the next item that I had on the parking lot was uh, have staff ex uh, explore private sector partnership or privatization or something like that related to the Fergus Grand Theatre. Um, and that, that was brought by Councillor Kitcher. So I'll hand it over to him in a second. Uh, my initial thoughts on that, that's, that's a, a, a big decision. Um, that wasn't in, our, wasn't in our strategic plan. My feeling is that um, we, def we refer this to a new council when they develop their new strategic plan because um, this could go in many different ways. Um, and it's definitely not gonna make a, a difference to the 2022 budget. Um, but I will, I, I, it wasn't my idea. I'll, I'll turn that over to Councillor Kittress, but I do think that um, something like that, and we have talked about it in the past, but something like that is, is something that should find its way into a council strategic plan because it's a significant piece of work. Councillor Kittress. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, that's exactly how I'm thinking about it. I, I realize that we only have one more year and we're doing, um, but I do want, um, I don't know whether we had a, a consultant um, talk about economic development. The problem I have with the Fergus Theater is it, it doesn't generate any cash, but it has huge potential economically. And Fergus needs something. It really needs some like magnet to come and and I don't see us, I've been on council for seven years, I don't see this as happening by us because there's too much risk involved. And I, I feel that if we had uh, at least 
uh, kind of maybe a strategy that the next council could decide on at least, they could sort of see, um, first of all, we're, we're, we're taking a, a, an asset that we have. And if someone were to take it off, take possession of it and, and have a plan, they could, it would become an item where we'd charge rent and we, we would have income and they do all the maintenance and you know, it's all, it's all clear. So, and we don't have the labor costs and it's that, that's their thing. And at the same time, you can have a community agreement um, for all the, you know, I know realize people are very attached to the uh, Fergus Grand Theater. And, and I, I, I think that that's great. Uh, you know, if you have something with some private group that allows for all that, uh, you know, if there's still a fee structure like we would have, but I see there's a huge potential for, I mean, just music itself. I, I, I just have had a lot of people say, hey, man, that'd be great. To, but they want to they wanna make money. And, uh, and I don't feel that we're the, in a position to risk like that. So that's sort of, I'm thinking economic, you know, restaurants would be helped. Uh, you know, um, I'm in the arts thing. And I know that, uh, you know, the studio tour, we, you know, you try to get people coming and, and coming into the town. And so that's sort of what I my, my idea. So I don't know whether, um, you know, I think this council should to, to think about our future with this. I, I know everyone is very attached to, you know, it's always been there and we own it and we have it, but we've improved this, uh, we, we've spent a lot of money improving this and it's it's very nice inside it's it's really but we're not the potential is not being used and so that's my concern i want it to be a mecca uh interest you know economically developed uh but i'd also see it it's just like we're just spend money on it and it doesn't add anything to our you know it's not dynamic enough so I, that's under my thoughts and I realize that uh, it won't be next year, but I think that we should maybe have a proposal uh, to to look into that. To to you know, so at least we have some data. So um, uh, on on that privatization, like, and then the other people can decide about it. So whether we study it or uh, uh, what the possibilities are, I, I mean, that's what I'm thinking. Um, and you know, like. It wouldn't cost very much, I don't think, you know, to to do that kind of study to to make so you can make a decision like that. So that's really what I'm interested in. Um, uh, I think that the I think it would be good for our community. I think it would be good for Fergus. I'm sort of really seeing that uh, Fergus needs a a, a new magnet, uh, and and they have it, like they have it right there. So it's it's that's my thoughts. So, Councilor Ketchers, in terms of uh, putting it in the context of the 2022 budget, do you, is there anything that you think that can be termed in uh, in a motion um, so that we can get a mover and get any kind of discussion on it? Because I, I absolutely think it's worth the discussion. I'm I don't I'm just not convinced it's this council that should be discussing it because I do think it's a pretty substantial, um, pretty substantial council and staff. Uh, report that's going to have to be completed. That's for sure. Councilor Kittress. Uh, yeah, I'd like to. I'll, I'll make a motion that uh, we refer this to staff to study uh, potential economic uh, implications uh, and budgetary implications for uh, the next council. Uh, seconder for that. Councilor McQueen, uh, any discussion on that, Councilor Dunsmore? Yeah, it seems to me this has been done before. Uh, maybe uh, Matt Tucker can help us out on this, I don't know. But I remember uh, the Fergus Law Rotary Club and a bunch of private citizens donating money to a group that was running that theater and it didn't work out. And isn't that not why the township took it over in the first place? Can somebody help me with the history there? Matt? Uh, I see through you, Amir, and I'm actually hoping Dorothy's um, 
on the Solana call. She might have um, a bit better history of of the theater, but um, I know um, yeah the township did take um, the theater over, um, and uh, we've started uh, doing uh, things ourselves, um, trying to promote and uh, bring in um, new productions. Um, some some years have been more successful than others, that's for sure. Um, and I'm not sure if we ventured down. I know there was talk um, at a staff level at one time at looking at uh, future privatization, but um, maybe Dorothy can help me out with that one. My history with the theater is, um, yeah, the township took it over in 2003. They bought it from a private group. And uh, Neil is correct. There were there was a lot of funding and, and groups that got together to make a go of the theater, and it was was not successful. Um, so, unfortunately, that's I, I don't have a lot more history than that to offer up. But Neil, you are correct in, in what you were suggesting. Yes. So, Kels, I just want to caution us. Um, we're talking about the budget here, um, and this this falls um, into some strategic planning discussion. Um, so we're operating in a little bit of a vacuum here. Um, there has been a significant amount of work done in the past and we don't have that in front of us. Um, we're coming out of COVID where obviously the theater was closed. So we can't be going by what we did or didn't do in, in the past year. So I wanna caution council about going too far down this path. Um, I absolutely think it's a discussion that that should happen. And I like some of the, the comments that Council Kitchis has made, but in terms of the, the budget, um, I just, I just don't want us to go too far out there um, with our discussion because, again, we, don't ha we, we haven't come prepared to have this discussion right now, and there is a significant amount of work that has been done. Um, so I just, just I want to throw that out there uh, for Council. I don't want to go too far down this path. Uh, Councillor Van Leeuwen? Thanks, Mayor. And actually... Um... This is, a, this is a discussion we've had in the past. Um, and I, I guess I think subject to your comments, I almost want to curb myself, but I know that 100% uh, uh, in the past, we've actually talked about what does Drayton Theatre look like? How do they do this? What do we do with employees? Do we continue to expand it? Um, in the past 11 years, I think uh, you, both of us have been on council for this time. Uh, there's been so many different strategies looked at with this building and with the theatre itself. Um, I like the idea uh, of looking at it again and, and everything about uh, a business plan is about opportunity and timing and strategy and who's in the market to find somebody. But I feel like perhaps this is still better for us for the next council. Um, so is it, it, if we're going to talk about emotion, can it be something that um, staff gathers together the information at a high level so that it can be presented at some time to council, but that we don't have staff digging too deep into um, all new plans uh, without count, without a direction from the new council. Councilor Kittress? I'm open to that. Um, uh, I just feel like just even here, it's not clear about even the, the, the past history of the theater, uh, people can't recall. And uh, I feel that if we had a whole report about it, we understood uh, all the options, but uh, also just the opportunities. And then that information could be done for the next council so that they could make a strategic plan on it. That would be fine. But right now, um, I've, I've just, struggled with trying to understand how we could capitalize on this potential. Councilor McQueen. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I uh, agree with uh, what Councilor Kitchers just said. Um, I think it definitely is something for the next council and it is something that goes into the strategic plan for the next council. But I think uh, what Councillor Kitchers is asking for staff to gather data and be prepared to present that data to the next council so that they can include it in, this, in a strategic plan if 
if the uh, data presented warrants that change. Um, with it, it'll never get into the strategic plan if there's if there's no data available, basically. So, I think uh, asking uh, forwarding a staff at this point makes a lot of sense. Anything else on this, Councilor McRae? Thank you, Marilyn. I just like to add that um, staff, please consult the Alar Community Theater regarding assets that they purchased that were in the theater when the township took it over. As a former board member of ECT, I was aware of assets that were there. So I think it's important that we know what, what belongs to the township and what belongs to ECT. Okay, anything else on this topic? Councilor Dunsmore? Yeah, this is a budget meeting and we're asking staff to go forward and do a, a report and defer this to them. So how many hours are we allocating to this and how much money are we allocating to staff to research this? I, I don't know, Councilor Dunsmore. I, this falls completely outside of budget to me. So I, I it's, it's a motion uh, that's before council. So council makes the, this determination on this. Um, um, you know, to me, uh, this wasn't in our strategic plan. If this was important for this term of council, we would have definitely put it in our strategic plan and asked for uh, staff to come back with a report, talk to the stakeholders and develop options for council. We didn't do that. Um, so in my mind, uh, putting, throwing this to staff at this time um, without significant and clear direction um, is not, it, it is not uh, conducive to uh, good decision making. In my mind, um, especially from a council meeting, um, especially when we weren't prepared to have this discussion today. So, but it's it, this is a council process. So we have a mover and a seconder on the table. So it's up to it's up to council to figure out uh, how this motion reads. Council Kittress. I uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, first of all, I'm not asking to sell the to some group. I'm just asking for the study to be prepared to have the information um, for us so we can make a decision or a future council can make a decision. And to get information about this will require some work. It's true, Councillor Dunsmar, uh, it will require some time. Um, I think it's, um, you're on economic development. I think it's worthy time. I think it's, a. Uh, uh, it's it that have potential for the theater is is incredible if we get if we get the right uh, plan together and just to study what the potentials are and what the history is and have a report about that I I, I think that's very important for the future of Center Wellington and uh, Fergus uh, I think it's a profound. Uh, thing to be able to bring that forward uh, in the future uh, for some future council. Um, and so that's just why I think that it's important. I have been on council for seven years. I, others have been for longer and it's really, it really hasn't taken off by us doing it. Um, and that's why I just wanna look at that. Councilor Van Leeuwen. Thanks. Could we just have the motion, um, perhaps Councillor Kitchens would ha agree, to have the motion say um, something like we request staff to put the history of the Fergus Grand Theatre in a package format for a future council reference, something like that. Does that work for you, Councillor Kitchens and Councillor McQueen, who seconded it? Um, okay. the history is good, but I'm thinking about, um, budget implications and, um, potential revenues, um, to, to rent out. So I, I, I would like to have those aspects still into, uh, the motion. Um, so the history is great. I, I agree with that, but we need to look at, this is budget things and I am bringing this up at budget time because um, I see the theater as 
uh, it's always negative and I see it as potential in, in somebody else's hands, but also on a budgetary thing, it could bring in revenue. So I would like that aspect to still be part of it. Okay, I'm gonna call the question. Um, all in favor? Opposed? Okay, and that's defeated. Uh, moving on to the next item there, and it's something that didn't come up today, but it came up at our last council meeting, um, and it's the diversity, inclusiveness, and equity shift, um, the $40,000 shifting that to $80,000. And I know I had mentioned to Councillor Dunsmore that this is something that we would talk about at, at budget, um, because I wanted to make sure that we passed the main motion. Uh, when was it? It seems like it was weeks ago, but I think it was just yesterday. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Councillor Dunsmore to speak about his thought about increasing it from $40,000 to $80,000. And it will have an impact on this budget, just so you know. Councillor Dunsmore. Yeah, uh, through you, uh, Mayor. You know, we talked a lot about the symbolic gesture of, of the uh, the council foregoing their, their COLA increase. And that is exactly what that was, was symbolic. But you cannot make an equity uh, and diversity and inclusion uh, policy uh, a gesture. It, it, it has to be significant and it has to have the budget to do, to do what is necessary to help people in this community that are disenfranchised and help identify that. And the big part of that was training. And as a trainer, I know that that 40,000 is not enough. And so we need to, in my opinion, increase it to 80. If the council agrees for something lower, that, that I could be talked into that. But 40 is not going to cut it. We're not going to get the staff trained properly. We're not going to get the council trained properly and, and didn't be able to do other things, particularly the crosswalk initiative. So I think it's incumbent upon this council that we put our money where our mouth is. And, you know, Dan, if we went to 80, can you give us an idea of um, what that would do to the budget? Well, before that, let's let's get that uh, motion on on the floor. Okay. I think uh, Dan's already mentioned that one percentage increase is one hundred and fifty five thousand dollars. So we didn't have any money in in the budget for this, so that would be adding eighty thousand. So I know you're probably better at math, but let's um let's get a seconder on that, and then we'll turn over to staff to uh, clarify what that means for the budget. Seconder for that motion, as presented by Councillor Dunsmore, uh, Councillor McCray. Um, if I can turn it to you then, Dan, um, if you added the, the $80,000 or mark, um, if you could uh, work that out quickly, what that means to the 2.18% increase, that'd be great. Dan, are you taking this question? Yes, sorry. Um, so through Mayor Linton, um, so currently we don't have any funding for this capital project in, in, in the budget. Um, what I would suggest is that we treat either the 40,000 or the 80,000 or whatever number council agrees to as a, as a capital budget item. Um, and fund that from the general capital reserve. Um, um, it will reduce the balance in the general capital reserve. Um, that wouldn't that wouldn't make an impact on on the tax rate increase. We would we would continue in at the 2.4 percent increase in the general capital reserve, which is reduced slightly because of the deferral of council's uh, wage increase. Um, but but by using the general capital reserve to fund um, the um, diversity, inclusion, and equity funding, um, you're basically using existing funds to to fund this project. Okay, thanks for that, Dan. I think that gives us what we need uh, to get comments from other members of council. So members of council, to that motion as it stands. Um, I'll just go around the room quickly. If you don't want to speak to it, just say pass. Uh, Councillor uh, McRae. 
Thank you, Mayor Linton. Um, I support Councilor Dunsmore's recommendation that we go to 80,000. I think this is an important uh, message we want to send to the community that we're serious about wanting to address Councilor McElwain's initiative. So I'm, I'm all in favor of doing this. And you know, as uh, Councilor Dunsmore pointed out, training alone can be quite expensive. So we wanna make sure we have enough for training as well as getting a start on some of the other things like feather crosswalks, the colored crosswalks. So yeah, I'm in favor of this. Thanks, Councilor Foster. Thank you, Mayor. I I first want to say I I I I like the concept generally very very much. My my only concern, as I said yesterday, is um, equality and citizenship are are federal matters and and discrimination as well and all all the kinds of things that this will entail. Those are basically citizenship and and federal matters. And my only concern. Uh, uh, Councillor McElwain is that we are creeping into something upon which we have only limited uh, jurisdiction. And uh, nevertheless, I, I do like the concept and I, I, I kind of struggle with this one. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, Councillor McElwain, your, your points of view on this matter. And uh, 80,000 is, is, a, is a much bigger number, but I, I wanna hear from others. I'm concerned about overlapping our mandates over into an area upon which we really don't have much jurisdiction. Councillor Van Leeuwen. Thanks, Mayor. Um, yeah, I think that uh, training, inclusive training, uh, if we're looking at HR, extra HR training to ensure that we're not um, excluding people or that you know some of our programs have, if there have been concerns, um, training is something we can always work on. I am, I'm very concerned with the idea of the project aspect. Um, I'm a little bit worried that we are stepping into a new realm that is not our role. Um, I started looking at, you know, aspects, especially when we see the projects questions, I would look at it and say, um, you know, now we, we can ask the question, uh, we have a pro-life campaigns. Um, we can have like parents as first educators uh, asking for some stuff perhaps a crosswalk that speaks towards uh, rep repent and believe in Jesus Christ. Um, then you have an LGTBQ crosswalk. We get into uh, Aboriginal uh, uh, polls. We get into, you know, it just, I don't know where. I truly actually believe that we're walking into something that is not um, something that is the role of the township. We should be some, uh, a place that is inclusive uh, non-discriminatory, but allows groups the freedom to have their discussions in a, in a good and free society. But um, if we step into this new role, it's not going to end. And, I, and we will always be excluding somebody when we include and we try to include because it's endless, the amount of groups. So I, I fear that, uh, that this is the wrong way to go. In, but I have no problems putting some money towards ensuring that we are, some of our programs do not have any ex exclusive or discriminatory language in the policies. Thanks. Dr. Kittress. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I'm unclear about, um, are we, I understood yesterday that there would be some funds uh, when we pass that motion. And uh, so are we adding um, $80,000 on top of the funds that we already allocated in that motion? Or what exactly is it? So that's my, I'm looking for a clarification there. My own views are, we just passed that. I think that that was referred back to staff to build that um, policy to build it all together. It was, it's not done yet. And I think we're jumping the gun on, on adding funds to that. Um, I think that we just should build the policy um, as uh, the CAO Andy Goldie said, um, 
there, there's a lot to that. Uh, there, he had input from there, but each, you need to have a committee, you, you know, there's all this stuff that we're working on and to sort of um, really basically virtue signal uh, with funds that are not in our budget. Um, but we did, we did pass the motion yesterday and it did, I, I believe it had some money in it. So I'm wondering if we could um, get some clarity on how much money actually is this program going to have? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer that, Dan. Um, so uh, this was the, the budget was was created before it was passed uh, yesterday as far as putting the 40,000 there. So um, Councillor Dunsmore uh, is is uh, so the 40 wasn't there in the first place because the budget was built before yesterday. And so now we're adding uh, we're the motion is to add 40,000 to that to make it $80,000. And I think part of uh, Andy's report talked about the things that had to be done and some of that will cost money and that's where the money would be going to as well as some of the other things that were identified in his report. Um, so hopefully that helps. I'll go, I'll go next and I'm going to let uh, Councillor McWayne have the last word since this was uh, his um, initial motion. So um, I'm, I'm in favor of this. I think this is the right way to go. Um, I, I liked, I liked the holistic and authentic approach um, based on the report that Andy put together. There's some clarity there. Um, and I do think if we do it right, it'll, it'll result in authentic and real action. And to me, I'm not at all interested in virtue signaling. I'm not at all interested in being in putting forward some symbols. I want to make sure that we take a stand as leaders and make sure that our community is 100% inclusive. So um, I like what I saw in the report yesterday. So I'm in favor of uh, moving to the $80,000 for this. And I'll uh, turn it over to Councillor McWayne for the last word on this. Thanks, Mayor. Um, yeah, I, I certainly don't disagree with going up to $80,000. Um, I guess when, when uh, Andy came back to me with the staff report, um, he brought up $40,000 as something he felt that we could realistically spend between now and when we become a lame duck council in another six months kind of thing. So um, that was the constraint for next year was, is the, is the fact that we were going into an election year. Otherwise we probably would have started off at 80 or a hundred thousand um, dollars. And so if it is realistic that we can do the education piece that is required and uh, develop a terms of reference, which I don't think should should cost a lot of a lot of money, and and hopefully do something like crosswalk or two, that type of thing. Um, if we can do that, when while we're still able to uh, to work as a council uh, before we become laid dark then I, $80,000 is, is a great idea and I, I certainly support it. So that's really the only question I have and, and I didn't even have it until Andy brought it up. So um, I'm, I'm willing to go with, with it whichever way. I just want to make sure that it moves forward successfully one way or the other and whatever, whatever makes more sense. Um, from a staff and council perspective is what we need to do. Thanks, Councillor McWay, and thanks, Councillors. Um, so I'll call this, uh, this vote to a vote. All in favor? Opposed? And that carries. Uh, thanks, Council. Um, the next item I had on our parking lot was um, a uh, consideration from Councillor McElwain, and it's that the township, something along these lines, uh, that the township consider a plan to incorporate electric vehicles into the center lines and fleet. Um, so I'll turn it over to Councillor McElwain if, if, the, if he wants to word a motion uh, to, to in that area. Thank you. Um, I think that um... The, the COP26 is all is fresh on all our minds at this point, and 
and the uh, importance of uh, moving forward to try to cut greenhouse gases um, from a family level to a community level to a country level uh, is important. And uh, so I think putting a plan in place to start doing that with the community is important. And uh, so I would like to make a motion that we uh, direct staff to um, develop a plan to move our fleet to electric vehicles. And I, I, I really hesitate putting a time frame on there because we have a seven year uh, lifespan on vehicles on, and some of, some of them are longer. So um, I suppose it should be worded as, as the replacement plan dictates. Yeah, I think I think that's fine, Councillor McLean. I think that provides direction because council hasn't provided direction in the past on this one, and and I think the timing and all that kind of stuff would come out of the report um, because we have our, our maintenance uh, forecast in place already. So this that kind of gets the ball uh, rolling. Is there a seconder for that motion as presented, Councillor McRae? Uh, any discussion on that, Councillor Van Leeuwen? Thanks. Um, one of the concerns I have is, is we want to talk about moving to the electric fleet kind of uh, idea, but is, is there efficiency in, in this? I know that our vehicles, could we have like targeted, maybe targeted vehicles for our electric fleet or something like that? Because there's going to be some vehicles that stay close range that pipe could possibly make sense for electric. But um, I, I think that we should use the word targeted vehicles. Um, just if, if I could, I think that that is going to be part of the, the study. I know that the county's moved ahead on it and they're moving ahead initially with pickups because they're more readily available and, and they go along the lines with what you're talking about, Councillor Van Leeuwen. So I do think if we provide this direction that that's something that council is going to come back with anyway, um, a, a stepped or a phased approach to what makes sense and what the costs of it are. Councilor McCray. Thank you, Mayor Linton. Um, just a, another idea as well is, could we consider not only electric vehicles, but also hydrogen? Hydrogen fuel cell technology is um, continuing to advance. And I've been reading that there's some new things coming where they're talking about green hydrogen development. So maybe to think of more a sustainable type of vehicle. Okay, could we um, kind of modify the language of the motion to include electric and other types of green energy or just put in green energy powered, Councillor McWayne? I have no problem with that. Okay. And who seconded that again? McCray, you're, you're okay with seconding based on your suggestion? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> okay, good. If you wouldn't have, we would have had a problem. <laughs> I'd hate to see you get in an argument with yourself. The viewers wouldn't probably like it. Councilor Van Leeuwen? Sorry, I, I was just picturing all the building inspectors on bicycles. <laughs> all in favor? And that's carried. Okay, so that was um, what we had as far as the parking lot. Um, so now we have our last, uh, um, uh, re a recommendation here to 8.4 and uh, going back to what Councillor Kitch just talked about about some capital projects so in your comments that you give if you want to bring up some of your thoughts on that uh, you can feel free to do that so uh, 2022 draft budget 8.4 recommendation of the Council of the Township Center wants to approve the 2022 budget as amended and it's as amended based on uh, the $80,000 that we just approved um, for the diversity, inclusiveness, and, and equality uh, project. So that's what's amended to it. Um, can I get a mover for that? Councilor Dunsmore, seconded by Councilor McCray. But Dan, did, did you want to mention anything about, about that? Yeah, thank you, Mayor Linton. Uh, the budget all, is also amended um, based on uh, Council deferring their wage increase for 2022. Okay, yes. 
Thanks for reminding me about that. So those two items, that's why it's amended. Okay, so we'll go around the room. We got it moved and seconded to go around the room uh, for council. And we'll start with uh, Councillor uh, McElwain. <coughs> Sorry. First thing I would like to say is um, the acronym should not be diversity or for, for diversity, inclusion, and uh, equity. That's just, uh, it's the wrong acronym. It, it should be either IDE or DEI, but definitely shouldn't be DIE. So um, if, if all references to, to uh, going forward, please uh, reference it in one of those two acronyms and, and either of them are used pretty much the same. Um, I, um, as far as the overall budget is concerned, I, am reasonably positive. I have trouble voting for the budget that's got the um, operations center in it. Um, I, I gotta say, it, it, I haven't, haven't supported it all the way along and I still don't. And so having that $27 million sitting in our, our, in our budget long-term is, uh, is an issue for me. Um, I also, I mentioned earlier, I don't approve of, of adding, uh, assessment growth to the, uh, to the, what I, what I refer to as the surtax. Um, those two things are still an issue. I, I think overall the operations budget looks pretty good. And, uh, I think we have too many for, for our next two or three years, um, too many staff uh, additions planned. And um, so, but that's not being approved today. It's just the 2022 budget. So um, I'm really, um, I know the operations center is gonna go forward whether I approve it or not. I know that the Funding is going to go to uh, to uh, the um, uh, dedicated levy, whether I approve it or not. I just feel really uncomfortable approving them, and and um, I I just think we're spending money there that it it is unnecessary and and too much, and I I would love to see those numbers that I asked for this morning before. We actually even have this vote, to be honest, because I, I, I think that our, our spending has just increased beyond realistic numbers over the last eight years, and uh, I, I, so I would love to see the total, total amount we have spent over each year and how much it has grown in that short short time frame. Uh, it's certainly grown a whole heck of a lot more than, uh, than our. Uh, population has grown and um, we can't continue to do that every year like we have been. So it's a major concern and, and I'm not sure um, what we can do about it. It's just, uh, it, it, as I say, I know that it's going to be approved because that's the way this council votes. So um whether I approve it or, or agree with it or not is really immaterial, but I did want to get my comments out there. So thank you. I still have some questions um, that I was supposed to be able to um, ask. And so I'd like to do those questions right now. Um, and they were referring to the 22 capital budget. I, I don't, for the bike lanes on St. David Street, if we don't get that grant, where is that money coming from for that? If we don't get the grant, where is the money coming from? I've never had that answered for me. It's always saying we're, we're applying for this, 
and hoping for this, but where, if but that doesn't come through, where is the money coming from? So I, I, I'd like to answer on that. The other question I have is there's $50,000 to office reconfigure the civic center. And, and I don't understand what we're doing there. Um, can so I'd like an explanation of that. The other one is in the studies, I didn't know where else to ask this question, but I was wondering where is orientation in our budget? We spend over $5,000 on orientation, but I don't see it as a line item anywhere. And I know that we spent considerable amounts of money uh, on the last orientation, and I don't know where that's gonna be. Is it, is it part of the election funds? Is, wh wh what line item is that? And so I'd like to ask about that because I'm also wondering, um, do we have an orientation plan or is it just sort of the standard thing that we've had? Like, so where the budget item is and where the plan is, and that's sort of, so those are my questions. And I kind of would like to get those answers before I say anything else. Okay, so we'll, we'll allow some latitude here because we did go through the capital budget in significant detail already as a, as a full meeting at council. Um, as far as the dollars for St. David Street, if we don't get the grant, I will ask uh, either Dan or Colin to, oh, or Adam uh, to respond to that. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Mayor Linton. Um, uh, through you to Councillor Kittress. Uh, so, um, so since uh, we've last, uh, I guess, presented uh, the report uh, to Council on the on the various options and cost estimates, we have had some discussions with uh, with MTO. Um, prior to submitting the application, um, I believe it was a couple weeks ago now. Um, and maybe Adam, do you just want to uh, provide a bit of an update on those discussions based on, uh, um, I guess, as they relate to the uh, to the separated cycling infrastructure? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Colin. And uh, thanks to the questions, Councillor Kitchers, through you, Mary Linton. So Colin's correct. Uh, we submitted our application last Friday. Um, for the Connecting Links uh, program. Um, we, leading up to us submitting the application, we had we did have some good discussions with the MTO and specifically the administrators at the MTO who are responsible for the Connecting Links program. Um, we had a lot of questions for them. Uh, we wanted to ensure that um, what we were submitting, um, everything we were kind of asking for was within the scope of the program. Um, they assured us that it was, um, including um, the cycling infrastructure that we're proposing. Um, so we, I guess, to summarize, we, we have a good feeling about the application. Um, and um, uh, But to your question, Councillor Kittress, about what would we do if we are not successful with the application? Um, so Council will recall um, in the reports that we brought forward to Council and the presentations we provided to Council, um, I think we worded it um, like, uh, you know, that uh, proceeding with the project would be subject to uh, successful connecting links application for funding. So I think if we were not successful, and we'll find out, I understand, in the April 2022 timeframe, um, we would have to revisit the plans for that project at that point. But um, yeah, we were, I think we were careful in, um, you know, in, in stipulating that, you know, uh, going forward um, as planned in the budget um, is contingent on a successful application from the MTO. And then as the question about $50,000 for office configuration, um, Dan or Mark, would you be able to answer that, Dan? Yeah, thank you, Mayor Linton. Um, we, I, I believe this question came up as part of pre-budget. I just can't remember which councillor had asked the question. Um, this is our plans um, um, where we're, we're able to move some, some staff to 205 Queen Street. Um, we will have the ability to reconfigure part of the lower level of the Civic Center for smaller touchdown stations that will allow more staff to make use of, of a particular space within the Civic Center. This is just a, as a result of being at capacity in this building and trying to find new and, and efficient ways to, to allow for more staff to work out of the building. So it, it includes smaller workstations, um, um, in a particular area of the lower floor of the Civic Center. 
And uh, the last, thanks for that, Dan. The last question is about um, the orientation package, where that sits and how it's uh, designed. It sits in the election budget um, and it's organized and coordinated uh, by the clerk and the CEO in consultation with the senior management team. Um, so that's the answer to that question. Do you have any comments on the overall budget, Councillor Kitchis, before we move on? Um, yes, uh, I have not been um, for the um, staff increases um, because I do not believe that we have done due diligence and brought forward a business case for them. Um, that's what I've always wanted. Um, I believe that their wants and they are stated as wants when uh, they're presented, that each department presents their wants. Um, but there isn't an overall uh, process of having the business plan and how it's justified. Um, I think that's partly why um, Councillor McElwain and uh, Councillor uh, Foster want data on the imp increases in staffing and operations uh, part of the budget concerning staffing. So um, I have those same concerns. Um, I look forward to receiving that information. Um, second of all, um, I'm not for the operational cent. I'm not for paying that amount of money for the land. I'm not for the, the, the thing. I believe that that was a poor decision and I still believe it's a poor decision. I know it's on the strategic plan, but there are things that are like attainable housing, which are on the strategic plan and we do not have any money allocated to that. Um, and there is, um, all there is for that is basically plans to lower the costs for developers with the CIP plan, with no, not paying for parking for, and I think that we could have done a lot more um, in our budgets for attainable housing. Um, I, and uh, I think that choosing the operation uh, plan on our strategic plan over the attainable housing was a was a big mistake and uh, and I think that it should have been brought forward in this budget that we are um, because that is what citizens are concerned with in our community. Um, the other thing is um, as yesterday we had a presentation um, for uh, by the safe communities. We had also there a, uh, an item, if you look at the strategic plans that we were going to start a safe communities local. Um, we haven't done that when it is definitely what we asked for on our strategic plan. So there was a low hanging fruit that could have been a complete, um, but we didn't do it. So the staff really generally is choosing the projects that they like and the budget reflects that um and i so i'm not going to support this budget um i feel that if we were really looking at the strategic plan and doing it objectively we would have chosen and budgeted accordingly for that and we haven't we've chosen what the staff sees as priority over what we have directed the staff to do um, in some areas that are really quite easy um, and would have shown the public that we were really considering um, what they were doing. The thing is about heritage. I had some questions. I, I feel like I, I had some questions about the 10 year plan um, in terms of heritage. Um, the allocated funds are about 400, I think they're $460,000. Um, we readily spend uh, in this budget um, li literally hundreds of thousands of dollars in studies um, for, you know, the, the Fergus South 
And we say there are four items in the strategic plan about heritage, but we really have an ally. We, we haven't put the money for that. And that is um, a mistake in the discussion yesterday about the heritage landscapes. It, it, a lot can be done to protect it. And we are not allocating the monies to do that. So there again, this budget has not, uh, it, 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 it did the landscape, but from the discussion yesterday, we could see that just having the information is not enough to protect because citizens want protection. They don't want to study and forever. Um, they want to have the cores protected. Um, I realize there's, and as it was uh, said yesterday, you know, there's 700 places in each municipality. Well, we're not, it was state, we're not allocating those funds for that. Um, but that was a priority in our strategic plan. And the, it, we don't, we, we're not spending money on that. And that's a, that was disappointing too. So I don't, I feel that uh, I won't be supporting this budget um, for those reasons. Councillor Van Leeuwen. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I think that uh, the interesting part about the, our budget process is what, and what is some of the areas that I like about it is that we do break it down and go through piece by piece decision making. Um, there's things in this budget that I've, uh, I've voted against. There's things in this budget that I've voted uh, in favor of cautiously, but each, each unit is done uh, one by one so that we can break it out and find out where the majority of us, uh, where we sit for council's direction. So although there's things in here sometimes, uh, just for example, what just transpired where I may not be in favor and yet understanding that this is a budget of council as a whole, um, I can support this budget knowing that certain areas that you can't hold up the entire township for um, certain sections. So I, uh, I look forward to getting this moving along. Um, I'm disappointed in some areas and excited in others. So in general, I can support this budget. Thanks. Councillor Dunsmore. Yeah, thank you. Through you, Mayor. <clears throat> I wanna thank um, Dan and uh, Mark and all the staff for the work that they put into this. We've heard a lot about the operations center and I know that people are going to uh, be concerned about that. It, one of the biggest problems we have with growth in this community is we're being forced to grow and that adds all kinds of expenses to the township. And anytime we can take those growth uh, DC charges and apply them to what we need and the operations center closes a bunch of dilapidated buildings and allows us to take those off the operating budget by creating a new operations center. And that gets paid for by the developers. And so to me, that's a wise decision. And even the carrying charges on those get uh, covered by the developers. So I want to thank uh, our staff for coming up with the concept and finding a way to apply this to, to development charges. Um, I'm happy with the overall budget at 2.4%. I'm um, very happy to see the uh, diversity initiative that Councillor uh, McElwain put in move forward. And all in all, I'm uh, strongly in favor of this budget. Councillor Foster. With this budget. Uh, hello, soundtrack. Can yeah, we you hear, hear you. Yeah, we hear you now. Yep. Okay, thank you, Mayor. I have um, great difficulty with the budget um, for many, many reasons. Uh, first of all, Mayor Linton, um, I believe, and I've raised this many times, the capital levy is extremely misleading. Uh, you yourself, Mayor Linton, campaigned on a 2% levy. Today, very clearly, the levy is 10%. It's a 10% surtax. It's misleading because of the way uh, it compounds in a factorial way where last year's levy is added to this year's levy. No other tax calculated like that. 
It is not a 2% levy, it's a 10% levy as we learned today. $1,100 is the tax for an average home, and $110 is the typical levy for an average home, or 15 million in total taxes, and a million five for the levy. Very clearly, the levy is 10%, not 2%, and it has been misleading, and I raised this many times. Secondly, as I've already stated, this works garage is an albatross. We have four garages already and a fifth for the water department. We are going to borrow all the money to build a central garage when we have five garages already. Most of the work that is done is operational. Most of it is done out on the streets, the roadways, uh, plowing, snow plowing, grading, trimming trees, painting of lines, exercising of water valves. That's what our operators do. They are out working on our infrastructure uh, rather than um, in, the, uh, in the center. Um, furthermore, I, I struggle greatly um, with borrowing the money to build an operations center. Uh, we already are in debt to the tune of $23 million and the new operations center is uh, uh, gonna take us into the 40 million range in 2022, 20, 2023. And down the line, we're gonna borrow to build a sewage plant in Fergus. We're starting to skate into the 60s and 70s and $80 million worth of debt. And um, that is very concerning. Thirdly, I've raised this many times. This year, we're planning on hiring six new staff, including one person to do downtown maintenance. We have, as uh, Colin has told us, 17 operators in our works department. I, I don't understand why we need one more to do downtown maintenance only when we have 17 operators already. Surely we could be doing this with the staff, the very good staff we already have. I have always had trouble with the overuse of consultants. We have great staff, we have engineers, we have professional engineers, we have chartered accountants on staff, and yet whenever there is some big decisions to be made, we are constantly hiring a consultant. Uh, we have, in my view, overused uh, consultants. Uh, for all of the above reasons and uh, many, many more, I, I struggle with this budget and I cannot support it. We're, we're going the wrong way. The levy is misleading. The works garage is an albatross that's not required. And we continue to hire and spend and hire consultants. For all of the above reasons, I, I cannot support this budget. Councillor McRae. Thank you, Mayor Linton. Uh, through you. I don't know. If Sorry, Councilman McCray, you just got muted. Okay. Thank you. Through you, Mayor Linton. I don't know if this will be my last budget discussion, but I want to say it's been a pleasure working with staff through all the various budget um, discussions we've had over the years. I mean, I respect all of the efforts that you bring to preparing this budget and bringing it before us. I mean, we set a targeted tax goal and you met it. Despite facing the challenges of balancing the needs of future growth, aging infrastructure, uh, maintaining accepted service levels and resident resistance to tax increases. The reality is um, things continue to go up in price. We continue to grow. There are needs that we need to meet as a community. And somehow at the end of the day, we have to deliver to this community that, that we're trying to design. And this is what it costs. And so I just wanna say thank you to all of you. I know how difficult it is to pull together a budget and you managed to meet what we asked, which was 2.4. So thank you very much. And I hope you can leave at the end of today feeling proud of what you've managed to deliver today. Thank you. Thanks, councillors. A um, couple comments. Um, firstly, I want to thank our staff team. Uh, thanks, Dan and Mark, uh, for your leadership today and walking us through, providing great context, and also your leadership throughout the year. As you mentioned before, 
Um, budgets have become a year long process and we start the process early in May and it's in, it's a sequential process that you quarterback the whole way along. And I don't take for granted uh, the quality of, of, uh, work that both of you do in providing the financial oversight and making sure that the township is in great financial shape. So thanks for that. I also want to thank Andy. He's not here right now. Thank him for his leadership. Uh, this was his uh, last budget and he couldn't even be here. Uh, but the leadership he shows to his senior team, uh, you know, um, I, it wasn't that long ago, um, you know, in, in my first term of council here where budgets were a little bit of a game. Uh, staff would come in at high and then we push it down and it'd be just like a game of teeter totter. And th that's changed um, under Andy's leadership and with his senior team. Um, you meet the council's direction. So council uh, requested a 2.4 percent. You, you exceeded that. And to me, that, that means a lot. It means that you're doing your jobs and you're doing it well and you're making hard decisions. You're not coming with a list of wants. You're coming with a list of needs that have already been significantly vetted. I just want to echo a couple of uh, Councillor Van Leeuwen's comments. There's things in this budget that I didn't vote for. There's things that I'd rather not see. There's things in the strategic plan that I'd rather not see. Um, but that's not what council is about. Council is about moving the business of government forward and you don't always get what you want. Um, and that's the, that's the nature of being a, a team of councillors is you have to push the bar forward. I want to thank all members of council uh, for your discussion today. Very good discussion. Thanks for that. A lot of good ideas came out of today and I appreciate that. And, and thanks to councillors for being involved in the process and having, um, and being, um, and being well, well versed in the budget before you got to this day. I know some councils that, um, I've talked to different mayors and their councillors don't even read the documentation. Well, we don't have that problem here. And I, and I want to thank counselors, my, uh, my, my colleagues for being prepared to do this budget deliberation. And I don't take that for granted. And even though we don't see eye to eye on some things, I do appreciate that you come prepared to have a discussion. And thanks for that today. I appreciate that. I uh, also wanted to thank the senior management team. I know that you go through a very difficult discussions. I'd love to be in a fly in the wall and some of the discussions that you have at the senior management team level when some one of you wants to put a project forward or something forward and you get beat down by your by your colleagues colleagues because of, because of council's direction. So appreciate that you go through that hard work before we see it. And again, I don't take that for granted. I know it's a significant amount of work and thanks for doing it. Um, I, I think this is a budget that is in the best interest of Center Wellington residents. At the end of the day, that's what matters most. Um, we're getting good things done for this community. Uh, thanks to the 2% bridge rebuilding capital levy, we're on track to rebuild 21 bridges in eight years and compare that to five bridges in the previous eight years. There's good things happening here. And we have to look after our infrastructure. And still, with all the work that we've done as, as the council, we still see from, uh, from Dan and Mark's presentation, we're still falling behind when it comes to asset management. We still have to make sure that we're putting enough money away for the future of this community. And that gets us to the operations center. Really, if, if, if councillors have the opportunity to visit some of our current facilities, they can absolutely appreciate why an operations center is absolutely critical. Our staff deserve to work in a professional environment. Um, we are doing a great job of attracting and retaining excellent staff at the Township of Center Wellington. And we're doing so because we have excellent people here. We have great facilities and people want to be here. That needs to continue. We have to foster a culture of excellence here. And that means that the place where people work out of providing core services to our communities have to be at a certain level. And there comes a point in time in every council's uh, life where we have to look to the future, something that's not gonna potentially benefit them in the next election, but it's gonna benefit generations to come. And this is a point in time that we're at right now. We have to take seriously our, our understanding that we are growing and we wanna make sure we're providing core services to our community, our citizens and our businesses um, whenever we can. Um, so uh, thanks, thanks again for the day. I will be supporting this budget and, uh, and I really appreciate all the work that went into it. Um, and with that, I will ask the clerk to do a recorded vote for this budget. Okay, through you, Mayor Linton, Councillor Van Leeuwen. Yes. Councillor Foster. Completely opposed. 
No. Councilor McElwain? No. Uh, Councilor McRae? Yes. Uh, Councilor Kittress? Oh, I think he's frozen. No. Oh, no. Uh, and Councilor Dunsmore? No. Yes. And Mayor Linton? Yeah. Yes. That, in fact, carries 4 3. Okay, thanks so much, uh, Council. We do have delegations at five o'clock, so we'll take a recess for 15 minutes and we'll be back here. And I think both our Ferguson and our BIA will be here. So again, thanks for a great day and we'll see you uh, in about 15 minutes.
Hey, Fred. Hey, Michaela. There. I keep forgetting to hit unmute. <laughs> How's your renovations coming, Fred? Um, I think, uh, I don't want to jinx it, but I think they're, they're going better than anticipated right at this moment, which is uncommon these days. So keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> they, they didn't think that they were going to start framing until uh, Thursday, and they actually started today. So good oh, news. That's, re that's really good. You don't usually get that kind of news. No, so I'll take it. <laughs> Hello, Fred. Hi, how are you? Very well, thank you. Stuff, everybody hanging in there? Good to see everyone again on Zoom again. <laughs> Well, welcome back, Council. Uh, we've been at this all day, so uh, it's now five o'clock, and uh, I'd like to welcome Fred Gordon, the administrator of the Fergus uh, BIA, and also uh, Michaela uh, from the Allure BIA. Welcome, BIAs. And I think we're going to turn things over to you, Fred, uh, from a uh, Fergus perspective first. Welcome. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, Council. Thank you for receiving the Fergus BIA here uh, at your Zoom meeting today. Um, uh, we have a budget put together that was passed at the uh, Fergus uh, annual general meeting held uh, last month. Uh, well, this month, actually, but uh, and uh, uh, I'm pleased to present you with it. And you'll see that it represents a zero percent increase uh, in levies to our membership. And uh, we're glad to toe that line right now, given the situation uh, that we still find our downtowns in. Uh, and, you know, the very reason that we're finding ourselves coming together on Zoom today. Um, but if, in advance of giving you uh, that, um, uh, that budget, I'd like to just give you a quick report from uh, the Fergus BIA and what happened this year, uh, and then I'll take any questions that you might have. So despite the COVID uh, outbreak, the Fergus BIA still got a lot done. In 2021, we grew our emphasis on community engagement, including a shop local program, advertising downtown Fergus to new subdivisions in our community, and the establishment of a new website. We've enhanced our social media presence, and we've established a, a new uh, event in February called Show Your Love Month, which coincides with Valentine's Day. We also established a summer sidewalk sale this year, and Miranda has established an awareness committee that engages the BIA with the community to make sure that events such as Pride Month, Indigenous awareness, and other social concerns are acknowledged in downtown Fergus. Provo Lane uh, was closed once again for the enjoyment of everyone downtown. There were art classes and food trucks that augmented the use of the space this year. And we look forward to doing that again in 2022 and uh, for as long as the township will let us go ahead and do that. The St. Patrick Park was replanted this year. That's the little park over by the curling club, uh, as well an additional sculpture base was uh, sunk this autumn to further augment the Alora sculpture project in downtown Fergus. So we'll be looking for another sculpture coming in in 2022. Uh, we really want to share with Council that the new parking bylaw has proven very beneficial to downtown Fergus, and um, we, uh, we just can't say enough. The complaints about, I'm driving around, we can't find a parking spot, we chop local, but we can't stop have gone and uh, or at least been uh, hugely reduced, and those 15 minute parking spots, boy, they're just awesome. They really help with the turnover, especially with the food establishments and with delivery. So we really think the program is working really well. Uh, we took delivery of three new Fergus uh, park benches. Those are our fancy ones with, that have Fergus laser cut out of the back there. And they'll be placed uh, at the Fergus marketplace and other spots around uh, downtown Fergus in the spring of 2022. 
as usual, our Sip and Shop program, uh, well, it's going to run this year, November 25th, 26th. So it's just passed on December 2nd, 3rd from 6 to 9 p.m. And in order to support that, we put promo materials available and there's a huge array of things going on. Uh, you might have seen our Elf in the Shelf uh, program starts tomorrow. There's carriage rides, food trucks, donkeys, tree lighting, even with the Alora Singers. There's burn barrels, there's Peter Piper, there's carolers, the town crier, there's visits with Santa. Um, and you've already seen uh, that the Christmas lights are out and looking fabulous this year, as well as the great big new Fergus sign along the riverbank. Um, so we're going to have some cutouts as well for photo ops and hashtag responsibilities. And that's all, of course, going to be followed by Santa on the uh, 4th of December. Uh, so despite COVID, we feel that we got a lot done and we really, really, really are pleased with our social media reach. Um, it's, it's, we've been uh, slow on the uptake there, but we're really going strong now with social media, uh, growing by leaps and bounds every month. So with no further ado, I've presented you with a proposed budget for 2022 for the Fergus BIA. And uh, I'll turn it back over uh, to the mayor for any questions or comments. Thanks very much, Fred. And, and please extend our thanks uh, from council to all the members of the Fergus BIA executive. Um, you know, a lot of people don't recognize that uh, a lot of these people are doing work for free and, and the majority are all volunteers and they do all this work just because they love our community and um, they do some really amazing work. Fergus looks amazing. Uh, I was out uh, at the tree lighting uh, last week and there's so many uh, kids and families and Santa was out and it was, it's looking so good. Love the Fergus, um, the Fergus uh, word along the riverscape and the cutouts. And it's just all set up to get some real good images of downtown Fergus. So um, and the lights look great. Uh, I know the BAA has worked really closely with our town staff to um, make Fergus look amazing and, and Provost Lane look great. Uh, so just extend our thanks to all the, the good people. I miss them all. I miss uh, being at the meetings. Um, but just extend the thanks from council and our community to everything that they're uh, doing for downtown Fergus. And I'll turn it over to Councillor Dunsmore. Councillor Dunsmore is a representative on uh, council to the Fergus BAA. So I'll turn it to him for her, his comments and questions and then open it up for questions from the rest of the council. Councillor Dunsmore. Thank you through you, uh, Mayor Linton. Uh, Fred, I want to thank you for all the hard work, you and the entire BIA that have put into it. And I'm really impressed. And I, I told you that at the AGM, at the amount of work you guys put in, but how you've managed to weather the storm of this, this COVID, the open, close, open, close. And you guys have done it very, very well. And you've moved forward. You, uh, 2020, word of the year pivot. Everybody pivoted and um, you got your online presence up, you got onto Google, you guys did everything you needed to do to keep people coming downtown. And to anybody that's watching, people that have moved into this, this community, I would encourage you to go to both downtowns because both downtowns are fabulous. And it's the fabulous work of both BIAs and the business owners down there that keep it vibrant. So way to go, Fred, and, and I greatly appreciate your words tonight. Thanks, Councilor Dunsmore. Any questions from Council? Councillor Foster. No, thank you, Mayor, and, and thank you, Fred, for your report. And uh, Fred, I, I was pleased to hear that you've come in with a 0% increase. That's an important thing for, for merchants right now. I, I'm quite sure they're struggling a bit uh, with the pandemic. For, uh, Fred, I wanted to ask you just generally, you know, how, how are spirits amongst the merchants downtown? Is there a spirit of optimism as we head into 2022? or I realize many will be struggling a bit, but um, uh, how are they doing down there? Councillor Foster, I'm really pleased to tell you that uh, optimism is high uh, in downtown Good. Fergus this year. Um, the, as, uh, as Mayor Linton said, you know, a lot of people don't recognize that our executive is made up of volunteers. And uh, we just have the best bunch of volunteers in uh, downtown Fergus right now. People who are keen and savvy on what they do and know how to do it. And they're executing it. And what we're really seeing is a lot of uptake in programs where once upon a time there used to be a lot of antipathy. So uh, a lot of you councillors and Mayor Linton, of course, uh, we've been together for a long time and we're all cognizant of, of uh, some of the divisive issues that have 
uh, torn apart downtown Fergus in years gone by. And uh, I think from my standpoint, after doing this for a <laughs> decade, uh, is that uh, right now I see uh, nothing but unity, uh, looking forward, getting ready for what a post-pandemic world looks like and what the face of downtown Fergus is going to look like. Uh, we're seeing huge uptake in our programs, such as the uh, such as the Elf on the Shelf program. But uh, you know, the the there's a fall fiber fair coming. There's a and everyone wants to participate instead. So instead of people sort of going, oh, I don't know, uh, you know, people are saying, when can I sign up? Where can I sign up? And these are these are indicators to me about a, a turn in the pandemic and a turn in the general attitude of. Uh, downtown Fergus. We are still trying really, really hard to get a better balance between service and retail. Um, I think that's going to be a, a little bit of an ongoing thing for us in, in downtown Fergus. But I also do think that if we can steer more vacancies towards retail. You got muted there, Fred. Sorry about that. Uh, that that we will see, um, uh, you know, a further enthusiasm about the programs and the beautification of downtown Fergus. Thanks very much, Fred, and thanks for uh, the work you do, Councillor McRae. Yeah, thank you, Marilyn. I just want to add my own congratulations to the BIA team. Uh, as soon as cycling season starts, I'm often downtown on my bike, and I just found Fergus a very attractive spot to hang out and especially all the benches you put out down along the river. It's a great place to sit and have a coffee and de-stress. So thank you to you and everyone on the BIA. It's a really lovely little downtown to visit. And thanks very much for coming uh, today, Fred. Really appreciate um, uh, all the uh, leadership you provide. Uh, Kim and, and the whole group uh, are in good hands when you come and present to council. So thanks very much. Thank you and great to see you all. Thanks. Okay, now shift to going down the road uh, to uh, Elora. Um, thanks so much, for Michaela, for being here today. Um, I know that Elora was hopping over this past year. Um, I spent a lot of time down downtown uh, when the streets were closed, and I saw a lot of other locals, and I'm always excited when I see other local families down there enjoying their own town. It hasn't always been that way, so that was really, really good to see. Um, so I'll turn things over uh, to you to uh, give your presentation with downtown Elora. Okay, um, thank you very much uh, for having me. Um, we're presenting our proposed budget that was passed at the uh, AGM that we held uh, November 1st. And in that budget, we are proposing a 7% increase um, in the tax levy. And this is in keeping with our multi-year plan to increase the budget or our, uh, the BIA's um, feeling that the budget needs to increase if we're going to build more substantial events and um, put funding towards much needed uh, beautification projects as um, we're seeing a real growth in downtown Alora as far as tourism, et cetera, and a need for more infrastructure in that regard. So um, I will also, uh, like Fred, provide a little bit of um, uh, update on what we've done in the last year or so. I think as in the previous year, we had to um, cancel a couple of major events. And with those funds, we redirected them towards some much needed beautification projects. Uh, the first being purchasing more garbage receptacles for downtown. So we've got nine more bright, shiny new garbage receptacles. And we were finding a real issue with garbage overflow, especially during the busy sort of tourism months. So that's been really helpful. Uh, we've also put in some new bike racks up in Uptown Alora near Getty Street Market and a couple on the south side of the river and on the edge of downtown at La Fontana. And that's um, been really great. We're seeing a real increase in bicycle tourism uh, in downtown Alora. So those were much needed. And finally, we purchased a number of urns that um, were located along the bottom of um, the corner of Metcalf and Mill to sort of make things a bit safer during the weekend street closures, which we continued this summer with great success. So that ran, those street closures ran from May to um, October 31st. 
uh, and I think we're of great benefit to the businesses downtown. So um, for all of those projects, a number of them were sort of like on the fly and we're very appreciative of um, how flexible public works was and horticulture and especially Dorothy Smith at the township for helping liaise on all of those and, and getting them done on, in such short time frames. Um, I think one highlight this year for the BIA was that uh, the pride flag was raised on the community flagpole. And this was the first year the BIA, the Allure BIA has been trying for a couple of years to, to do some more pride events and the community flagpole poll policy came into effect and um, we were the first to submit an application. So we did that as well as um, pride banners at the corner of church and Metcalf. And we expanded our mini uh, flag campaign. So a number of businesses uh, took part in having brackets installed on their storefronts. And we supplied them with pride flags this year, uh, Canada flags, and we're hoping to expand that um, to other sort of special events flags moving forward. Summer, again, was very busy, not just on weekends. We're seeing it almost the whole week during the summers. Um, lots of tourists. And um, right now we're almost zero capacity for vacancies and buildings. Um, and a number of new businesses opened this year. The most sort of anticipated and much needed being the Getty Street Market. Alora had been for quite a while since the closing of LM without a full service grocery store. So that's that's been a great addition to the downtown. Um, we continued with our sponsorship of a number of, of projects like the Allura Sculpture Project, the Santa Claus Parade, Monster Month, um, and many of our local businesses we saw providing individual sponsorships for those events uh, and prizes, et cetera. This year, um, we, uh, the Allura Legion work reached out to us and um, we helped them begin their Veteran Banners Project, which is very similar to the one that was initiated in Fergus. And the BIA provided the organization with uh, banner access, bracket access, and a $2,500 sponsorship to go towards the purchase of additional banner brackets. So we're very excited that we were able to take part in that um, and hoping to see that build each year. Uh, we've had the annual Starlight shopping event just come to completion and that was four days again this year and that was to allow for sort of crowd dispersal over the four days as opposed to hosting sort of one event with too many people um, and we were happy to have the Allura Festival Singers caroling as well and our final project for 2021 is we've just launched a video marketing campaign for downtown Allura and this is based on um, we received two grants this applied for and received two grants this year one from Innovation Guelph and one from RTO4. And we put those towards the production of two videos working with Tivoli Film Productions. And um, one video promotes retail and one um, restaurants. And that campaign is being launched by Loft 17 Creative Inc., which is an ad agency out of Waterloo. And we're hoping to target the GTA and it's going to go over the next three months and hopefully bring in day trippers from those outside areas during a sort of a bit of a downtime in um, our retail um, schedule. So that's, that's where we're sitting for 2021. And it was a great year in general. And um, in spite of the pandemic, we saw a lot of um, action downtown <laughs> for sure. Thanks very much, Michaela. And I, again, I just wanted to, um, on behalf of council and the community, thank you and and your whole, the whole team of executives for putting in so many hours and um, and volunteer hours um, to making downtown Laura amazing. So really, really appreciate it. I know it's a lot of hard work and it's sometimes a thankless job. So please extend uh, our thanks to, to the whole team. Now, I'll turn it over to Councillor McWayne. Councillor McWayne is the council representative for the Laura BIA, so I'll turn it over to him for comments that he has. Councillor McWayne. Thanks, Mayor. Um, yes, I it kind of like to echo, I guess, what what Neil said about Fergus. Uh, it's just always very impressive the number of fantastic volunteers we get on the BIA. I, I guess one should not be surprised that successful business people are going to also be hardworking 
volunteers on the BIA, and they certainly are. And uh, we have a very diverse group right now with uh, with great ideas. And um, it, it, it as the budget grows, more of those ideas will come to fruition, I suppose. Um, also, like to thank Michaela. I, I she is doing a great job of. Uh, combining uh, the social media aspects as well as the uh, administration. So um, I, I find the communications is, have been excellent with, uh, with Michaela handling all the, whole, the whole job there. And um, overall, uh, Elora, this past summer, as well as the previous summer, despite COVID has been absolutely fantastic. And I shouldn't just limited to summer because it went well into the autumn and and uh, and actually up and up to and including last saturday night saturday or for santa claus parade it was just uh, impossible to get anywhere close to downtown um so congratulations to all of them and um and thank you michaela for the excellent job you do any questions comments from Members of Council. Council McCray. Thank you, Marilyn. Through you, I'd just like to say a big thank you to the Laura BIA as well. Um, maybe I spend more time cycling to Fergus, but I spend a lot of time walking in downtown when I can't ride my bike. And I'll slip down there on days when the streets closed off. And it's just so wonderful to see how you've managed to survive through the whole COVID period, how you've been very versatile and adaptive to coming up with ideas for people to be able to sit outside and eat and just closing the streets and just it's such a fun, wonderful place to visit at any time of the day, morning or night. So thank you. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks very much, Michaela. Thanks very much, Fred, for bringing those reports. It's always a pleasure for us to have our annual checkup with the Fergus, BIA, Fergus and Elora BAA. So thanks very much for joining us today. And the only the last thing that we have on our agenda is an adjournment. Can I have a mover for that, please? Councilor Kittress, seconded by. Councilor Dunsmore, all in favor? And we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of the night, everyone. Thanks for a good day. <laughs>